Section 1 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction by Sir W. R. Birdwood from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. It is my privilege to have been asked to write an introduction for the Anzac Book and to convey the cordial thanks of all the inhabitants of our little township here to those who have so kindly given us the free use of their brains and hands in writing and illustrating this book in a way which does as much credit to them as the fighting here has done to the force we all hope that readers of our book will agree in this while those who are more critical will perhaps remember the circumstances under which the contributions have been prepared in small dugouts with shells and bullets frequently whistling overhead it may be of interest to readers to hear the origin of the word anzac when i took over the command of the australian and new zealand army corps in egypt a year ago i was asked to select a telegraphic code address for my army corps and then adopted the word anzac later on when we had effected our landing here in april last i was asked by general headquarters to suggest a name for the beach where we had made good our first precarious footing and then asked that this might be recorded as anzac cove a name which the bravery of our men has now made historical while it will remain a geographical landmark for all time our eight months at anzac cannot help stamping on the memory of every one of us days of trial and anxiety hopes and perhaps occasional fears rejoicings at success and sorrow very deep and sincere for many a good comrade whom we can never see again i firmly believe though it has made better men of every one of us for we have all had to look death straight in the face so often that the greater realities of life must have been impressed on all of us in a way which has never before been possible bitter has been my experience in losing many a good friend i personally shall always look back on our days together at anzac as a time never to be forgotten for during it i hope i made many fast friends in all ranks whose friendship is all the more valuable because it has been acquired in circumstances of stress and often danger when a man's real self is shown in days to come i hope that this book will call to the minds of most of us incidents which though they may then seem small probably loom very large before us at the time and the thought of which will bring to mind many a good comrade not only on land but on sea from the day we were put ashore by rear admiral thursby's squadron up till now we have had the vigilant ships of his majesty's navy watching night and day in all weathers for any opportunity to help us we will all of us look back in years to come on queen elizabeth prince of wales london triumph Bacant, Grafton, Endymion, as well as such sleuth hounds of the ocean as Colney, Chelmer, Pincher, Rattlesnake, Mosquito, and many others as our best friends, and will think of them, their officers and ship's company, as the truest of comrades with whom it has been a privilege to serve, and as the best of representatives of the great fleet and service which carries with honor and ensures respect for the British flag to the uttermost parts of the earth boys hats off to the british navy it may be that in thinking of old anzac days the words of the harrow school song will spring to one's mind forty years on growing older and older shorter in wind as in memory long feeble of foot and rheumatic of shoulder what will it help you that once you were strong but it has indeed helped us all to have been with strong men at anzac and whatever the future may have in store i personally shall always regard the time i have been privileged to be a comrade of the brave and strong men from australia and new zealand who have served alongside of me as one of the greatest privileges that could be conferred on any man and of which i shall be prouder to the end of my days than any honour which can be given me no words of mine could ever convey to readers at their firesides in australia new zealand and the old country one half of what all their boys have been through nor is my poor pen capable of telling them of the never-failing courage determination and cheerfulness of those who have so willingly fought 
and given their lives for their king and country's sake their deeds are known to the empire and can never be forgotten while if any copy of this little book should happen to survive to fall into the hands of our children or our children's children it will serve to show them to some extent what their fathers had done for the empire and indeed for civilization in days gone by i sincerely hope that every one of my old comrades may meet with all the good fortune his work here has deserved and live to a ripe old age with happiness and be occasionally reminded of old times by a glance at the anzac book anzac december nineteenth nineteen fifteen end of section one section two of the anzac book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Editor's Note from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. This book of Anzac was produced in the lines at Anzac on Gallipoli in the closing weeks of 1915. Practically every word in it was written and every line drawn beneath the shelter of a waterproof sheet or of a roof of sandbags either in the trenches or at most well within the range of the oldest turkish rifle and under daily visitations from the smallest turkish field piece day and night during the whole process of its composition the crack of the mauser bullets overhead never ceased at least one good soldier that we know of who was preparing a contribution for these pages met his death while the work was still unfinished the anzac book was to have been a new year magazine to help this little british australasian fraternity in turkey to while away the long winter in the trenches the idea originated with major s s butler of the anzac staff on his initiative and that of lieutenant h e woods a small committee was formed to father the magazine the notice was circulated on november fourteenth calling for contributions from the whole population of anzac any profit was to go to patriotic funds for the benefit of the army corps between november fifteenth and december eighth when the time for the sending in of contributions closed the anzac book was produced as drawings and paintings began to come in disclosing the whereabouts of some of the talent which existed in anzac a small staff of artists was collected in order to produce head and tail pieces and a few illustrations and a dugout overlooking anzac cove became the office of the only book ever likely to be produced in gallipoli it was after the contributions had been finally sent in and when the work of editing was in full swing that there came upon most of us from the sky the news that anzac was to be evacuated such finishing touches as remained to be added after december nineteenth were given to the work in embrose the date for this publication was necessarily delayed and it was realized by every one that this production which was to have been a mere pastime had now become a hundred times more precious as a souvenir certainly no book has ever been produced under these conditions before except for this modification in the scheme of its production the anzac book remains to-day exactly the same as when it was planned for the australian and new zealand army corps still clinging to the familiar holly clothed sides of sahri bear the three weeks during which this book was being produced will be remembered by the men of anzac as being in the period during which we were visited by the two fiercest storms which had descended upon the peninsula during the afternoon of november seventeenth the wind from the southwest gradually increased to more than half a gale and brought with it after dark a most torrential thunderstorm a day or two later this subsided leaving a disheveled anzac but the wind swung slowly round to the north and by november twenty seventh it was blowing a northerly blizzard and the next day five out of every six australians for the first time in their lives woke to find a white countryside in the snow falling how deeply that snow impressed them can be seen in these pages for dust heat and flies were much more typical of gallipoli the book was composed from first to last in the full prospect of christmas at anzac and it remains a record perhaps all the more interesting on that account the printing section of the royal engineers especially lieutenant tuck and corporal ashwin and lieutenant g l thompson r n a s 
and certain naval officers helped us with some drawing paper ink and paints and the photographic section with some excellent panoramas but for the rest the contributors had to work with such materials as anzac contained iodine brushes red and blue pencils and such approach to white paper as could be produced from each battalion stationary the response to the committee's request for contributions was enormous and in consequence the editors have been able to use only portions even if they be half or a quarter of the longer articles and stories submitted to them but they have done this without hesitation rather than reject the articles altogether the competitions for certain contributions resulted as follows cover private d barker fifth australian field ambulance drawing trooper w o hewitt ninth australian light horse drawing a comic private c lation white sixth australian field ambulance pro sketch h dinning ninth company australian a s c prose humorous second lieutenant j e g stevenson second field company australian engineers versus captain james sprent third australian field ambulance versus humorous t h wilson a company sixteenth battalion a i f the greater number of the contributors were private soldiers in the army corps the sole outside contribution is mr edgar wallace's poetic tribute to the australian and new zealand force which is included in these pages with the consent of the author the thanks of those particularly concerned in the production are especially due to general birdwood for his close and constant interest to brigadier general c b b white who though at the time burdened with most anxious duties never failed to give some of his few spare moments to the solving of difficulties incidental to this publication to the commonwealth authorities and the publicity department in london and particularly to mr h c smart for his untiring assistance invaluable advice and for the help of his outstanding ingenuity and organization and of the splendid business system and abundant facilities which he has created in the australian military office in london to the war office and the admiralty and the central news for permission to use valuable photographs and to many others both in the a n n z army corps and outside it who have given their best help to make this book a success for the staff c e w bean editor privates f crozier t coles d barker w o hewitt c lachon white artist a w baisley clerk the work has been a labor of love for which only they realize how little thanks they deserve. This from the Anzac Book Staff. A GNC, December 29th, 1915. End of section 2. Section 3 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Landing by a Man of the Tenth Come on, lads, have a good hot supper, there's business doing. So spoke number 10 platoon sergeant of the 10th Australian Battalion to his men, lying about in all sorts of odd corners aboard the battleship Prince of Wales. In the first hour of the morning of April 25th, 1915, the ship or her company, had provided a hot stew of bully beef, and the lads set to and took what proved, alas to many, their last real meal together. They laugh and joke as though picnicking. Then a voice, fall in, comes ringing down the ladder way from the deck above. The boys swing on their heavy equipment, grasp their rifles, silently make their way on deck, and stand in grim black masses. All lights are out, and only harsh low commands break the silence. This way, number 9, number 10, C Company. Almost blindly, we grope our way to the ladder leading to the huge barge below, which is already half full of silent, grim men, who seem to realise that at last, after eight months of hard, solid training in Australia, Egypt and Lemnos Island, they are now to be called upon to carry out the object of it all. Full up, sir, whispers the midshipman in the barge. Cast off and drift astern, 
says the ship's officer in charge of the embarkation. Slowly we drift astern until the boat stops with a jerk and twang goes the holster that couples the boats and barges together. Silently, the boats are filled with men and silently drop astern of the big ship until, all being filled, the order is given to the small steamboats. Full steam ahead, away we go, racing and bounding, dipping and rolling, now in a straight line, now in a half circle, on through the night. The moon has just about sunk below the horizon. Looking back, we can see the battleships coming on slowly in our rear, ready to cover our attack. All at once, our pinnace gives a great start forward, and away we go, for land just discernible 100 yards away on our left. Then, crack crack, ping ping, zip zip, trenches full of rifles upon the shore, and surrounding hills open on us, and machine guns, hidden in gullies or redoubts, increase the murderous hail. Oars are splintered, boats are perforated. A sharp moan, a low gurgling cry, tells of a comrade hit. Boats ground in four or five feet of water, owing to the human weight contained in them. We scramble out, struggle to the shore, and, rushing across the beach, take cover under a low sandbank. Here, take off my pack and I'll take off yours. We help one another to lift the heavy water-soaked packs off. Hurry up there, says our sergeant. Fix bayonets. Click. And the bayonets are fixed. Forward. And away we scramble up the hills in our front. Up, up we go, stumbling in holes and ruts. With a ringing cheer, we charge the steep hill, pulling ourselves up by roots and branches of trees, at times digging our bayonets into the ground and pushing ourselves up to a foothold until, topping the hill, we found the enemy had made themselves very scarce. What had caused them to fly from a position from which they should have driven us back into the sea every time? A few scattered Turks showing in the distance, we instantly fired on. Some fell to rise no more. Others fell wounded and, crawling into the low bushes, sniped our lads as they went past. There were snipers in plenty, cunningly hidden in the hearts of the low green shrubs. They accounted for a lot of our boys in the first few days, but gradually were rooted out. Over the hill we dashed, and down into what is now called Shrapnel Gully, and up the other hillside, until, on reaching the top, we found that some of the lads of the 3rd Brigade had commenced to dig in. We skirted round to the plateau at the head of the gully, and took up our line of defence. As soon as it was light enough to see, the guns on Gaba Tepe on our right and two batteries away on our left opened up a murderous hail of shrapnel on our landing parties. The battleships and cruisers were continuously covering the landing of troops, broadsides going into the batteries situated in tunnels in the distant hillside. All this while the seamen from the different ships were gallantly rowing and managing the boats carrying the landing parties. Not one man that is left of the original brigade will hear a word against our gallant seamen. England may well be proud of them, and all true Australians are proud to call them comrades. See, bang, swish. The front firing line was now being baptised by its first trapnel. Zoo, zoo, zip, zip. Machine guns situated on each front, flank and centre, opened on our front line. Thousands of bullets begin to fly round and over us, sometimes barely missing. Now and then, one heard a low gurgling moan, and, turning, one saw near at hand some chum, who only a few seconds before had been laughing and joking, now lying and gasping, with his lifeblood soaking down into the red clay and sand. Five rounds rapid at the scrub in front, comes the command of our subaltern, then an order down the line. Fixed bayonets. Fatal order. Was it not, perhaps, some officer of the enemy who shouted it? For they say such things were done. Out flash a thousand bayonets, scintillating in the sunlight like a thousand mirrors, signalling our position to the batteries away on our left and front. We put in another five rounds rapid at the scrub in front. Then, bang swish, bang swish, bang swish. And over our line and front and rear, such a hellish fire of lidite and shrapnel 
that one wonders how anyone could live amongst such a hail of death-dealing leaden shell. Ah, got me, says one lad on my left, and he shakes his arms. A bullet had passed through the biceps of his left arm, missed his chest by an inch, passed through the right forearm, and finally struck the lad between him and me a bruising blow on the wrist. The man next to him, a man from the ninth Battalion, started to bind up his wounds, as he was bleeding freely. All the time, shrapnel was hailing down on us. Oh! Comes from directly behind me, and, looking around, I see poor little Lieutenant B of C Company has been badly wounded. From both hips to his ankles, blood is oozing through pants and putties, and he painfully drags himself to the rear. With every pull, he moans cruelly. I raise him to his feet, and at a very slow pace, start to help him to shelter. But alas, I have only got him about fifty yards from the firing line, when again, bang swish, and we were both peppered by shrapnel and shell. My rifle butt was broken off to the trigger guard, and I received a smashing blow that laid my cheek on my shoulder. The last I remembered was poor Lieutenant B, groaning again as we both sank to the ground. When I came to, I found myself in Shrapnel Gully with an AMC man holding me down. I was still clasping my half-rifle. Dozens of men and officers, both Australians and New Zealanders, who had landed a little later in the day, were coming down wounded, some slightly, some badly, with arms in slings or shot through the leg and using their rifles for crutches. Shrapnel Gully was still under shrapnel and sniper's fire. Two or three platoon mates and myself slowly moved down to the beach, where we found the Australian Army Service Corps busily engaged landing stores and water amid shrapnel fire from Gaba Tepe. As soon as a load of stores was landed, the wounded were carried aboard the empty barges, and taken to hospital ships and troop ships standing out offshore. After going to ten different boats, we came at last to the troop ship Tiang Chun, which had the 14th Australian Battalion aboard. They were to disembark the next morning, but owing to so many of us being wounded, they had to land straight away. And so, after 12 hours hard fighting, I was aboard a troop ship again, wounded, but I would not have missed it for all the money in the world. A. R. Perry, 10th Battalion, A. I. F. End of section 3「Section 4 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Reminiscence of a Wreck by Lieutenant A. L. Pemberton from the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. The Reminiscence of a Wreck. It may be necessary to explain that wood for the roof beams of dugouts and the shoring up of trenches in wet weather was priceless in Gallipoli. But whilst this book was being compiled, Providence sent a storm. In the morning, the beach was littered with portions of erect schooner, stranded lighters, pieces of pier, all strictly the property of His Majesty's government, as represented by the officer commanding the Royal Engineers. A gift from heaven one Australian was heard to remark, as he looked at the desolate scene next morning. Nor were his British brethren less grateful. From the editor. The storm has ceased, the sea was calm, the wind a trifle raw, and miles and miles of wreckage lay upon the sandy shore, and every time the waves came up they brought a little more. The sergeant and the junior sub in contemplation stood. They wept like anything to see such quantities of wood and then they smiled a furtive smile which boded little good. The wood lay round in lovely heaps and smiled invitingly. Do you suppose, the sergeant said, that this is meant for me? I doubt it, said the junior sub, here comes the CRE. If fifty kings and fifty queens and fifty C and C's presented fifty indents and bowed low upon their knees, I hardly think that they would get more than a few of these. The sergeant and the junior sub walked on a mile or so, until they found a shelving bank conveniently low. 
and there they waited sadly for the CRE to go. Oh, Timbers, quoth the junior sub, who spoke with honeyed speech. I hardly think it's safe for you to lie upon the beach. And as he spoke, he stroked the backs of those within his reach. The Timbers leapt beneath his touch and hurried plank by plank. They crowded round to hear him speak and lined up rank on rank. But one old Timber wagged his head and hid behind the bank. The time has come, the sergeant said, to talk of many things, of bully beef and dugouts, of kaisers and of kings, and why the rain comes through the roof, and whether shrapnel stings. Some good stout planks, the sergeant cried, are what we chiefly need, and four by fours and spars besides are very good indeed. So if you're ready, sir, I think we may as well proceed. O C R E remarked the sub, I deeply sympathise. With sobs and tears they sorted out those of the largest size, while well, happy thoughts of days to come loomed large before their eyes. Next morning came the CRE to see what could be done, but when he came to count the planks, he found that there were none. And this was hardly odd, because they'd collared every one. Lieutenant A. L. Pemberton, R.G.A. Taylor's Hollow. CRE stands for the Officer Commanding the Royal Engineers. End of section 4. Section 5 of the ANZAC Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Bryan Stewart. An Australian Home in 1930. From the ANZAC Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. When you come to an old spotted gum, right on the saddle of Sandstone Ridge, after an 18-mile ride from Timpanundi, you're very close to Freddie Prince's war selection. There's a well-made gate in the road fence on your left, and it bears the legend Prince's Jolly. Through that, the track will lead you gently uphill into a wide and gradually deepening sap, until you think you've made some mistake. Then look to your left, and behold the front entrance to Freddy's dugout. An old shell case hangs nearby, and when you strike it you'll hear an echo of children's voices, and a small platoon of youngsters charge you at the double. First time I blew in it was just on tea time, and my first glance in at the well-lit gallery and the smell of the welcome food are worth the recollection. Fred came out and led my cuddy round to the stable sap, where he was given what had been on his mind for some hours past. I didn't lose much time in settling down to tea. It was already too dark to look around outside. Besides, as Fred explained, there was nothing to see of the homestead bar the inside, and by the third year of excavation, most of that had been dumped into the gully and pretty well all washed away. The meal finished, we played games with the kids. Fred seldom read the newspapers. He said he didn't want to strain the one eye that was left to him. So Mrs. Prince retired to absorb the news I had brought in their mailbag, and to prepare herself to issue it to her husband later. Long after the children went to Burrow, he and I smoked and pitched away about the past. He told me how he and many others had come to adopt the underground home. It had been the case of making a penny do the work of a pound, and Fred himself had done the work of a company. It had been a hard struggle, but the missus was a treasure and never growled, except when things were going well, as some people would do. It was just a case of dig in, dig up, and dig down. Anything in the way of iron or steel was prohibitive. Timber was too expensive, and in any case, the timber that stood on the selection he had been forced to sell in order to stock the farm. It had been a problem of years, but he had made a job of it, and when he showed me round the house, I didn't grudge him his little bit of pride. The main gallery opened to the surface at the front and back, and was about 45 paces long. It was driven through hard ground, and was well arched so that it required no timber. On one side there was a branch to the pantries and the gallery, and on the other side the dining room and the bedrooms, which were really one big chamber with solid pillars of earth left at intervals, forming a group of rooms, each with a dome roof and canvas partitions. 
A borehole had been put through to the surface at the centre of every room for ventilation and light, a device of reflectors enabling one to bring the sunlight in at all hours of the day. Once, as we sat and smoked, a subdued chattering came from the adjoining room. I looked up and saw the top of a periscope over the partition. Instantly it disappeared with a noise like the scattering of furniture. Then a voice. Oh, Daddy, did you know what? What happened, Kit? replied the father. Two of your biscuit photo frames are smashed. Ah, never mind, old girl, said Fred. It's time they began to break up after fifteen years. Go to sleep, both of you. As I lay awake next morning, I overheard some homely details. How the baldy steer had hopped over Dwyer's parapet into his lucerne patch, and Jimmy ought to have widened the trench last week when he was told to, and the milking sap hadn't been cleaned out the previous day because Georgie had forgotten he was pioneer, and Jerry O'Dwyer had shot two crows from the new sniper's posse down at the creek, and so on. When we sat down to breakfast, Mrs. Prince was primed with news. I told Fred, she said, I didn't believe we'd taken Lake Achibaba. The latest cables said it's still occupied by the German submarines. Fred nodded as if he didn't care. Achibaba used to be a hill once, wasn't it, Daddy? Chipped in one of the youngsters. Yes, it used to be one time, replied his father, looking into the blue puffs that drifted away from his pipe and out past the waterproof sheet of the dugout door. In those blue mists of the past, what he saw was the bald pate of the great hill, with the Halowitzes tearing earth out of the crest of it by the hundredweight, while the Turkish miners ever heaped the outside of it with the spoil from their tunnels. Yes, it was a hill once. Thus Freddy and his wife and family lived their life as happily as if there were no war. Soljuru, Second Field Company, Australian Engineers. Footnote. Posse or posse, Australian warriors short for position or lair. End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain. Section 6. Non nobis by C. E. W. B. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Kevin S. Not unto us, O Lord, to tell thy purpose in the blast when these that towered beyond us fell and we were overpassed. We cannot guess how goodness springs from the black tempest's breath, nor scan the birth of gentle things in these red bursts of death. We only know from good and great nothing save good can flow that where the cedar crash so straight no crooked tree shall grow that from their ruin a taller pride not for these eyes to see may clothe one day the valley side non nobis domine c e w b end of section six this recording is in the public domain Section 7. The Aegean Wind by H. B. K. from the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. The Aegean Wind. The winter winds of Lemnos. They blow exceeding fast. There's nothing quite so stiff on earth as that persistent blast. It ducks around the corners. Through all the hills it shoots. It blows the milk from out your tea. The laces from your boots. Is this the soft Aegean wind which Byron raved about, that whirls across the ridges and turns you inside out? Or is it some invention which Providence has made to give a breezy welcome to the 3rd Brigade? H. B. K. End of section 7. This recording is in the public domain. Section 8. Our Fathers by Captain James Sprent From the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean Wandering spirits seeking lands unknown Such were our fathers, stout hearts unafraid Have we been faithless, leaving homes they made 
with their life's blood cementing every stone. Nay, when the beast-like war god did intone, his horrid chance was our first reckoning paid. For years of ease their restless spirits bade. Us fight with those whose homeland was their own. Rest easy in your graves, the spirit lives, that brought you forth to claim of earth the best. Ours it is now, and ours it shall remain. Mere jealous greed no honest birthright gives. Shades of our fathers here our faith confessed. We shall defend your empire or be slain. Captain James Sprint, AMC, 3rd Field Ambulance. End of section 8. This recording is in the public domain. Section 9 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Glimpses of Anzac by Hector Dinning. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. It's the monotony we revile, not, to a like degree, hard work or hard fare. To look out on the same stretch of beach or the same patch of trench wall and the same terraces of hostile black and grey sandbags day after day is to be wearied. There is the same sitting in the same trench, shelled by the same guns, manned perhaps, though that we endeavour to avert, by the same Turks. Unhappily, it is not the same men of ours that they maim and kill daily. And if one's dugout lies on a seaward slope, there is every morning the same stretch of the lovely Aegean, with the same two islands standing over in the west. Yet neither the islands nor the sea are the same any two successive days. The temper of the Aegean at this time changes more suddenly and frequently than ever does that of the Pacific. Every morning the islands of the west take on fresh colour and are trailed by fresh shapes of mist. Today, Imbros stands right over against you. You see the detail of the fleet in the harbour, and the striated heights of rocky Samothrace reveal the small ravines. Tomorrow, in the early morning light, Imbros lies mysteriously afar off like an isle of the blessed, a delicate vapour shape reposing on the placid sea. Nor is there monotony in either weather or temperature. This is the late autumn, yet it is a halting and irregular advance the late autumn is making. Fierce, biting, raw days alternate with the comfortableness of the mild late summer. This morning to bathe is as much as your life is worth, shrapnel disregarded. Tomorrow, in the gentle air, you may splash and gloat an hour and desire more, and you prolong the joy by washing many garments. Here in Anzac we have suffered the tail end of one or two autumn storms, and have had two fierce and downright gales blow up. The wind came in the night with a suddenness that found us most unprepared. In half an hour many of us were homeless, crouching about with our bundled bedclothes trespassing tyrannically upon the confined space of the stouter dugouts of our friends. A sore tax upon true friendship. They lay on their backs and held down their roofs by mere weight of body until overpowered. Spectral figures in the driving atmosphere collided and wrangled and swore and blasphemed. The sea roared over the shingle with a violence that made even revilings inaudible. The morning showed a sorry beach. There were, there had been, three piers. One stood intact. The landward half of the second was clean gone. Of the third, there was no trace, except in a few splintered spars ashore. A collective dogged grin overlooked the beach that morning at the time of rising. The remedying began forthwith. So did the bursting of shrapnel over the workmen. This stroke of Allah upon the unfaithful was not to go unassisted. With misgiving, we foresee the winter robbing us of the boon of daily bathing. This is a serious matter. 
the morning splash has come to be indispensable. Daily at 6.30 you have been used to see the head of General Birdwood bobbing beyond the sunken barge inshore, and a host of nudes lined the beach. The host is diminishing to a few isolated fellows, who either are fanatics or are come down from the trenches and must clear up a vermin and dust-infested skin at all costs. Not infrequently, Beachy Bill catches a mid-morning bathing squad. There is ducking and splashing shorewards, and scurrying by men clad only in the garment nature gave them. Shrapnel bursting above the water in which you are disporting raises chiefly the question, will it ever stop? By this, you mean, will the pellets ever cease to whip the water? The interval between the murderous lightning flash aloft and the last pellet swish seems to the potential victim everlasting. The work of enemy shell behind the actual trenches is peculiarly horrible. Men are struck down suddenly and unmercifully where there is no heat of battle. A man dies more easily in the charge. Here he is wounded mortally unloading a cart, drawing water for his unit, directing a mule convoy. He may lose a limb or his life when off duty, merely returning from a bathe or washing a shirt. One of our number is struck by shrapnel, retiring to his dugout to read his just-delivered mail. He is off duty. He is, in fact, far up on the ridges overlooking the sea, the wound gapes in his back. There is no staunching it. Every thump of the aorta pumps out his life. Practically, he is a dead man when struck. He lives but a few minutes, with his pipe still steaming, clenched in his teeth. They lay him aside in the hospital. That night we stand about the grave in which he lies beneath his ground sheet. Over that wind-swept headland, the moon shines fitfully through driving cloud. A monitor bombards offshore. Under her friendly screaming shell and the singing bullets of the Turks, the worn, big-hearted padre intones the beautiful Catholic intercession for the soul of the dead in his cracked voice. At the burial of Sir John Moore was heard the distant and random gun. Here the shells sometimes burst in the midst of the burial party. To die violently and be laid in this shell-swept area is to die lonely indeed. The day is far off, but it will come, when splendid mausolea will be raised over these heroic dead. And one foresees the time when steamers will bear up the Aegean pilgrims, come to do honour at the resting places of friends and kindred and to move over the charred battlegrounds of Turkey. Informal parades for divine service are held on Sabbath afternoons for such men as are off duty. Attendances are scanty. The late afternoons are becoming bleak. Men relieved from labour seek the warmth of their dugouts. The chaplain stands where he can find a level area and awaits a congregation. When two or three are gathered together, he announces a hymn. The voices go up in feeble unison, punctuated by the roar of artillery and the crackle of rifle fire. The prayers are offered. The address is short and shorn of cant. This is no place for canting formula. Reality is very grim all round. There is a furtive under-watchfulness against shrapnel, one almost has forgotten what it is to sit in security and listen placidly to a sermon at church. The chaplains have come out to do their work simply and laboriously. They are direct-minded, purposeful men. One is a neighbour in a light horse regiment, a colonel. He flaunts it in no sandbagged palace. His dugout is indistinguishable from those of the privates between whom he is sandwiched mere waterproof sheet aloft, and bed laid on the Turkish clay. A couple of biscuit boxes with his oddments, jam and milk and bread, writing materials, and toilet requisites. 
A string line beneath the roof holds his towel and lately washed garments. He is a simple parson, hard worked by day and night in and about the trenches, careful for such comforts as can be got for his men in this benighted land, lying down at nights listening to the forceful lingo of his neighbours, and confessedly admiring its graphic, if well garnished, eloquence. He sees his duty with a direct gaze, a faithful churchman at work in the throes of war. In a land of necessarily hard fare, a regimental canteen in Imbros does much to compensate. Unit representatives proceed thence weekly by trawler for stores. One feels almost in the land of the living, when so near lie tinned fruit, butter, cocoa, coffee, sausages, sauces, chutneys, pipes, tobacco, and chocolate. Such a repertoire, combined with a monthly visit from the paymaster, removes one far from the commissariat hardships of the Crimea. The visualising of unstinted civilian meals is a prevalent pastime. Men sit at the mouths of their dugouts and relate the minutiae of the first dinner at home. Some men excel in this. They do it with a carnal power of graphic description, which makes one fairly pine. One has heard a colonel chaplain talk for two hours of nothing but grub, and at the end convincingly exempt himself from any charge of carnal-mindedness. Truly we are a people whose God is their belly, but that we never admitted until this period of enforced deprivation. Those comforts embraced by the use of good tobacco and deliverance from vermin at night are the most desired, both hard to procure. There is somehow a great gulf fixed between the civilian quality of any tobacco and the make-up of the same brand for the army. Once in six months, a friend in Australia dispatches a parcel of cigars. Therein lies the entrance to a fleeting paradise fleeting indeed when one's comrades have sniffed or ferreted out the key. After all, the pipe, given reasonably good tobacco, gives the entree to the paradise farthest removed from that of the fool. Of the plague of nocturnal vermin little need be said explicitly. The locomotion of the day almost dissipates the evil, but it makes night hideous. The tendency is to retire late and thus abridge the period of persecution. One's friends drop in for a yarn or a smoke after tea, and the dreaded hour of turning in is postponed by reminiscent chit-chat and the late preparation of supper. One renews here a surprising bulk of old acquaintance. Old college chums are dug out, and one talks back and lives a couple of hours in the glories of days that have passed. Believe it not that there is no deliverance possible from the hardness of active service. The retrospect and the prospect and the ever-present faculty of visualisation are ministering angels sent to minister. Males, too, are an anodyne. Their arrival eclipses considerations of life and death, of fighting and the landing of rations. The mail barge coming in somehow looms larger than a barge of supplies. Mails have been arriving weekly for six months, yet no one is callous to them. Of incoming mail, letters stand inevitably first. They put a man at home for an hour. But so does the local newspaper. Perusing that, he is back at the old matutinal habit of picking at the news over his eggs and coffee, racing against the suburban business train. Intimate associations hang about the reading of the local sheet. Domestic and parochial associations, almost as powerful as are brought by letters. And what shall be said of parcels from home? The boarding school home hamper is at last superseded. No son away at grammar school ever pursued his voyage of discovery through tarts, cakes and preserves, sweets, pies and fruit with the intensity of gloating expectation 
in which a man on Gallipoli discloses the contents of his parcel. Struth! A new pipe, Bill! And some of the old tobacco! Blimey! Cigars, too! Have one before the mob smells them. Damned if there ain't chocolate! Look here, and here's some of the dinkum coconut ice the tart used to make. Hello, more socks. Never mind, winter's coming. Here, how you off for socks, cobber? Take these, bonza and knitted. Sling them issue things into the sea. I'm damned, soap for the voyage home. Ank chiefs. All right, when the blizzards come and a chap sniffling for a week on end. Writing paper. Well, that's the straight tip and no error. The beggars have been putting it in me letters lately too. Well, I'll write tonight on the strength of it. Gord, here's a shaven stick. Andy that. I was clean run out using carbolic soap. Damn it. Oh, that's a dinkum damn parcel, that is. Hector Dinning, Australian ASC. End of section 9. Read by Jane Bennett. Section 10 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Parables of Anzac by a correspondent. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. 1. From Shell Green. From a correspondent in Australian Field Artillery, Sea View, Bolton's Knoll, near Shell Green. I was looking out from the entrance of my dugout, thinking how peaceful everything was, when Johnny Turk opened on our trenches. Shells were bursting and fragments scattered all about Shell Green. Just at this time, some new reinforcements were eagerly collecting spent fuses and shells as mementos. While this fusillade was on, men were walking about the green just as usual. When one was hit by a falling fuse, out rushed one of the reinforcement chaps, and when he saw that the man was not hurt, he asked, Want the fuse, mate? The other looked at him calmly. What do you think I stopped it for? he asked. 2. The Turk in the Periscope The same correspondent writes, I am sure that wherever the old fifth light horseman, who put in such a warm spell at Chatham some time ago, congregate after this war, the following incident will be told and retold. Bill Blankson was a real hard case. Happy-go-lucky, regardless of danger. Bill was put on sapping for over a fortnight, and at the end of that time had a growth of stubble that would have brought a flush of pride to his dirty face if he had seen it. But he hadn't seen it. One doesn't carry a looking-glass when sapping. At the end of the fortnight, he was taken off sapping and put on observing. Anyone who's used a periscope knows that unless the periscope is held well up before the eyes, instead of the landscape, one sees only one's own visage reflected in the lower glass. Bill didn't hold the periscope up far enough, and what he saw in it was a dark, dirty face with a wild growth of black stubble glaring straight back at him. He dropped the periscope, grabbed his rifle and scrambled up the parapet fully intending to finish the Turk who had dared to look down the other end of his periscope. He had mistaken his own reflection for a Turk's. End of section 10. Read by Jane Bennett. Section 11 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yarns That Abdul Tells by A.P.M. From the Anzac Book, edited by C.E.W. Bean, read for LibriVox.org. 
One of the chief pastimes of the Turks who live behind the black and white sandbags opposite, writes an officer who knows them intimately, is that of listening to stories told by the storytellers in the cafes of the Asia Minor villages. The hero of these stories is very often a certain Nastradi Hadja, who really existed at one time and made a reputation by his wit as well as through his stupidity. Here is an example of the sort of story about Nastradi which especially pleases the Turk. Nastradi Hadja's wife woke up one night through hearing a noise. She got up and, going out onto the landing, on the upper floor, outside her bedroom, called out, Nastradi, what was that noise? Nastradi's voice came up from below. Don't pay any attention to it, he said. It was only my shirt that tumbled down the stairs. Does a shirt make such a noise? she asked. No, was the reply, but I was in it. A.P.M. End of section 11. Section 12 of the Anzac Book Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley The Graves of Gallipoli The herdman, wandering by the lonely rails, Marks where they lie on the scarred mountain's flanks, Remembering that wild morning when the hills Shook to the roar of guns, and those wild ranks Searched upward from the sea. None tends them. Flowers will come again in spring. And the torn hills and those poor mounds be green. Some bird that sings in English woods may sing. To English lads beneath. The wind will keep its ancient lullaby. Some flower that blooms beside the southern foam. May blossom where our dead Australians lie and comfort them with whispers of their home, and they will dream, beneath the alien sky, of the Pacific Sea. Thrice happy they who fell beneath the walls, under their father's eyes, the Trojans said. Not we who die in exile where who falls, must lie in foreign earth. Alas, our dead lie buried far away. Yet where the brave man lies who fell in fight, For his dear country, there his country is, And we will mourn them proudly as of right, For meaner deaths be weeping and loud cries. They died, pro patria. End of section 12 This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of the Ansac Book Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley While seated one day in my dugout, weary and ill at ease, I saw a gunner carefully scanning his sunburnt knees. I asked him why he was searching and what he was searching for, but his only reply was a long-drawn sigh as he quickly killed one more. End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Anzac Dialogues by N. Ash from the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean It was a fine day, and they were standing by waiting for instructions from the warrant officer to commence unloading and loading, and in the general murmur of voices, one noted the broad tones of the British Tommy 
and the harsher ones of Tommy Kangaroo, the latter less careful of his grammar than the other, also the loud-voiced directions of the Indian Tommy, or rather Johnny, who condescended now and then to break into pigeon English with a smile. Presently, from amongst a group sitting in the shelter of a stack of bully beef came the request give us a light mate in the blunt style which belongs to tommy kangaroo ah yes replies tommy atkins or kitch as he is beginning to be called ah yes and while the other is pulling at his fag have you got any badges chum no I gave mine to a little nipper who used to sing on the stage at the El Dorado in Cairo. Did you now? She must have an fine stack of badges now, that un. You're about the fifteenth lad that I know has given his badges to her. Oh, thanks. Taking back his cigarette. I see you're from Australia. What state did you live in? Vic, is the reply. I wonder if you knew my brother. He went to Victoria a couple years ago, got a job on the railways. He did and wanted me to come out too. I'll go when this is over, but he's married now. He is and got a couple of pet lambs that he said was given to him by a chap named Drover. His name is Dobbs. Never met him, matey, but he is all right, you bet. A pommy can't go wrong out there if he isn't too lazy to work. Ah, Yes, he tells me they called him Pommy, but that he was good, lads. I could not understand them slinging off at him and him thinking they were treating him like he was one of themselves. Oh, well, you see, mate, we don't call the like of him Pommies because we dislike him but just as a matter of description. Of course, sometimes one of em gets its back up and calls us sons of convicts in return for us chucking off at him, and then he's told lots of things, sometimes true and very often untrue. But Australia's all right, mate. You need not be ashamed to be called a pommy out there. Blime, there's old Beachy at it again, breaks another. E's a fair cow, e is. Made me spill two buckets of water this morning, and our flaming cook told me I was too lazy to go down for it. I'll give em Beachy after this job is over if e don't look out. Hello, Johnny. Beachy catch em mule, eh? Beachy, no good mule, good, replies the tall, spare Indian, with a smile as he tries to bring his pair of mules under the shelter of the stack. Mule very good, he says, as he squats in front of the pair. How long yer been here, Choom? asks Kitch of Kangaroo nearly six months now blime i could do with a spell now too i'm beginning to get a ump like a camel from carrying these flaming boxes ah yes but it's better than bein in the trenches ain't it asked kitch blime no is the reply a man's got a chance to hit back there but down ere it's up to putty. It's bad enough to be eaten bully beef, but carrying it as well is rotten. 
I couldn't look a decent bullock in the face now for what I've said about him when he's tinned. Did ye ear what was doin' up at Nark's post last night, Bill? Yes, some deedy gobblers thought they would catch our mob nappin', but missed the bus, and some of them are still runnin' yellin' to aller to kick to them. Blast em! I'll give em aller when I get a chance. Keepin a man stuck on er when e might be havin a good time somewhere else i'll bet come on bill er comes the w o says his mate duh um see you later matey i'll try to get a badge for yer don't forget choom i want to send it to my married sister's little lass she thinks you lads be prime boys prime boys mutters bill as he grabs his case of bully yes prime boys juggling best prime bully meat duh it shut up bill says his mate you always growlin you'll want flowers on your grave next in nash End of section 14. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 15 from Quinn's Post from the Anzac Book. Edited by C.E.W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley. Celestial star that crossed my path, Leaving fair visions in my soul, Oh, why did you e'er leave your realm And break my heart with mournful dole? Now restless night doth me pursue, And fiends do tempt my soul to hell. Ah, gentle maid, if you but knew My inner shrine, and it could tell, my hidden love as deep as true as gentle as sweet birds at play drift back bright star and comfort me in this unending dreary day by v n hopkins private army medical corps attached to seventeenth australian battalion end of section fifteen this recording is in the public domain. Section 16. The Happy Warrior. A soliloquy. Somewhere in the Anzac Zone. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C.E.W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley. In my sandy dugout by the sea, Of Saros beyond Samothrace, I'm as happy as happy can be, And I'm bent upon washing my face, Before I go into my tea. But the water's so scarce in this land, That we do all our washing with sand, And we always have sand in our tea. In my fly-filled dugout by the sea, Near Anzac beyond Samothrace, both the cook and colonel agree that you must have some semblance of grace at breakfast, at dinner, and tea to prevent you from damning the eyes of the savage and pestilent flies, for you always have flies in your tea. In my shell swept dug out by the sea of Saros beyond Samothrace, I'm as happy as happy can be, though the shrapnel comes flying apace over moorland and mountains and lee for i wish you to quite understand though the hens have vacated the land yet we always have shells with our tea end of section sixteen this recording is in the public domain section seventeen 
How I Shall Die from the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley I only wait the evening tide, the rising of the moon. My little bark I'll gently slide into the still lagoon. Here storms are fierce and nations wage across the seas their strife and death's wild billows break their rage against the rocks of life i only wait the last long call perchance a short farewell then gently for the mists to fall or silent hill and dale by private charles lorre ninth australian battalion End of section 17 this recording is in the public domain. Section 18 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Beachy. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Outside was a cold, dark, windy, and cheerless night, and the world seemed cowering under the black, threatening rain pall above, which could be felt rather than seen. Inside my host's diggings, we were lounging back in the warmth and light, smoking and yarning of other times and places, while the partner of his home brewed the warm, fragrant, comforting, decoction which seemed to contribute so much to the mood and proper appreciation of such friendly comfort in the midst of the audible turmoil of unfriendly outer circumstances once again from outside there came a whirr and rattle past the door and i smiled significantly and glanced in that direction oh don't go until after the next one urged my host's companion seeing my attention diverted to things outside of our present cheery circle with this my friend seemed to concur and drew himself closer to the fire yes there's plenty of time yet he said there'll be a lot more of em so you might as well sit tight in safely and comfy and try another cup i didn't need much coaxing and thrusting the thought of the long unpleasant journey home out of my mind i settled down to further cheery chat and the enjoyment of stimulating internal comforts. The conversation seemed to have progressed but a little further, when above the wind outside could be heard again the warning roar and rumble, fading away and terminating in a muffled clang and clatter in the distance. That settles it, Billow, old chap, I said, half rising. Pass over my coat. If I hurry off now, I'll be just in time. But my friend didn't move to oblige now what's the use of hurrying he urged once more they'll be passing every minute now for a long time yet so why not settle down and enjoy yourself a bit longer taint very often you come this way by the time i had finished my reply to his persuasions i found again that my chance had gone and i would have to wait now anyhow and so the time passed we talked and talked while a useful youth who lived nearby and had attached himself to my friend billow made three reappearances with hot water for the cups that cheered as the night went on i wonder where rousey is presently remarked my host the jug wants refilling just then the disturbing rumble passed the door again and i rose to my feet don't bother to disturb him i said i suppose he's retired to his digs besides now's my chance to scoot too I've a long way to walk. Throw me that coat. Finding that all protestations were useless, my friends reluctantly allowed me to go, but not without Willilly expressed forebodings as to what unpleasantness might await me outside now that I had refused to enjoy their society and comforts any longer. They accompanied me to the door, and a cold blast of wind met us. There were ominous thunder rumbles in the murky distance a boster night for a walk footnote bosker boster bonzer australian slang for splendid end of footnote i remarked buttoning my coat about me 
Yes, grinned my friend, peering out into the darkness, and they're running to a peculiar sort of timetable tonight, passing about every seven minutes. You'd better get a wriggle on. There's a shortcut that way, he added, pointing to the right. Just past the corner of the cemetery, that's where they stop. So for God's sake, shake it up. If you don't, they won't see you home at all. It's an unhealthy night to be out. I asked them to say good night to the youth Razzy for me, and to thank him for his comforting ministration, then bade them farewell and moved off. I blundered along the sloppy, unpaved footway, peering tensely into the uncanny blackness about me, and hurried uneasily in the direction of a patch of faint pale blotches that I hoped and took to be the monuments in the little burying ground down beyond. I found that my direction was right, and presently I was hurrying past it as fast as I could manage in the wind and darkness. From somewhere behind me it sounded miles and miles away, through the noise of the wind. A faint low moaning sound reached my ear. I stepped forward uneasily, but before I had advanced a yard it had become more prolonged, and growing ever louder and closer, until I seemed to feel it coming coming with tremendous and ever-increasing speed. A horrible, nerve-shattering, deafening, wailing shriek. I stood dazed and paralyzed, rooted to the spot. With a scream of hellish intensity, it was all within a second. Really, it was on me. There was a flash of blinding light. Then everything ended so far as I was concerned. My next interest in life was a feeling that I had just been hurled up at the moon over it, and had descended slowly, ever so slowly, like a feather, to earth again. In fact, I wasn't quite sure that I was not a feather, and I opened my eyes carefully and tried to feel myself. Shh, shh, don't disturb yourself, remain quiet and comfy, said a persuasive voice beside me. I looked around as far as I could move, and knew that I was in a hospital, but where or of what kind I could not think for the moment. I lay a while, gazing blankly and unthinkingly, at a low white ceiling above me. Presently I fell to wondering, in what suburb, in what town? It seemed to have been hundreds of years ago that it had happened. Part of Australasia, could it be that a peaceful citizen, walking a darkened street, homeward bound, could be violently assailed, near the resting place of its harmless sleeping dead? by an awful uncanny horror, descending from the black unknown. Was I cursed, haunted, bewitched, or what? Then there came to me the vague memory of a friend, one whom I familiarly knew as Billow, and in some way associated with my terrible, mysterious experience, but somehow it didn't seem to fit in with the slowly gathering evidence of my returning senses for it seemed to me that Billow had long before quitted suburban civilization for some great adventure. Perhaps, yes, it was a war somewhere, in which I, too, had later resolved to follow his example and do my share. Then how came it that this terrible experience had befallen me in the midst of the enjoyment and comforts of civilization? I had a positive, though hazy, memory of a comfortable, warm room, pleasant drinks, cheery conversation, Billow and his companion, the latter a rough, kindly sort of being. No, it could not have been a woman. Besides, Billow was a bachelor. I remembered that distinctly. Suddenly it became clear to me, and I remembered a silent, rugged man facetiously dubbed Ennery by my friend, a kindly chap of very few words, with whom I had not been long acquainted. Where had Billow picked him up? There also came before me the memory of a small, dilapidated man or youth, dark-complexioned, somehow also attached to Billow. His name was, yes, that was it. Who the deuce was Razzy? My mind here became dazed, and speculation drifted off into a confusion of reflections. That Razzy was a foreigner of some sort living with us under the same conditions, yet in some way very different and in a degree inferior. That the hour at which I left my friend Billow's home and his inexplicable associates was quite early in the night, perhaps only nine-thirty. This latter fact seemed to linger in my mind, 
for presently with the hazy conviction that there was sure to be other pedestrians abroad on a suburban street at that hour i heard my own voice asking no one in particular was there any one else there it came as no surprise to hear a man's rough voice reply only a maltese at least we think he was he was blown to smithereens but don't let him see you talking too much mate the room seemed to rock i opened my eyes and with difficulty caught sight of the speaker he was in khaki and wore an amc badge on his arm i was on a hospital ship then that must have been poor razzy i muttered at last before my mind's eye there seemed to unfold a dissolving scene the cosy rooms of my friend billow became a dugout in a hillside lit by a slush lamp made from bacon fat billow and his rugged silent companion were wearing the familiar time-tattered uniform that i knew so well ages and ages ago actually it was five days back the door through which i had passed into the unpleasant night was an oil sheet tied down to keep the weather out and the frequent rumbling roar was not that of a passing suburban train which i was timing myself to catch on the contrary it was the intervals between that sound which interested me for each of those rushes past the door of my friend's dugout was a hurtling turkish shell and i wanted to make my escape at a reasonably safe moment also the place where they chiefly lobbed was the cemetery at the foot of the rugged track i had dreamed of it as the unpaved footpath of a new suburb where rest a score or more game australian lads who had taken part in the landing on gallipoli the unfortunate razzy by the way was but one of a gang of maltese laborers brought by the authorities at a later and safer period to help in the landing of stores from the transports in the bay of anzac he had become friendly with my luxury-loving friend billow and in gratitude for various kindly considerations was willing to provide the hot water to make our hot rum drinks on that memorable night at billow's station on our right wing i was quartered miles away on the extreme left so it was near the cemetery that the unexpected shell got me and apparently razzy also who was returning to his camp a hundred yards away there seemed something so droll about the whole strange illusion that although in a state of dazed depression i might have laughed but for an indescribable pain in my left side i saw that my left arm was supported on something and lay above the bedclothes and seemed very heavy feel comfortable asked the amc man yes except for the pain in my left hand i answered he looked down and i followed his gaze you haven't got no left hand he said quietly i saw that he was right and this new illusion struck me as being about the last straw with the dazed sort of conviction i muttered well it's a rummy world and promptly laid back and drifted out of it for the time being ted cole's third light horse field ambulance end of section eighteen Section 19 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Bryan Stewart. The Anzac Home and a Contrast by E. Cadigan. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. I'm sitting at the moment of writing in a dugout, one of those dismal, dark, damp holes cut into the clay of the Dardanelles, serving us as a haven of refuge by day and by night from the ubiquitous Turkish bullet. The proportions of this extemporized dwelling resemble those of an exceedingly small family tomb, one which might belong to a family too proud not to possess a family tomb at all, but too poor to possess one of adequate size and comfort if one can speak of comfort in such a connection. Its dimension should be about ten feet by four, but I'm not enthusiastic enough at the moment to ascertain them precisely. Its three walls are of crumbling clay. Where the fourth wall strictly should be is an exit which lets in the draught. Over my head are stretched waterproof sheets which let in the water. On the floor, in fine weather, is an inch of dust, and in bad weather, a proportionate amount of slimy mud. 
The few sandbags ranged round the parapet threatened to tumble in and annihilate my existence. I'm sitting on a roll of bedding, my haversack, water bottle, field glasses, webbing, pistol, gas helmet and India rubber basin arranged round my feet like so many pet dogs begging for biscuit. And in such an entourage, I think I'm my room at home. And that is where the matter of contrast comes in. It was the same at dinner. We, that is to say, my brother officers and I, sat in another variety of dugout, this time an open one, open to all that blows and falls. Our repast consisted of an exceedingly stringy rabbit, extracted from a tin of an ominous purple hue, an evil-looking dish, ecked out with somebody or other's baked beans, which are all very well in their way, but when used as an unvarying vegetable, at all meals begin to pall. Bread, with crust like a cinder, to which fondly clink bits of sacking and mule's whisker. The corpse of a cheese and the whole washed down with tea made in the stew Dixie, and tasting more of Dixie and stew than of tea. As I leaned back against the clay wall of my dugout, and innumerable particles of dust cascade down my neck, a soft river air steals over my senses. It seems to me to be about six or seven o'clock on a murky November afternoon in London. I've splashed home from my work in the wind and rain-swept streets, the motor buses have covered me with black mud. My umbrellas afforded me the most inadequate shelter. But these seem of little account to me here in Gallipoli. I see myself reaching my home in the best of spirits, entering the hall and shutting off the outer darkness. My sense of contrast gives me a lively notion of dry clothes, of a comfortable room, of a genial fire, and of an absorbing book. In future, I should be grateful for the rain and the mud and the murky streets for making these good things seem by contrast so much more valuable. Think of it, to sink into a great armchair in front of my library fire, after a hard and anxious day's work, and contemplate the near approach of an excellent evening meal. How comfortable and warm and hospitable my room appears, as I lean back and listen to the rather depressing, smothered rumble of the traffic in the street below. Thick curtains hide away the melancholy November London atmosphere. Sweet-smelling logs crackle cheerily on the hearth. A reading lamp by my side sheds subdued luster on the immediate vicinity of my chair. My servant glides into the room noiselessly over the soft carpet and places the evening paper by my side. I choose a cigar from my case, light it, and then I'm perfectly content and my contentment is due to contrast between my content with the existing situation and my past discontent with other situations at other times and other places. After a refreshing siesta, I go upstairs, exchange my workday clothes for a smoking suit. Two or three bachelor friends are due to dine with me, and by the time I have dressed and descended again to the sitting room, they are there ready for my greeting. And what a pleasant evening it is with their company. We talk of old times, old acquaintances and old places. We talk of our big game shoots, of our campaigns and of our travels, the recollection of which seems so delightful now that distance leads enchantment to the view. Dinner is over. A glass of brandy and old port, some smokes, and we are just adjourning to the next room. Wake up, old chap. Three o'clock. Your turn for the trenches. It is snowing hard and the Turks are very active. Contrasts indeed. E. Cadigan, 1 1 Suffolk Yeomanry. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Section 20. Flies and Fleas by A. Carruthers. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Regarding these two particular pests, my attitude in the past has been characterized by the utmost forbearance. I tolerated them and looked upon them as harmless and possibly of some usefulness to the community. 
The Gallipoli specimens, however, have changed my state of benevolent neutrality into one of most deadly warfare. No hymn of hate has yet been composed which could give expression to the hatred which has possessed me. Do you but go into the trenches in the endeavor to perform your duty to your country, and the flies immediately try to dissuade you by getting into your eyes, ears, nose, and mouth? Nothing will drive them away. They delight in this. They are entirely without pity. Retire to your dugout in the hope of escaping their attentions? and they are sure to follow you. Smoke till you all but asphyxiate yourself, and you find them as active as ever. Nothing that human ingenuity can devise will cause them to retreat. They defy our puny efforts. You may imitate the Kaiser and strafe them for all you are worth, but it is only waste of breath. They glory in this, and come back all the more. What we frequently distrust in the way of Tucker holds no terrors for the Gallipoli flies. They delight in taking risks, if only to impress us with their fearlessness. Stepping boldly on the edge of a syrup-covered biscuit, they immediately get their feet entangled. But they will not retreat. That would be against all their traditions. Instead, they will struggle their way towards the center, where they gladly give up the contest and die. They are born conquerors. I doff my hat to them in spite of my hate. With the setting sun, the flies retire, but operations are simply handed over to their allies, the fleas, and no worthier ally could be found than those pilgrims of the night. You may feel beat to the world, but there is no rest for you. As soon as you lie down to enjoy a well-earned rest, the attack commences. Advancing in open or close formation, according to circumstances, the enemy attacks on every flank with fixed bayonets, in the handling of which his units are experts. If driven off, they come again in still greater numbers. They appear to have unlimited reserves of reinforcements, which can be mobilized on the shortest notice. Their organization is perfect. Counterattacks in the dark are all in the favor of the enemy and the morning finds that they will have withdrawn their forces to advantageous cover in the blankets from which it is impossible to dislodge them. Keating's powder is of no avail against the Gallipoli fleas. It requires a still higher explosive to have any effect. The honors have so far fallen to the enemy. Personally, I would be inclined to discuss terms of peace but I doubt not he is too depraved to accept my advances. A. Carruthers, 3rd Australian Field Ambulance End of Section 20section twenty one of the Anzac Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 21 from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Anzac Types 1. Wallaby Joe. His real name matters little. Suffice it that he was known among his comrades as Wallaby Joe. He came to Galapagos via Egypt with the light horse. Incidentally, he had ridden nearly a thousand miles over sun scorched, drought stricken plains to join them. Age about 38, in appearance the typical bushman, tall and lean but strong as a piece of hickory, a horseman from head to toe and a dead shot. He possessed the usual bushy beard of the lonely prospector of the extreme back blocks. Out of deference to a delicate hint from his squadron commander, he shaved it off, but resolved to let it grow again when the exigencies of active service should discount such finicking niceties. His conversation was laconic, in the extreme. When the occasion demanded it, he could swear profusely and in a most picturesque vein. When a bursting shell from a 75 on one occasion blew away a chunk of prime Berkshire which he was cooking for breakfast, his remarks were intensely original and illuminative. He could also drink beer for indefinite periods, but seldom committed the vulgar error of becoming tanked. 
Not even that locality east of Suez, where, as the song tells us, there ain't no Ten Commandments and a man can raise a thirst, could make his steps erratic. He was very shy in the presence of the softer sex. On one occasion his unwary footsteps caused him some embarrassment. Feeling thirsty, he turned into one of those establishments, fairly common in Cairo, where the southern proprietors tried to hide the villainous quality of their beer by bribing sundry young ladies of various nationalities and colors to give more high-class vaudeville turns. The aforementioned young ladies are aided and abetted by a colored orchestra, one member of which manipulates the bagpipes. A portly damsel had just concluded amidst uproarious applause the haunting strains of ta ra ra boom she sidled up to Joe with a large-sized grin on her olive features. Give it a kiss, she murmured, trying to look ravishing. But Joe had fled. Henceforth, during his stay in Egypt, he took his beer in a little Russian bar. The proprietor of which could speak English and had been through the Russo-Japanese War. When the light horse were ordered at last to the front, Joe took a sad farewell of his old bay mare. He was, as a rule, about as sentimental as a steamroller, but leaving the old nag behind hurt some. On the peninsula and under fire, his sterling qualities were not long in coming to the surface. Living all his life in an environment in which the pick and shovel plays an important part, he proved himself an adept at sapping and mining. At this game he was worth four ordinary men. No matter how circuitous the maze of trenches, he could find his way with ease. He could turn out all sorts of dishes from his daily rations of flour, bacon, jam, and, of course, the inevitable bully and biscuits. An endless amount of initiative showed itself in everything he did. His mates learned quite a lot of things just by watching him potter about the trenches and bivouacs. His training at the military camps of Australia and, later, in Egypt, combined with the knowledge he had been imbibing from nature all his life, made him an ideal soldier. He was used extensively by his officers as a scout. As the Turkish trenches were often not more than twenty yards from our own, needless to say, the scouting was done at night, the Turks' favorite time to attack being just before dawn. Often during these nocturnal excursions, a slight rustle in the thick scrub would cause his mate to grasp his rifle with fixed bayonet and peer into the darkness with strained eyes and ears and quickened pulse. A hare, Joe would whisper, and probably advise him to take things easy while he himself watched. This went on for some time until one night his mate came in alone, pale-faced and wild-eyed. Interrogated by the officer on duty, he informed him that Joe had been shot. We brought the body in. He had been shot through the heart, a typical affair of outposts. Tucked away in one of the innumerable gullies, a little grave, one among hundreds, contains the body of one of nature's grand men. On the wooden cross surmounting it is the following. Number 008, Trooper J. Redgum, 20th Australian Light Horse, Killed in Action. WRC 8th ALH. End of section 21. This recording is in the public domain. Section 22 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anzac Types, The Dag, by E. A. M. W. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Yes, Ennessy was a dag, if ever there was one. I remember the day he came into camp at Liverpool. He was wearing his best Sunday grin, and when some bloke what was in the mob yelled out marmalade, he turns round and says to him, What's your complaint, mate? The bloke, he repeats, marmalade, and then as he says, Ah, that's what I thought it was. You'd better see a doctor and have it operated on right away, me man. He could eat like a horse. Blime. The way he used to stoke up on the bread and jam was a treat for sore eyes. He always used to ask to be put on the job of picket round the quartermaster's store, and they never tumbled to his game for a long while. He used to watch his chance. 
and every night would slip in and pinch a loaf of bread and a tin of jam and as his job consisted of keeping the cook's fire a-going all night he always had a cup of coffee ready when he wanted it one night he nips into the store to get his usual bit of supper and he bangs right into the bloke what was just put in new at the q m that day what are you doing here asked the bloke blam i thought i had a fair cop says ennessy quick as lightning i heard someone moving about in here and thought it was a chap pinching stuff and who are you says the bloke me i'm the bloomin picket says ennessy oh all right picket replies the bloke i sleep in here so you needn't worry about the store while i'm here all right mate says ennessy can you give us a bit of grub fair dinkum i'm hungry so he gets his grub after all but he couldn't come the double no more after that when he came over the water and first sees the turkish trenches he says strike me pink but where's them turks they talk about says i they're right there behind them sandbags old cock and don't you forget it neither and don't they come out and show themselves he asks what for says i why for us blokes to shoot at of course he says one morning early while he was standing to arms he lights up a bumper so i tells him not to let the officer cop him or there'd be trouble just then along comes the blooming officer so ennis he sticks his lighted bumper down south into his overcoat pocket and holds it there out of sight the officer sniffs about a bit then he asks ennis are you smoking no sir says ennis well i can smell smoke says the officer then he looks pretty hard at ennis and says what's your name ennis sir well ennis your pocket's on fire ennis looks and hang me if that blooming cigarette hadn't set fire to his coat pocket but the officer only says don't do it again and whips off it was when we came out of the firing line for a week's spell that ennis met his waterloo he was detailed for guard down at the drinking water and he was to take all his nap and camp down there the first night when he was doing his shift he sees a dark shape moving along and challenged it three times but never gets an answer so he ups with his gun and lets fly when the corporal rushes along to know what the blazes was the matter ennis ups and tells him so they goes forward together pretty careful and soon they sees a black heap lying on the sand ahead of them gore blime if Hennessy ain't gone and shot one of them poor little indian donkeys which had strayed along the beach well he was chaffed pretty considerable by his cobbers and got fairly sick of hearing about it next night when he was doing his shift again he sees another black shape moving along the beach so thinking his cobbers are having a joke with him he picks up a big stick and goes forward with it he had gone about twenty yards when suddenly there was a flash and a report and Hennessy drops down with a bullet through his chest strike me pink a real abdul had come up this time and it wasn't no bloomin donkey neither ennessy was it pretty bad but he grabs his rifle and lets fly and one more bloomy abdul had gone to join his prophet next day ennessy was taken away on a hospital ship but that was near three months ago i hear the blighter is back on the beach now and you will be able to see him yourself when he comes back to the squadron but strike me he's a bloomin dag written by e a m w and of section twenty two section twenty three of the anzac book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org section twenty three the anzac book edited by c e w bean anzac types three bobby of the new army bobby's gone sick this probably doesn't interest you but oh how we miss him so we must tell somebody bobby the ever smiling embodiment of breezy youth the spirit of cheerfulness the beau brummel of the trenches bobby landed with the regiment and went through thick and thin with it but always with a smile and never a scratch bullets flew off bobby at a tangent of our officers three only of the original arrivals were left when bobby went he had watched the others go away one by one some wounded some sick and some well just left where the foe and the stranger will tread o'er their heads when we're far away on the billow bobby had grown quite proud of his staying powers which carried him through three months of real hardship and trying work day and night 
But for Bobby's smile in adversity and his way, for he has a way with him, many of his brave boys would have given up. But Bobby's bright example spurred them on, and they stuck it like their idol. Bobby's only a youngster, but he is made of the real stuff that's bred in the army. When he found himself exalted to the command of a company his head didn't swell, the added responsibilities were not too heavy for Bobby's shoulders, which really were not broad relatively when compared with his broad smile. Bobby acted like a tonic to a man run down. But at last nature, in collusion with the M.O., asserted her imperious will, and Bobby just had to go to hospital. So Bobby bowed to the inevitable and, still smiling, went away. Bobby in hospital! What a picture! His bright smile, his rosy cheeks, and his immaculately parted hair framed in snowy white pillows. Bobby the irresistible. Bobby, we were loath to lose you. Bobby, we miss you. But Bobby, won't there be a weeping and a wailing when the nurses have to let you go? Still, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. Bobby's chocolate sweetened the bitterness of parting. Bobby's tinned fruit sustains us in his absence. Bobby's cigarettes soothe our sorrow. Tent Mate, 11th London Regiment. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Indian Mule Corps by B.R. From the Anzac Book, edited by C.E.W. Bean. My work in the ASC has brought me very much in touch with the Indian Mule Corps, and I don't think the Anzac Book would be complete without some mention of that admirable body of men. What should we at Anzac have done without Johnny and his sturdy little mules? Horse or motor transport could not have faced the difficulties of Anzac. The mules are sometimes stubborn and unmanageable, but we knew that before. And the drivers are, most of them, hard workers, intelligent and anxious to please. I often marvel on a rough day when the loaded carts nearly up to their axles in mud or sand are beached on that wild seashore, on the watery edge of which they are kept during the day, and wonder still more when after standing there for a few hours the mules draw them out when the convoy leaves at night. For the mules do not like the sea, and when the weather is rough it is very difficult to get the little beasts anywhere near it. One thing, however, really does hang up work for a time, and that is Beachy Bill in action. Even then, some of the Johnnies, who are less fearsome than the rest, go on with their work and have from time to time been hit. Therefore, all praise to the Indian Mule Corps. B.R. End of section 24. Section 25, Hill 60, from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean, read for LibriVox.org, by Alan Lawley. As some far swimmer turning views once more, England's white cliffs and strongly cleaves toward shore, but tide encumbered faint so far and dear, Thy crystal arms and pillared throat appear. Love to thy soldier who makes earth his bed. In this grey catacomb of unnamed dead, Thy voice er tossing seas of eaves and dawns, Comes like dim music heard on magic lawns. And when in prayer thou kneelest this grim brow, Feels the cool benison of hands which thou Wouldst often grant, now know I twas not vain, Our love whose memory softens present pain. By C.J.N. End of section 25. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 26 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Jenny by F. C. Dunstan. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. For the delightful diversion which little Jenny, with her frolics and gambols, provided for the ASCs, when they really had a moment to spare, another medium will have to be sought. Though of short duration, her life appeared a charmed one whilst it lasted. Her freedom of action was the envy of every soldier along the beach. Her disregard for the enemy's bullets and shells commanded our unbounded admiration. But whether her immunity for six months was due to the kindness of the Turks, or their bad shooting, or her own good judgment. Who can say? Jenny's origin is enveloped in some obscurity, but it is said that with her parents, Murphy of Red Cross fame, and Jenny Sr., she toddled into our lines when quite a mite, and once, having crossed over the border into civilization, the three emphatically refused to return whilst the objectionable Hun element obtained in their native country footnote this origin is a myth the parents landed with the troops on april twenty fifth nineteen fifteen murphy who bore a red cross between his two long ears is said in company with his master private simpson third australian field ambulance to have carried twenty seven wounded men from the firing line through shrapnel gully at the time when that valley thoroughly earned its name before his master met his death on one of these errands of mercy murphy himself was subsequently hit by a shell but happily survives and was we believe brought safely away from the anzac editors and a footnote jenny the younger was no mere mystic mascot for the humoring of an especially created superstition her congenial company and high spirits her affectionate ways and equable temperament were the factors which gained for her the obvious rank of camp pet her friendly regular visits will be missed and the picture of her patrician head and dark brown shaggy winter's coat her refined voice was music compared with the common hee-haw which characterizes her kind or the peremptory foghorn of the sergeant major but now she is no more our sorrow is immeasurable the mother never left the babe whilst it suffered excruciating agony through a deadly shrapnel pellet skilful indefatigable attention innumerable applications of the invincible iodine proved futile jenny senior is grief-stricken and now lies upon the neat little grave in which her infant was placed by the big australian playmates who now mourn their irreparable loss f c dunstan l c B. Depot, sixth AASC. End of section twenty six. Section twenty seven. Marching Song by C. J. N. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone boots belt rifle and pack all you'll need till you come back all you'll doff when you lie down to sleep all they take off when they bury you deep boots belt rifle and pack boots that went light down the suffolk lane will shuffle and drag ere they tread it again nails that rang gay on the cobbled street will have pierced through the sock into somebody's feet boots belt rifle and pack belt for water bottle and sword one to save life the other oh lord for you finish with them you bet one will be dry and the other wet boots belt rifle and pack rifle the soldier's only friend true if you treat her well to the end feed her with five and the tune she'll play will reach the heart of a turkish bay boots belt rifle and pack pack that holds what a man most wants a shirt an overcoat socks and pants a bible a photo of heart's desire but you'll throw it away when you charge or retire boots belt rifle and pack leather and canvas steel and wood 
they'll stand by you if you're good keep them oiled and keep them dry they'll see you home safely by and by boots belt rifle and pack c j n end of section twenty seven this recording is in the public domain Section 28 from the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley Furphy Editor's Note Furphy was the name of the contractor which was written large upon the rubbish carts that he supplied to the Melbourne camps. The name was transferred to a certain class of news item very common since the war which flourished greatly upon all the beaches. E.P.S. It was the colonel who propounded the theory first. On hearing some rumour, more optimistic than reliable, these fervies are the very devil, he said. Now I had a theory about fervy. I was waiting for an opportunity of following it up, and it came this way. I was on the beach one day when a friend met me and asked if I had heard the latest dinkum. On learning that I hadn't, he informed me that Greece had declared war on Turkey and was going to land a hundred thousand men within the next few days on the peninsula. I inquired for the source and he said he got it from a fellow who had just gone along the beach towards the left. I asked what the man was like. That sort of puzzled him. He said he was a tall man. No, he thought he was only middle height, or perhaps a bit on the small side. His hair was dark. No, now that he thought a bit, he fancied it was fair. In fact, the more he tried to describe him, the less could he remember him. He's my Moses, I said, and hurried off in the direction he had gone. Passing through the sap to Shrapnel Gully, I met another friend. Heard the latest? he inquired. I said no. Four Italian staff officers seen on the beach today, he said breathlessly. Two hundred thousand Italian troops being sent here. Who told you? I asked. Fellow just going into White's Valley. What was he like? I inquired, excitingly. An ordinary fellow. Not tall and not short. His hair? Well, it wasn't dark. Yes, it was. No, I don't know. How did he walk? I never noticed, he said. In fact, he didn't seem to walk at all. I left him standing and got down the sap and over into White's Valley in a record time, and bumped into another acquaintance. Heard the news? he said. No. Why, three hundred thousand Italians have landed at Hells, and Achibaba is to be taken tonight. I asked who his informant was, and he began to flounder into contradictions. I rushed off, knowing that I was well on the track of Furvy. In Victoria Gully, I heard that Romania had declared war and 400,000 troops were marching through Bulgaria to Constantinople. Who told you? What was he like? I gasped at the teller. Just a bloke, was the answer. He had two legs, two arms and a... Ed, two eyes. Then he added, in a puzzled fashion... But, damn it, did he? I didn't wait any longer, but was off again. At Shell Green, I heard that a man, just a fella, rather, had told them that the Russians had surrounded and captured Hindenburg's army, and that 500,000 Russians were to make a landing in Turkey. The Russian officers were here already. The man who had seen them had just passed five minutes before. I wasn't far from Furphy now. At Chatham's post, 
they were buzzing with excitement over the news that 600,000 French were going to be landed between Kappa Tipi and Hells. I asked if they thought it could be true, and they assured me that they had heard it from a man who looked as if he knew. No two descriptions of him, however, agreed. I was getting closer to Furphy. I hurried along the trenches as fast as I could, but got no information till near Lone Pine, where I heard that a big mob of Turks was expected to surrender that night. It was said they could not face the prospect of the coming landing of the whole Italian army. Besides, they were short of food and water, they were being badly treated by their officers, and their guns had hardly any ammunition left. A 75, just then, knocked a portion of parapet over me. I remarked that anyone could see the information was right about Abdul being short of ammunition. But where did the information come from? A fellow that just went by, they said. Looked like a staff officer. Getting near Steele's post, I saw in front of me a man with an indescribable gait. He seemed to float along instead of walk. It was Furphy. I hurried, but seemed to make no gain on him. I began to run. Near Courtney's post, I was twenty yards from him and called to a man to stop him. My quarry brushed past. I put on a spurt. I was within about five yards of him when, all of a sudden, he sank into the earth. As his head disappeared, he smiled an oily grimace at me, and I noticed that there were small horns behind his ears. QED End of section 28 This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 From My Trench From the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean Read for LibriVox.org By Alan Lawley A clear cold night and in the southern air Those far-off thunder rings so often there A Turkish moon is shining fitfully My thoughts are neath another moon where we Pace slowly through the tree stems, you and I, and looking back at young farewell, I sigh and wonder whether then I cared as much as now I do when far beyond your touch. Corporal Comus, 2nd Battalion, Australian Imperial Force. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30. Abdul by C. E. W. B. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org. We've drunk the boys who rushed the hills, the men who stormed the beach, the sappers and the ASC. We've had a toast for each. And the guns and stretcher bearers. But before the bowl is cool, there's one chap I'd like to mention. He's a fellow called Abdul. We haven't seen him much of late, unless it be his hat, bobbing down behind the loophole, and we mostly blaze at that. But we hear him wheezing there at nights, patrolling through the dark, with his signals hoots and chirrups, like an early morning lark. We've heard the twigs a-crackling as we crouched upon our knees, and his big black shape went smashing like a rhino through the trees. We've seen him flung in rank on rank across the morning sky, and we've had some pretty shooting, and he knows the way to die. Yes, we've seen him dying there in front. Our own boys died there too, with his poor dark eyes a-rolling, staring at the hopeless blue. With his poor maimed arms a-stretching to the god we both can name, and it fairly tore our hearts out, but it is a beastly game. 
So though your name be black as ink for murder and rapine, carried out in happy concert with your Christians from the Rhine, we will judge you, Mr. Abdul, by the test by which we can, that with all your breath, in life, in death, You've played the gentleman. C E W B. End of section thirty. This recording is in the public domain. Section thirty one of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Bryan Stewart. A Confession of Faith from the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. B. A Confession of Faith. Who would remember me were I to die? Remember with a pang and yet no pain? Remember as a friend and feel goodbye? Set at each memory as it wakes again? I would not that a single heart should ache. That some dear heart will ache is my one grief. Friends, if I have them, I would fondly take. With me that best of gifts, a friend's belief. I have believed, and for my faith reaped tars. Believed again, and losing was content. A heart perchance touched blindly unawares. Rewards with friendship, faith thus freely spent. Bury the body, it is served its ends. Mark not the spot, but... On Gallipoli, let it be said he died. O oh, hearts of friends, if I am worth it, keep my memory. Captain James Sprint, A.M.C., attached third field ambulance. End of section thirty one. Section thirty two of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Our Friend the Enemy by H.E.W. From the Anzac Book, edited by C.E.W. Bean. A sketch by one who knows him very well. In a shady spot beneath the scarlet blossom Judas trees, Abdul sat sipping his coffee, contemplating the busy scene in the small market place. There were happy fishermen hanging their nets to dry on the lime trees for which the village is famous after their night's toil in the Black Sea. Their catch was a good one, and was even now being put up for sale in the narrow alleys by the Jews. The village barber was a hard-worked man that day, for the Turk is vain and also dignified, and was it not the eve of the Barham festival? Groups of gaily-colored villagers among the fruitiers' baskets were busy haggling over their bargains. The words Kazam, my lamb, would often be flung by an infuriated vendor at stalwart curds. Workers in the neighboring quarry who fingered his luscious grapes while caviling at his prices. From a lattice window, a veiled woman with a shrill voice called to a little red fez boy escaping from his mother. The Mukhtar mayor, with a jasper handled stick, was pointing to the new fountain, its gilded inscription of extracts from the Koran shining in the sun. Had not the Mukhtar sat day after day outside the door of the great Dali Nazri, Minister of Interior, waiting to obtain credit for the construction of the fountain whose waters were from the Bessius Bens? God is great, 
and Muhammad is his prophet, murmured Abdel, as he slowly counted off another bead from his amber rosary. I am a happy man, he murmured to himself. Was not my kismet good when lifting the veil of my wife at the marriage ceremony? I found that she was beautiful. She is a good housekeeper. Her coffee resembles that of the creamy Arabian coffee bean. Is not the guild ram that I bought for tomorrow's sacrifice worthy of her cooking? Abdul wandered along homewards to his cottage near the shore, for it was drawing close to the midday call to prayer, and his heart was full of thanksgiving to Allah. Abdul is struggling along the main road leading to Stamboul with many others. He no longer hearkens to the beating of the tom-toms and to the patriotic exhortations of a struggling mob following behind with green banners. It is kismet, he murmurs, as he turns once more for a last look at the silvery winding thread below, the Bosphorus on whose shores lies his home, his all. He has been told there is a war. He does not question. He knows not the cause. It is fate. He trudges on. The fighting has been fierce. He is hard-pressed. Sweating with blood, he draws back. His regiment is hard put to it, and, like sheep without a master, the men are preparing to disperse. Already German machine guns from the rear are on to them. The road home means death. Like a man, he faces the rush of his opponents. He sees strange faces. The pain from his wounds is calmed. Once more, there swim before his eyes his home, his wife, his plantation of maize so promising. Allah was great. It was kismet. H-E-W-A and NZAC. End of section 32. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Section 33 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ezekiel, Ocala, Florida. Section 33 from the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Army Biscuits. Biscuits. Army Biscuits. What a volume of blessings and cursings have been uttered on the subject of biscuits army biscuits. What a part they take in our daily routine. The carrying of them, the eating of them, the cursing at them. Could we find any substitute for biscuits? Surely not. It is easy to think of biscuits without an army, but of an army without biscuits? Never. Biscuits, like the poor, are always with us. Crawling from our earthly dens at the dim dawning of the day, we receive no portion of the dainties which once were ours in the long-ago times of effete civilization. But, instead, we devour with eagerness biscuit porridge. We eat our meat not with thankfulness, but with biscuits. We lengthen out the taste of jam with biscuits. We pound them to powder. We boil them with bully. We stew them in stews, we fry them as fritters. We curse them with many and bitter cursings, and we bless them with few blessings. Biscuits, army biscuits. Consider the hardness of them. Remember the cracking of your plate, the breaking of this tooth, the splintering of that. 
Call to mind how your finest gold crown weakened, wobbled, and finally shriveled under the terrific strain of masticating Puntley and Chalmers number fives. Think of the aching void where once grew a goodly tooth. Think of the struggle and strain, the crushing and crunching as two molars wrestled with some rocky fragment. Think of the momentary elation during the fleeting seconds when it seemed that the molars would triumphantly blast and scrunch through every stratum of the thrice-hardened rock. Call to mind the disappointment, the agony of mind and body as the almost victorious grinder missed its footing, slipped, and snapped hard upon its mate while the elusive biscuit rasped and scraped upon bruised and tender gums. Biscuits! Army biscuits! Have you, reader, ever analyzed with due carefulness the taste of army biscuits? Is it the delicious succulency of ground granite, or the savory toothsomeness of powdered marble? Do we perceive a delicate flavoring of ferro-concrete with just a dash of scraped iron railings? Certainly, army biscuits, if they have a taste, have one which is peculiarly their own. The choicest dishes of civilized life, whether they be baked or boiled, stewed or steamed, fried, frizzled, roasted or toasted, whether they be composed of meat or fish, fruit or vegetable, have not, thank heaven, any like taste to that of army biscuits. Army biscuits taste like nothing else on the Gallipoli Peninsula. It is a debatable question indeed whether or not they have the quality of taste. If it be granted that they possess this faculty of stimulating the peripheral extremities of a soldier's taste buds, then it must also be conceded that the stimulation is on the whole of an unpleasant sort. In short, that the soldier's feeling, apart from the joy, the pride, and the satisfaction at his completed achievement in transferring a whole biscuit from his outer to his inner man without undue accident or loss of teeth, is one of pain, unease, and dissatisfaction. It may seem almost incredible, wholly unbelievable indeed, but armies have marched and fought, made sieges, retired according to plan, stormed impregnable cities, toiled in weariness and painfulness, kept lonely vigils, suffered the extremes of burning heat and of freezing cold, and have, in the last extremity, bled and died laurel-crowned and greatly triumphant, the heroes of legend and of song, all without the moral or physical or even spiritual aid of army biscuits. Agamemnon and the Greeks camped for ten years on the windy plains of Troy without one box of army biscuits. When Xerxes threw his pontoon bridge across the Narrows and marched one million men into Greece, his transport included none of Teak and Green and Company's paving stones for the hardening of his soldiers' hearts and the stiffening of their backs. Caesar subdued Britons, Gauls, and Germans. Before the lines of Dyrrhachium, his legions lived many days on boiled grass and such-like delicacies, but they never exercised their jaws upon a rough, tough bit of army biscuit. Biscuits! Army biscuits. They are old friends now, and like all old friends, they will stand much hard wear and tear. Well glazed, they would make excellent tiles or fine flagstones. After the war, they will have great scarcity value as curios, as souvenirs, which one can pass on from generation to generation. Souvenirs, which will endure while the empire stands. If we cannot get physical strength from army biscuits, let us at least catch the great spiritual ideal of enduring hardness, which they are so magnificently fitted to proclaim. The seasons change, Antwerp falls, Louvain is burned, 
the tide of battle surges back and forth. New reputations are made, the old ones pass away. Warsaw, Lemberg, Servia, the stern battle lines of Gallipoli, Hindenburg, Mackensen. Each name catches our ear for brief moments of time and then gives way to another, crowding it out. But army biscuits are abiding facts, always with us, patient, appealing, enduring. We can move to other theaters, we can change our clothes, our arms, and our generals, but we must have our biscuits, army biscuits, else we are no longer an army. O. E. Burton, N. Z. M. C. End of section 33. Section number 34 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Lost Poem by R.A.I. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C.E.W. Bean. I called to see our regimental poet last evening. He had previously told me that he intended to write something for the Anzac book. Our poet is also Q.M. Sergeant, and when he is not writing requisitions or taking back sheesh out of our rations and watering our rum, he writes poetry. When I called on him, he was in his dugout, surrounded by bully beef tins, empty cases, and his ill-gotten shares of our daily issues. He has many callers, and I am afraid their inquiries rather spoilt his verses. When I arrived, the QMS was already in a poor humor for writing poetry. The O.C. had been worrying him about galvanized iron for cover for some dugouts. Three men had complained about the scantiness of their rum issue, which somehow always annoys the QMS, and he had received no letters in the day's mail, except a bill from a chap he had borrowed a pound from in Charlesville two years ago. Still, our QMS is a sticker, and he read me the covering letter which he was sending to the editor. He said he thought it would be as well to get the letter off his mind first. That would make the writing of the verses necessary, and he would have to complete the job in order to keep faith. Before I arrived, he had written, Yes, Mr. Editor. I will try to write something for your book. Tis a glorious day, bright with sunshine, and the snow has melted away from the sides of the hills, snow that so many Anzacites saw fall for the first time. I know a state where no snow falls, and tonight, being rum issue night, I would sing to you of black soil plains and wheat fields, of warm, comfy boundary riders' huts, and of holidays where plump maids join you in surf-bathing excursions. But you see, I am a QMS, and at other times when I have tried to versify, I have been disturbed. We have a quarter master, but of course I do all the work. Well, let's rhyme. Boy, bring me the lyre. The quartermaster? No, I don't want the quartermaster. I want a harp that I may sing to my muse. He had just read this much out when the sergeant came in and reported that the CO insisted on galvanized iron being procured tomorrow. Then a corporal called and wanted to know 
could six men in his section have new boots and when would the rubber boots be ready for the coes in the trenches how can a man write when he is interrupted like this asked our poet i had a lovely inspiration too about surf bathing it ran like this but again there was an interruption the sergeant cook was the caller and he was angry and hostile how the can i cook seventy beef teas forty puddings and two hundred milk diets with the blooming quarter issue of water i get love me when i was cooking for shearing sheds out on the baru where it never rained i could get as much water as i wanted if you want them blooming milk diets you got to get me water or cook them yourself i don't know whether our poet had a rod with which he taps the rock and brings forth water but he mollified the surgeon cook by getting water from somewhere it tasted well in the rum too i would have heard the first line of the poem if one of the surgeons in our hospital had not called down for three hot water bottles a tin of bovril and some brandy for a sick soldier i wonder how sick you have to be before you get brandy before the surgeon had gone the orderly officer came in he bullied the qms about not getting some tents repaired it's hard work trying to write a poem here said the qms sadly when the orderly officer departed for two pins i'd chuck writing but that idea about the surf girls is too good to lose i was going to start with this line those patients up in number three ward must have more blankets and you will have to get another forty beds ready tonight yelled a voice at the door excuse me a bit said the poet he was gone about an hour when he returned there were five men waiting to interview him the corporal wished that the qms would explain how men were to keep their boots on without laces and whether socks were supposed to be everlasting the second caller came on a more peaceful mission he simply wanted to know if the qms had heard anything about a consignment of christmas billy cans that good people in australia are supposed to be sending us i don't know why but this query made my friend very angry do you think i've got your bloomin billy cans he yelled why should a qms say a thing like that and he seemed so indignant about it too the third chap wanted some paper and an envelope to write to his girl the fourth wanted an old blanket and some twine to make a shroud for a man who had died and the fifth asked whether the qms knew what was the latest war news when he was told to go to a place warmer than port darwin he asked quietly if either of us could tell him if sheep would do well around adian opal after the war it was growing late but i thought i would wait a bit and hear that first line about the surf bathers two men came in for soap a doctor chap called to ask whether there was any fruit to make a fruit salad for a sick man a lance corporal said his boots hurt and got a bigger pair the cook came back and complained that somebody had pinched six tins of condensed milk and an officer's servant inquired whether his boss could have an old box and a ground sheet to make a bath then the qms had another rum and took up his pencil again he spread out a piece of paper and commenced to write i'll get that first verse off and read it to you he said he would have done it too but for the sergeant major 
our sergeant major is a well he is just a sergeant major and he does not write verse what about those great coats he roared didn't i tell you to get them today and they are not here weeks ago i ordered you to get them i don't suppose you ever requisitioned for them what's that you're writing now requisitions no sir said the qms it's a poem then the major saw red what the blazes have i got here he yelled men dying from cold because they've got no coats and you writing poems what the he fainted away and i was present when the doctors came out of the hospital tent to which they carried him one of the doctors said the sergeant major was a splendid soldier but he had received a tremendous shock from some unknown cause and they don't think he can recover when the qms heard that he became very despondent i won't write that poem now he said but it would have been a splendid thing all about a pretty girl in the surf who met a fellow from the bush r a l first australian stat hospital end of section 34 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section 35 from the anzac book edited by c e w bean read for LibriVox.org by alan lawley a little sprig of wattle my mother's letter came today and now my thoughts are far away for in between its pages lay a little sprig of wattle the old home now looks at its best the message ran the country's dressed in spring's gay cloak and i have pressed a little sprig of wattle i almost see that glimpse of spring the very air here seems to ring with joyful notes of birds that sing among the sprigs of wattle the old home snug amidst the pines the trickling creek that twists and twines round tall gum roots and undermines is all ablaze with water a h scott fourth battery australian field artillery end of section thirty five this recording is in the public domain section thirty six the true story of sappho's death by m r from the anzac book edited by c e w bean read for librivox dot org by dan gordon the true story of sappho's death deciphered with much labor by a bomb thrower of the new zealand infantry brigade from a very old tablet dug up in the trenches at quinn's post the isles of greece the isles of greece where burning sappho sang both day and night, without surcease, she didn't care a hang. She sang so much, by night, by day, she couldn't sing at all. Her manager, he docked her pay, she didn't fill the hall. At length, distraught, in fiendish glee, from cliffs that I have seen, she flung herself into the sea, one mile from Mytilene. T'was thus that Sappho bold did end her gay voluptuous days, and monks who never can unbend press censored all her lays the moral of this tale is that you guard what day ascends you cannot burn the candle fat at both the candle ends note this epic loses much of its beauty through a hurried translation from the ancient greek during a turkish attack end of section 36 this recording is in the public domain Section 37. The Everlasting Argument. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley. 
The everlasting argument, said Pat Malone to a big brown sick. They say at fighting you're mighty slick, said Jock McNabb. Have you noticed the Sikhs? They wear their shirts outside their breeks, said Cornstalk Joe. Say what you like. I'll swear S-I-K-H, spells psych. Says I to a moor, what need to bicker? Pronounce it so's to rhyme with shicker. C.D. Mac, Railway Supply Detachment, 11th Australian, Army Service Corps. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Section 38. The Unburied. From the Anzac. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley. Now snowflakes thickly falling in the winter breeze have cloaked to light the hard, unbending ilex and the grey, drooping branches of the olive trees, transmuting into silver or their lead, and in between the winding lines in no man's land, have softly covered with a glittering shroud the unburied dead. And in the silence of night, when winds are fair, when shot and shard have ceased their wild surprising, I hear a sound of music in the upper air, rising and falling till it slowly dies. It is the beating of the wings of migrant birds, wafting the souls of these unburied heroes into the skies. M.R. New Zealand Headquarters End of Section 38 This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of the Anzac Book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Anzac, Part 1 by Ian Hamilton, from the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. The following extracts from the dispatches of Sir Ian Hamilton form a short official summary of the history of Anzac. The Landing the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps sailed out of Mudras Bay on the afternoon of April the 24th, escorted by the second squadron of the fleet under Rear Admiral Thursby. The rendezvous was reached just after half past one in the morning of the 25th, and there the 1,500 men who had been placed on board H.M. ships before leaving Mudras were transferred to their boats. This operation was carried out with remarkable expedition and in absolute silence. Simultaneously, the remaining 2,500 men of the covering force were transferred from their transports to six destroyers. At 2.30 a.m., H.M. ships, together with the tows and the destroyers, proceeded to within some four miles of the coast. H.M.S. Queen, flying Rear Admiral Thursby's flag, directing on a point about a mile north of Caba Tepe. At 3.30 a.m. orders to go ahead and land were given to the tows, and at 4.10 a.m. the destroyers were ordered to follow. All these arrangements worked without a hitch, and were carried out in complete orderliness and silence. No breath of wind ruffled the surface of the sea, and every condition was favorable save for the moon, which, sinking behind the ship's may have silhouetted them against its orb, portraying them thus to watchers on the shore. A rugged and difficult part of the coast had been selected for the landing, so difficult and rugged that I considered the Turks were not at all likely to anticipate such a descent. Indeed, owing to the toes having failed to maintain their exact direction, the actual point of disembarkation was rather more than a mile north of that which I had selected and was more closely overhung by steeper cliffs. Although this accident increased the initial difficulty of driving the enemy off the heights inland, 
it has since proved itself to have been a blessing in disguise inasmuch as the actual base of the force of occupation has been much better defiladed from shell-fire the beach on which the landing was actually effected is a very narrow strip of sand about one thousand yards in length bounded on the north and the south by two small promontories at its southern extremity a deep ravine with exceedingly steep scrub-clad sides runs inland in a north-easterly direction near the northern end of the beach a small but steep gully runs up into the hills at right angles to the shore between the ravine and the gully the whole of the beach is backed by the seaward face of the spur which forms the northwestern side of the ravine from the top of the spur the ground falls almost sheer except near the southern limit of the beach where gentler slopes give access to the mouth of the ravine behind further inland lie in a tangled knot the under features of sari bear separated by deep ravines which take a most confusing diversity of direction sharp spurs covered with dense scrubs and falling away in many places in precipitous sandy cliffs radiate from the principal mass of the mountain from which they run northwest west southwest and south to the coast the boats approached the land in the silence and the darkness and they were very close to the shore before the enemy stirred then about one battalion of turks was seen running along the beach at this critical moment the conduct of all ranks was most praiseworthy not a word was spoken everyone remained perfectly orderly and quiet awaiting the enemy's fire which sure enough opened causing many casualties the moment the boats touched the land the australians turn had come like lightning they leapt ashore and each man as he did so went straight at his bayonet at the enemy so vigorous was the onslaught that the turks made no attempt to withstand it and fled from ridge to ridge pursued by the australian infantry the attack was carried out by the third australian brigade under major temporary colonel sinclair Macallum, d s o the first and second brigades followed promptly and were all disembarked by two p m by which time twelve thousand men and two batteries of indian mountain artillery had been landed the disembarkation of further artillery was delayed owing to the fact that the enemy's heavy guns opened on the anchorage and forced the transports which had been subjected to continuous shelling from his field guns to stand further out to sea the broken ground the thick scrub the necessity for sending any formed detachments post haste as they landed to the critical point all these led to confusion and mixing up of units eventually the mixed crowd of fighting men some advancing from the beach others falling back before the oncoming turkish supports solidified into a semicircular position with its right about a mile north of gaba tepe and its left on the high ground over a fisherman's hut during this period parties of the ninth and tenth battalions charged and put out of action three of the enemy's krupp guns during this period also the disembarkation of the australian division was being followed by that of the new zealand and australian divisions two brigades only from eleven a m to three p m the enemy now reinforced to a strength of twenty thousand men attacked the whole line making a specially strong effort against the third brigade and the left of the second brigade this counter-attack was however handsomely repulsed with the help of the guns of h m ships between five and six thirty p m the counter-attack between five and six thirty p m a third most determined counter-attack was made against the third brigade who held their ground with more than equivalent stubbornness during the night again the turks made constant attacks but in spite of all the line held firm the troops had practically no rest on the night of the twenty fourth twenty fifth they had been fighting hard all day over a most difficult country and they had been subjected to heavy shrapnel fire in the open their casualties had been deplorably heavy but despite their losses and in spite of their fatigue the morning of the twenty sixth found them still in good heart and as full of fight as ever it is a consolation to know that the turks suffered still more seriously several times our machine guns got on to them in close formation and the whole surrounding country is still strewn with their dead of the state 
the reorganization of units and formations was impossible during the twenty sixth and twenty seventh owing to persistent attacks and advance was impossible until a reorganization could be effected and it only remained to entrench the position gained and to perfect the arrangements for bringing up ammunition water and supplies to the ridges in itself a most difficult undertaking four battalions of the royal navy division were sent up to reinforce the army corps on april twenty eighth and twenty ninth may second on the night of may second a bold effort was made to seize a commanding knoll in front of the centre of the line the enemy's enfilading machine guns were too scientifically posted and eight hundred men were lost without advantage beyond the infliction of a corresponding loss to the enemy on may fourth an attempt to seize kaba tepe was also unsuccessful the barbed wire here being something beyond belief but a number of minor operations were carried out such as the taking of a turkish observing station the strengthening of entrenchments the reorganization of units and the perfecting of communication with the landing place also a constant strain was placed upon some of the best troops who to the number of twenty four thousand were constantly kept fighting and being killed and wounded freely as the turkish sniper is no match for the kangaroo shooter even at his own game two brigades sent to hellas the many urgent calls for reinforcements made during the previous critical fighting had forced me to disorganize and mix together several of the formations in the southern group to the extent even of the french on our right having a british battalion holding their own extremist right for the purposes of the impending fight it became therefore necessary to create temporarily a composite division consisting of the second australian and new zealand infantry brigades withdrawn for the purpose from the northern section together with the naval brigade formed of the plymouth and drake battalions twenty ninth division was reconstituted into four brigades i e the eighty eighth and eighty seventh brigades the lancashire fusilier brigade t f and the twenty ninth indian infantry brigade the french corps expeditionnaire was reinforced by the second naval brigade and the new composite division formed my general reserve during the three days may sixth through eighth our troops were destined to be very severely tried they were about to attack a series of positions scientifically selected in advance which although not yet joined up into one line of entrenchment were already strengthened by works on their most important tactical features after recounting the heavy fighting by which the twenty ninth division made its advance on may sixth and seventh the dispatch continues the troops were now worn out the new lines needed consolidating and it was certain that fresh reinforcements were reaching the turks balancing the actual state of my own troops against the probable condition of the turks i decided to call upon the men to make one more push before the new enemy forces could get into touch with their surroundings orders were therefore issued to dig in at sundown on the line gained to maintain that line against counter-attack and to prepare to advance again next morning the lancashire fusilier brigade was withdrawn into reserve and its place on the left was taken by the brigade of new zealanders general headquarters were shifted to an entrenchment on a hill in rear of the left of our line under my plan for the fresh attack the new zealand brigade was to advance through the line held during the night by the eighty eighth brigade and press on towards Krithia. simultaneously the eighty seventh brigade was to threaten the works on the west of the ravine whilst endeavouring by means of parties of scouts and volunteers to steal patches of ground from the areas dominated by the german machine guns battle of Krithia. at ten fifteen a m heavy fire from ships and batteries was opened on the whole front and at ten thirty a m the new zealand brigade began to move meeting with strenuous opposition from the enemy who had received his reinforcements supported by the fire of the batteries and the machine guns of the eighty eighth brigade they pushed forward on the right and advanced their centre beyond the fir trees but could make little further progress by one thirty p m about two hundred yards had been gained beyond the previously most advanced trenches of the eighty eighth brigade 
at this hour the french corps reported they could not advance up the crest of the spur west of caravis deer till further progress was made by the british at four p m i gave orders that the whole line reinforced by the second australian brigade would fix bayonets slope arms and move on krithia precisely at five thirty p m at five fifteen p m the ship's guns and our heavy artillery bombarded the enemy's position for a quarter of an hour and at five thirty p m the field guns opened a hot shrapnel fire to cover the infantry advance the cooperation of artillery and infantry in this attack was perfect the timing of the movement being carried out with great precision some of the companies of the new zealand regiments did not get their orders in time but acting on their own initiative they pushed on as soon as the heavy howitzers ceased firing thus making the whole advance simultaneous the steady advance of the british could be followed by the sparkle of their bayonets until the long lines entered the smoke clouds the french at first made no move then their drums beating and bugles sounding the charge they suddenly darted forward in a swarm of skirmishers which seemed in one moment to cover the whole southern face of the ridge of the caravis deer against these the turkish gunners now turned their heaviest pieces and as the leading group stormed the first turkish redoubt the ink-black bursts of high explosive shells blotted out both assailants and assailed the trial was too severe for the senegalese tirailors they recoiled they were rallied another rushed forward another repulse and then a small supporting column of french soldiers was seen silhouetted against the sky as they charged upwards along the crest of the ridge of the caravis dare whilst elsewhere it grew so dark that the whole of the battlefield became a blank not until next morning did any reliable details come to hand of what had happened the new zealanders firing line had marched over the cunningly concealed enemy machine guns without seeing them and these reopening on our supports as they came up caused them heavy losses but the first line pressed on and arrived within a few yards of the turkish trenches which had been holding up our advance beyond the fir wood there they dug themselves in the australian brigade had advanced through the composite brigade and in spite of heavy losses from shrapnel machine gun and rifle fire had progressed from three hundred to four hundred yards the determined valor shown by these two brigades the new zealand brigade under brigadier general f e johnston and the second australian infantry brigade under brigadier general the hon j w mckay are worthy of particular praise their losses were correspondingly heavy but in spite of fierce counter-attacks by numerous fresh troops they stuck to what they had won with admirable tenacity on the extreme left the eighty seventh brigade under major general w r marshall made a final and especially gallant effort to advance across the smooth bullet-swept area between the ravine and the sea but once more the enemy machine-guns thinned the ranks of the leading companies of the south whale borderers and again there was nothing for it but to give ground but when night closed in the men of the eighty seventh brigade of their own accord asked to be led forward and achieved progress to the extent of just about two hundred yards during the darkness the british troops everywhere entrenched themselves on the line gained on the right the french column last seen as it grew dark had stormed and still held the redoubt round which the fighting had centred the second australian infantry brigade and the new zealand infantry brigade were for three days in the trenches they had dug but on the completion of the push towards krithia were retransferred to anzac the history of anzac during the next three months is told in the following extracts quinn's post turning now to where the australian and new zealand army corps were perched upon the cliffs of sari bear i must begin by explaining that their role at this stage of the operations was first to keep a door leading to the vitals of the turkish position secondly to hold up as large a body as possible of the enemy in front of them so as to lessen the strain at cape Helles anzac in fact was cast to play second fiddle to cape hellas a part out of harmony with the daredevil spirit animating those warriors from the south and so it has come about that as your lordship will now see the defensive of the australians and new zealanders has always tended to take on the character of an attack 
the line held during the period under review by the australian and new zealand army corps formed a rough semicircle inland from the beach of anzac cove with a diameter of about eleven hundred yards the firing line is everywhere close to the enemy's trenches and in all sections of the position sapping countersapping and bomb attacks have been incessant the shelling both of the trenches and beaches has been impartial and liberal as many as fourteen hundred shells have fallen on anzac within the hour and these of all calibers from eleven inches to field shrapnel around quinn's post both above and below ground the contest has been particularly severe this section of the line is situated on the circumference of the anzac semicircle at the farthest point from its diameter here our fire trenches are mere ledges on the brink of a sheer precipice falling two hundred feet into the valley below the enemy's trenches are only a few feet distant on may ninth a night assault was delivered on the enemy's trenches in front of quinn's post the trenches were carried at the point of the bayonet at dawn on may tenth a strong counter-attack forced our troops to fall back on quinn's post on the night of may fourteen fifteen a sortie was made from quinn's post with the object of filling in turkish trenches in which bomb throwers were active the sortie which cost us some seventy casualties was not successful on may fourteen lieutenant general sir w r birdwood was slightly wounded but i am glad to say he was not obliged to relinquish the command of his corps death of general bridges on may fifteenth i deeply regret to say major general w t bridges commanding the australian division received a severe wound which proved fatal a few days later sincere and single-minded in his devotion to australia and to duty his loss still stands out even amidst the hundreds of other brave officers who have gone general bridges was succeeded by major general h b walker the first australian division was also commanded by major general j g leggy who afterwards organized and commanded the second australian division may nineteenth on may eighteenth anzac was subjected to a heavy bombardment from large caliber guns and howitzers at midnight of the eighteenth nineteenth the most violent rifle and machine-gun fire yet experienced broke out along the front slackening from three a m to four a m it then broke out again and a heavy turkish column assaulted the left of number two section this assault was beaten off with loss another attack was delivered before daylight on the centre of this section it was repeated four times and repulsed each time with very serious losses to the enemy simultaneously a heavy attack was delivered on the northeast salient of number four section which was repulsed and followed up but the pressing of the counter-attack was prevented by shrapnel attacks were also delivered on quinn's post courtney's post and along the front of our right section at about five a m the battle was fairly joined and a furious cannonade was begun by a large number of enemy guns including twelve inch and nine point two inch and other artillery that had not till then opened by nine thirty a m the turks were pressing hard against the left of courtney's and the right of quinn's post at ten a m this attack unable to face fire from the right swung round to the left where it was severely handled by our guns and the machine guns of our left section by eleven a m the enemy who were crowded together in the trenches beyond quinn's post were giving way under their heavy losses according to prisoners reports thirty thousand troops including five fresh regiments were used against us general lyman von sanders was himself in command the enemy's casualties were heavy as may be judged by the fact that over three thousand dead were lying in the open in view of our trenches a large proportion of these losses were due to our artillery fire our casualties amounted to about one hundred killed and five hundred wounded including nine officers wounded the next four days were chiefly remarkable for the carrying through of the negotiations for the suspension of arms which actually took place on may twenty fourth the negotiations resulted in a suspension of arms from seven thirty a m to four thirty p m on may twenty fourth the procedure laid down for the suspension of arms was i am glad to inform your lordship correctly observed on both sides the burial of the dead was finished about three p m 
some three thousand turkish dead were removed or buried in the area between the opposing lines the whole of these were killed on or since may eighteenth many bodies of men killed earlier were also buried from may twenty eighth till june fifth the fighting seemed to concentrate itself around quinn's post three enemy galleries had been detected there quinn's again from may twenty eighth till june fifth the fighting seemed to concentrate itself around quinn's post three enemy galleries had been detected there and work on them stopped by countermines which killed twenty turks and injured thirty one gallery had however been overlooked and at three thirty a m on may twenty ninth a mine was sprung in or near the centre of quinn's post the explosion was followed by a very heavy bomb attack before which our left centre subsection fell back letting in a storming party of turks this isolated one subsection on the left from the two other subsections on the right at five thirty a m our counter-attack was launched and by six a m the position had been retaken with the bayonet by the fifteenth australian infantry battalion led by major quinn who was unfortunately killed all the enemy in the trench were killed or captured on may thirtieth preparations were made in quinn's post to attack and destroy two enemy saps the heads of which had reached within five yards of our fire trench two storming parties of thirty-five men went forward at one p m cleared the sap heads and penetrated into the trenches beyond but they were gradually driven back by bombs of which the enemy seemed to have an unlimited supply during may thirty first close fighting continued in front of quinn's post on june first an hour after dark two sappers of the new zealand engineers courageously crept out and laid a charge of gun cotton against a timber and sandbag bomb proof the structure was completely demolished the demonstrations on june fourth three separate enterprises were carried out by the australian and new zealand army corps these were undertaken in compliance with an order which i had issued that the enemy's attention should be distracted during an attack i was about to deliver in the southern zone first a demonstration in the direction of kaba tebi the navy cooperating by bombarding the turkish trenches at quinn's post an assault was delivered at eleven p m a party of sixty men accompanied by a bomb-throwing party on either flank stormed the enemy's trench in the assault many turks were bayoneted and twenty-eight captured at six thirty a m the trench had to be abandoned on june fifth a sortie was made by two officers and one hundred men of the first australian infantry the objective being the destruction of a machine-gun in a trench known as german officers trench the darkness of the trench and its overhead cover prevented the use of the bayonet but some damage was done by shooting down over the parapet the aim of this gallant assault being attained the party withdrew in good order with their wounded casualties in all were thirty-six enver's attack on the night of june twenty nine thirty the turks acting as we afterwards ascertained under the direct personal order of enver pasha to drive us all into the sea made a big attack on the australian and new zealand army corps principally on that portion of the line which was under the command of major-general sir a j godley from midnight till one thirty a m a fire of musketry and guns of greatest intensity was poured upon our trenches a heavy column then advanced to the assault and was completely crumpled up by the musketry and machine-guns of the seventh and eighth light horse an hour later another grand attack took place against our left and left centre and was equally cut to pieces by our artillery and rifle fire the enemy's casualties may be judged by the fact that in areas directly exposed to view between four hundred and five hundred were actually seen to fall sulva and sahri bear the great battle of august from the very first i had hoped that by landing a force under the heights of sahri bear we should be able to strangle the turkish communications to the southwards whether by land or sea and so clear the narrows for the fleet owing to the enemy's superiority both in numbers and in position owing to underestimates of the strength of the original entrenchments prepared and sighted under german direction owing to the constant dwindling of the units of my force through wastage owing also to the intricacy and difficulty of the terrain 
these hopes had not hitherto borne fruit but they were well founded so much at least had clearly enough been demonstrated by the desperate and costly nature of the turkish attacks the australians and new zealanders had rooted themselves in very near to the vitals of the enemy by their tenacity and courage they still held open the doorway from which one strong thrust forward might give us command of the narrows before a man of the reinforcements had arrived my mind was made up as to their employment and by means of a vigorous offensive from anzac combined with a surprise landing to the north of it i meant to try and win through to matos leaving behind me a well-protected line of communications starting from the bay of suvla reinforcements on the nights of august four five and six the reinforcing troops were shipped into anzac very silently at the darkest hours then still silently they were tucked away from enemy aeroplanes and observatories in their prepared hiding places the whole sea route lay open to the view of the turks upon ashibaba's summit and battleship hill aeroplanes could count every tent and every ship at mundros or at embros within rifle fire of anzac's open beach hostile riflemen were looking out across the aegean no more than twenty feet from our opposing lines every modern appliance of telescope telegraph wireless was at the disposal of the enemy yet the instructions worked out at general headquarters and the minutest detail the result of conferences with the royal navy which were attended by brigadier general skeen of general bird wood's staff were such that the scheme was carried through without a hitch the troops now at the disposal of general bird wood amounted in round numbers to thirty seven thousand rifles and seventy two guns with naval support from two cruisers four monitors and two destroyers under the scheme these troops were to be divided into two main portions the task of holding the existing anzac position and of making frontal assaults therefrom was assigned to the australian division plus the first and third light horse brigades and two battalions of the fortieth brigade that of assaulting the chunuk bear ridge was entrusted to the new zealand and australian division less the first and third light horse brigades to the thirteenth division less five battalions and to the twenty ninth indian infantry brigade and to the indian mountain artillery brigade the twenty ninth brigade of the tenth division less one battalion and the thirty eighth brigade were held in reserve the assault on lone pine during august fourth fifth and sixth the works on the enemy's left and centre were subjected to a slow bombardment and on the afternoon of august sixth an assault was made upon the formidable lone pine entrenchment the work consisted of a strong pont de appui on the southwestern end of a plateau where it confronted at distances varying from sixty to one hundred and twenty yards the salient in the line of our trenches named by us the pimple the entrenchment was evidently very strong was entangled with wire and provided with overhead cover the detailed scheme of attack was worked out with care and forethought by major-general h b walker commanding first australian division and his thoroughness contributed i consider largely to the success of the enterprise the action commenced at four thirty p m with a continuous and heavy bombardment of the lone pine and adjacent trenches h m s bacant assisting by searching the valleys to the northeast and east and the monitors by shelling the enemy's batteries south of gaba tepe the assault had been entrusted to the first australian brigade brigadier-general n m smith and punctually at five thirty p m it was carried out by the second third and fourth australian battalions the first battalion forming the brigade reserve two lines left their trenches simultaneously and were closely followed up by a third the rush across the open was a regular race against death which came in the shape of a hail of shell and rifle bullets from front and from either flank but the australians had firmly resolved to reach the enemy's trenches and in this determination they became for the moment invincible the barbed wire entanglement was reached and was surmounted then came a terrible moment when it seemed as though it would be physically impossible to penetrate into the trenches 
the overhead cover of stout pine beams resisted all individual efforts to move it and the loopholes continued to spit fire groups of our men then bodily lifted up the beams and individual soldiers leaped down into the semi-darkened galleries amongst the turks by five forty seven p m the third and fourth battalions were well into the enemy's vitals and a few minutes later the reserves of the second battalion advanced over their parados and driving out killing or capturing the occupants made good the whole of the trenches the reserve companies of the third and fourth battalions followed and at six twenty p m the first battalion in reserve was launched to consolidate the position counter-attack at lone pine at once the turks made it plain as they had never ceased to do since that they had no intention of acquiescing in the capture of this capital work at seven p m a determined and violent counter-attack began for seven hours these counter-attacks continued all this time consolidation was being attempted although the presence of so many turkish prisoners hampered movement and constituted an actual danger in beating off these desperate counter-attacks very heavy casualties were suffered by the australians part of the twelfth battalion the reserve of the third brigade had therefore to be thrown into the melee twelve hours later on the seventh another effort was made by the enemy being resumed at midnight and proceeding intermittently till dawn at an early period of this last counter-attack the fourth battalion was forced by bombs to relinquish a portion of a trench but later on led by their commanding officer lieutenant colonel mcnaughton they killed every turk who had got in at five a m on august ninth the enemy made a sudden attempt to storm from the east and southeast after a feint of fire attack from the north the seventh battalion bore the brunt of the shock and handled the attack so vigorously that by seven forty five there were clear signs of demoralization in the enemy's ranks but although this marked the end of counter-attacks on the large scale the bombing and sniping continued though in less volume throughout this day and night and lasted till august twelfth when it at last became manifest that we had gained complete ascendancy thus was lone pine taken and held the turks were in great force and very full of fight yet one weak australian brigade numbering at the outset but two thousand rifles and supported only by two weak battalions carried the work under the eyes of a whole enemy division the irresistible dash and daring of officers and men in the initial charge was a glory to australia in one corner eight turks and six australians were found lying as they had bayoneted one another to make room for the fighting men the dead were ranged in rows on either side of the gangway after the first violence of the counter-attacks had abated one thousand corpses our own and turkish were dragged out from the trenches the lone pine attack drew all the local enemy reserves toward it and may be held more than any other cause to have been the reason that the souvla bay landing was so lightly opposed our captures in this feat of arms amounted to one hundred and thirty four prisoners seven machine guns and a large quantity of ammunition and equipment the neck baby seven hundred and german officers trench attacked other frontal attacks from the existing anzac positions were not so fortunate they included an attack upon the work known as german officers trench on the extreme right of our line at midnight on august sixth seven also assaults on the neck and baby seven hundred trenches opposite the centre of our line delivered at four thirty a m on the seventh the second australian brigade did all that men could do the light horse only accepted their repulse after losing three-fourths of that devoted band who so bravely sallied forth all that day as the result of these most gallant attacks turkish reserves on battleship hill were being held back to meet any dangerous developments along the front of the old anzac line and so were not available to meet our main enterprise which i will now endeavour to describe end of section thirty nine section forty of the anzac book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
the story of anzac part two by ian hamilton from the anzac book edited by c e w bean the main push the first step in the real push the step which above all others was to count was the night attack on the summits of the sari bear bridge it was our object to effect a lodgment along the crest of the high main ridge with two columns of troops but seeing the nature of the ground and the dispositions of the enemy the effort had to be made by stages we were bound in fact to undertake a double subsidiary operation before we could hope to launch these attacks with any real prospect of success the two assaulting columns which were to work up three ravines to the storm of the high ridge were to be preceded by two covering columns one of these was to capture the enemy's positions commanding the foothills first open the mouths of the ravines secondly to cover the right flank of another covering force whilst it marched along the beach the other covering column was to strike far out to the north until from a hill called damat jalik bear it could at the same time facilitate the landing of the ninth corps at nibrunesi point and guard the left flank of the column assaulting sari bear from any forces of the enemy which might be assembled in the anafata valley the whole of this big attack was placed under the command of major general sir a j godley general officer commanding new zealand and australian division the two covering and the two assaulting columns were organized as follows right covering column under brigadier general a h russell new zealand mounted rifles brigade the otago mounted rifles regiment the maori contingent and new zealand field troop right assaulting column under brigadier general f e johnston new zealand infantry brigade indian mountain battery less one section one company new zealand engineers left covering column under brigadier general j h travers headquarters fortieth brigade half the seventy second field company fourth battalion south wales borderers and fifth battalion wiltshire regiment left assaulting column under brigadier general now major general h v cox twenty ninth indian infantry brigade fourth australian infantry brigade indian mountain battery less one section one company new zealand engineers divisional reserve sixth battalion south lancashire regiment and eighth battalion welsh regiment pioneers at chailac dare and the thirty ninth infantry brigade and half seventy second field company at ago dare in the foothills the right covering column had to clear the turks off from their right flank positions upon old number three post and tabletop old number three post connected with tabletop by a razor back working parties had done their best with unstinted material to convert this commanding point into an impregnable redoubt two lines of fire trench very heavily entangled protected its southern face Tabletop is a steep-sided, flat-topped hill. Close at 400 feet above sea level, the sides of the hill are mostly sheer and quite impracticable. Amongst other stratagems, the Anzac troops, assisted by H.M.S. Colm, had long and carefully been educating the Turks how they should lose old number three post, which could hardly have been rushed by simple force of arms. Every night, exactly at 9 p.m., H.M.S. Colm threw the beams of her searchlight on to the redoubt and open fired upon it for exactly ten minutes then after a ten minutes interval came a second illumination and bombardment commencing always at nine twenty and ending precisely at nine thirty p m the idea was that after successive nights of such practice the enemy would get into the habit of taking the searchlight as a hint to clear out until the shelling was at an end but on the eventful night of the sixth the sound of their footsteps drowned by the loud cannonade unseen as they crept along in that darkest shadow which fringes a searchlight's beam came the right covering column at nine thirty the light switched off and instantly our men poured out of the scrub jungle and into the redoubt by eleven p m the whole series of surrounding entrenchments was ours the remainder of the right covering column carried on with their attack upon bowshop's hill and the chalak dare by ten p m the northernmost point with its machine-gun was captured 
and by one o'clock in the morning the whole of bowshop's hill a maze of ridge and ravine everywhere entrenched was fairly in our hands the attack along the chaluk dare was not so cleanly carried out made indeed just about as ugly a start as any enemy could wish pressing eagerly forward through the night the little column of stormers found themselves held up by a barbed wire erection of unexampled height depth and solidity which completely closed the only practicable entrance to the ravine here that splendid body of men the otago mounted rifles lost some of their bravest and their best but in the end when things were beginning to seem desperate a passage was forced through the stubborn obstacle with most conspicuous and cool courage by captain shera and a party of new zealand engineers supported by the maoris who showed themselves worthy descendants of the warriors of the gate pa thus was the mouth of the chalak dare opened in time to admit of the unopposed entry of the right assaulting column table top simultaneously the attack on table top had been launched under cover of a heavy bombardment from h m s colne no general on peace manoeuvres would ask troops to attempt so breakneck an enterprise the angle of tabletop's ascent is recognized in our regulations as impracticable for infantry but neither turks nor angles of ascent were destined to stop russell or his new zealanders that night the scarped heights were scaled the plateau was carried by midnight with this brilliant feat the task of the right covering force was at an end its attacks had been made with a bayonet and bomb only magazines were empty by order hardly a rifle shot had been fired some one hundred and fifty prisoners were captured as well as many rifles and much equipment ammunition and stores no words can do justice to the achievement of brigadier general russell and his men there are exploits which must be seen to be realized the right assaulting column had entered the two southerly ravines sasley belt dare and chaltic dare by midnight at one thirty a m began a hotly contested fight for the trenches on the lower part of rhododendum spur whilst the chaltic dare column pressed steadily up the valley against the enemy the left covering column under brigadier general travers after marching along the beach to number three outpost resumed its northerly advance as soon as the attack on bowchop's hill had developed every trench encountered was instantly rushed by the borderers until having reached the predetermined spot the whole column was unhesitatingly launched at dama jellic bear by one thirty a m the whole of the hill was occupied thus safeguarding the left rear of the whole of the anzac attack on the far left the left assaulting column crossed the chalik dare at twelve thirty a m and entered the argal dare at the heels of the left covering column the surprise on this side was complete two turkish officers were caught in their pajamas enemy arms and ammunition were scattered in every direction the grand attack was now in full swing but the country gave new sensations in cliff climbing even to officers and men who had graduated over the goat tracks of anzac the darkness of the night the density of the scrub hands and knees progress up the spurs sheer physical fatigue exhaustion of the spirit caused by repeated hairbreadth escapes from the hail of random bullets all these combined to take the edge off the energies of our troops at last after advancing some distance up the ogle dare the column split up into two parts the fourth australian brigade struggled fighting hard as they went up to the north of the northern fork of the Agle Dare, making for Hill 305, Koja Chemen Tepe. The 29th Indian Infantry Brigade scrambled up the southern fork of the Agle Dare and the spurs north of it to the attack of a portion of the Sahri Bear Ridge known as Hill Q. Dawn broke, and the crest line was not yet in our hands, although, considering all things, the left assaulting column had made a marvelous advance the fourth australian infantry brigade was on the line of the asma dare the next ravine north of the agal dare and the twenty ninth indian infantry brigade held the ridge west of the farm below chunuk bear and and along the spurs to the northeast the enemy had been flung back from ridge to ridge an excellent line for the renewal of the attack had been secured and except for the exhaustion of the troops 
the auspices were propitious turning to the right assaulting column one battalion the canterbury infantry battalion clambered slowly up the sosley bait dare the remainder of the force led by the otago battalion wound their way amongst the pitfalls and forced their passage through the scrub of the chalik dare where a fierce opposition forced them ere long to deploy here too the hopeless country was the main hindrance and it was not until five forty five a m that the bulk of the column joined the canterbury battalion on the lower slopes of the rhododendron spur eventually they entrenched on the top of rhododendron spur a quarter of a mile short of chunuk bear i e of victory end of august seventh at nine thirty a m the two assaulting columns pressed forward whilst our guns pounded the enemy moving along the battleship hill spurs but in spite of all their efforts their increasing exhaustion as opposed to the gathering strength of the enemy's fresh troops began to tell they had shot their bolt so all day they clung to what they had captured and strove to make ready for the night all had suffered heavily and all were very tired so ended the first phase of the fighting for the chunuk bear ridge our aims had not fully been attained and the help we had hoped for from sulva had not been forthcoming yet i fully endorse the words of general birdwood when he says the troops had performed a feat which is without parallel great kudos is due to major generals godley and shaw for their arrangements to generals russell johnston cox and travers for their leading but most of all as every one of these officers will gladly admit to the rank and file for their fighting nor may i admit to add the true destroyer spirit with which h m s colm commander claude seymour r n and h m s chelmer commander q t england r n backed us up will live in the grateful memories of the army the second attack in the course of this afternoon august seventh reconnaissances of sari bear were carried out and the troops were got into shape for a fresh advance in three columns to take place in the early morning the columns were composed as follows right column brigadier general f e johnston twenty six indian mountain battery less one section auckland mounted rifles new zealand infantry brigade two battalions thirteenth division and the maori contingent center and left columns major general h v cox twenty first indian mountain battery less one section fourth australian brigade thirty ninth infantry brigade less one battalion with six battalion south lancashire regiment attached and the twenty ninth indian infantry brigade the right column was to climb up the chanuk bear ridge the left column was to make for the prolongation of the ridge northeast to koja chemin tepe the topmost peak of the range the attack was timed for four fifteen a m at the first faint glimmer of dawn observers saw figures moving against the skyline of chunuk bear were they our own man or were they the turks telescopes were anxiously adjusted the light grew stronger men were seen climbing up from our side of the ridge they were our own fellows the topmost summit was ours chunuk bear gained on the right general johnston's column headed by the wellington battalion and supported by the seventh battalion gloucester regiment the auckland mounted rifles regiment the eighth welsh pioneers and the maori contingent the whole most gallantly led by lieutenant colonel w g malone had raced one another up the steep nothing could check them on they went until with a last determined rush they fixed themselves firmly on the southwestern slopes and crest of the main knoll known as the height of chunuk bear with deep regret i have to add that the brave lieutenant colonel malone fell mortally wounded as he was marking out the line to be held in the centre the thirty ninth infantry brigade and the twenty ninth indian brigade moved along the gullies leading up to the sari bear ridge so murderous was the enemy's fire that little progress could be made though some ground was gained on the spurs to the northeast of the farm on the left the fourth australian brigade advanced from the osmak dare against the lower slopes of abdul rahman bear a spur running due north from koja chemin tepe with the intention of wheeling to its right and advancing up the spur k 
cunningly placed turkish machine guns and a strong entrenched body of infantry were ready for this move and the brigade was unable to get on at last on the approach of heavy columns of the enemy the australians virtually surrounded and having already suffered losses of over one thousand were withdrawn to their original position in the afternoon the battle slackened excepting always at lone pine where the enemy were still coming on in mass and being mown down by our fire elsewhere the troops were busy digging and getting up water and food no child's play with their wretched lines of communication running within musketry range of the enemy at four thirty a m on august ninth the chunuk bear ridge and hill q were heavily shelled at five sixteen a m this tremendous bombardment was to be switched off on to the flanks and reverse slopes of the heights the columns for the renewed attack were composed as follows the number one column brigadier general f e johnston twenty sixth indian mountain battery less one section the auckland and wellington mounted rifles regiments the new zealand infantry brigade and two battalions of the thirteenth division number two column major general h v cox twenty first indian mountain battery less one section fourth australian brigade thirty ninth brigade less the seventh gloucesters relieved with the sixth battalion south lancashire regiment attached and the indian infantry brigade number three column brigadier general a h baldwin commanding thirty eighth infantry brigade two battalions each from the thirty eighth and the twenty ninth brigades and one from the fortieth brigade general baldwin's column had assembled in the chalik dare and was moving up towards general johnston's headquarters but in spite of all precautions the darkness the rough scrubbed country its sheer steepness so delayed the column that baldwin owing to the darkness and the awful country lost his way through no fault of his own the gurkhas on top and now under that fine leader major c g l allinson the sixth gurkhas of the twenty ninth indian infantry brigade pressed up the slopes of sari bear crowned the heights of the Kal between chunuk bear and hill q viewed far beneath them the waters of the hellespont viewed the asiatic shores along which motor transport was bringing supplies to the lighters but the fortune of war was against us at this supreme moment baldwin's column was still a long way from our trenches on the crest and instead of baldwin's support came suddenly a salvo of heavy shells the turkish commander saw his chance and the south lancashires and gurkhas who had seen the promised land were forced backwards over the crest that evening from chunuk bear the line ran down to the farm and almost due north to the asma der southern watershed whence it continued westward to the sea near asmak kuyo on the right the australian division was still holding its line and lone pine was still being furiously attacked the first australian brigade was now reduced from two thousand nine hundred to one thousand and the total casualties up to eight p m on the ninth amounted to about eighty five hundred but the troops were still in extraordinarily good heart a great turkish attack during the night of the ninth tenth the new zealand and new army troops on chunuk bear were relieved for three days and three nights they had been ceaselessly fighting they were half dead with fatigue their lines of communication started from sea level ran across trackless ridges and ravines to an altitude of eight hundred feet and were exposed all the way to snipers fire and artillery bombardment it had become imperative therefore to get them enough food water and rest but for this purpose it was imperative also to withdraw them chunuk bear which they had so magnificently held was now handed over to two battalions of the thirteenth division at daybreak on tuesday august tenth the turks delivered a grand attack from the line chunuk bear hill q against these two battalions already weakened in numbers though not in spirit by previous fighting first our men were shelled by every enemy gun and then at five thirty a m were assaulted by a huge column consisting of no less than a full division plus a regiment of three battalions the north lancashire men were simply overwhelmed in their shallow trenches by sheer weight of numbers whilst the wilts who were caught out in the open were literally almost annihilated 
the ponderous mass of the enemy swept over the crest now it was our turn the warships and the new zealand and australian artillery the indian mounted artillery brigade and the sixty ninth brigade royal field artillery were getting the chance of a lifetime as the successive silent lines of turks topped the crest of the ridge gaps were torn through their formation they became exposed not only to the full blast of the guns but also to a battery of ten machine guns belonging to the new zealand infantry brigade which played upon their serried ranks at close range until the barrels were red hot enormous losses were inflicted especially by these ten machine guns and of the swarms which had once fairly crossed the crest line and only the merest handful ever straggled back to their own side of chunuk bear at the same time strong forces of the enemy were hurled against the farm where there arose a conflict so deadly that it may be considered as the climax of the four days fighting for the ridge portions of our lines were pierced and the troops driven clean down the hill at the foot of the hill the men were rallied by staff captain street who was there supervising the transport of food and water without a word unhesitatingly they followed him back to the farm where they plunged again into the midst of that series of struggles in which generals fought in the ranks and men dropped their scientific weapons and caught one another by the throat by ten a m the effort of the enemy was spent soon their shattered remnants began to trickle back and by night except prisoners or wounded no live turk was left upon our side of the slope end of the battle of sari bear by evening the total casualties of general birdwood's force had reached twelve thousand and included a very large proportion of officers the thirteenth division of the new army under major general shaw had alone lost six thousand out of a grand total of ten thousand five hundred baldwin was gone and all his staff ten commanding officers out of thirteen had disappeared from the fighting effectives the warwicks and the worcesters had lost literally every single officer but physically though birdwood's forces were prepared to hold all they had got they were now too exhausted to attack at least until they had rested and reorganized the enemy's positions were now being rapidly entrenched and as i could not depend on receiving reinforcing drafts i was faced with the danger that if i could not drive the turks back i might lose so many men that i would find myself unable to hold the very extensive new area of ground which had been gained i therefore decided to mass every available man against ismail uglu tepe a sine qua non to my plans whether as a first step toward clearing the valley or if this proved impossible toward securing suvla bay and anzac cove from shell fire the same day a force consisting of two battalions of new zealand mounted rifles two battalions of the twenty ninth irish brigade the fourth south wales borderers and twenty ninth infantry brigade the whole under the command of major general h v cox was working independently to support the main attack hill sixty first assault general cox divided his force into three sections the left section to press forward and establish a permanent hold on the existing lightly held outpost line covering the junction of the eleventh division with the anzac front the centre section to seize the well at kabak kuyu an asset of utmost value whether to ourselves or to the enemy the right section to attack and capture the turkish trenches on the northeast side of the kayajika gala the advance of the left section was a success after a brisk engagement the well at kabak kuyu was seized by the indian brigade and by four thirty the right column under brigadier general russell under heavy fire effected a lodgment on the kayajik agala where our men entrenched and began to dig communications across the kayajik dare towards the lines of the fourth australian brigade south of the dare a pretty stiff bomb fight ensued in which general russell's troops held their own through the night against superior force at six a m on the morning of august the twenty second general russell reinforced by the newly arrived eighteenth australian battalion attacked the summit of the kayajik agala the australians carried a hundred and fifty yards of the trenches losing heavily in so doing and were then forced to fall back again owing to enfilade fire though in the meantime the new zealand mounted rifles managed 
in spite of constant counter-attacks to make good another eighty yards a counter-attack in strength launched by the turks at ten a m was repulsed the new line from the kajik agala to susakuyu was gradually strengthened and eventually joined on the right of the ninth army corps thereby materially improving the whole situation during this action the fourth australian brigade which remained facing the turks on the upper part of the kajik agala was able to inflict several hundred casualties on the enemy as they retreated or endeavored to reinforce the last days of the month were illumined by a brilliant affair carried through by the troops under general birdwood's command our object was to complete the capture of hill sixty north of the kajik agala commenced by major general cox on august twenty first hill sixty overlooked the bihuk anafarta valley and was therefore tactically a very important feature second assault the conduct of the attack was again entrusted to major general cox at whose disposal was placed detachments from the fourth and fifth australian brigades the new zealand mounted rifles brigade and the fifth connock rangers the advance was timed to take place at five p m on august twenty seventh after the heaviest artillery bombardment we could afford this bombardment seemed effective but the moment the assailants broke cover they were greeted by an exceedingly hot fire from the enemy field guns rifles and machine guns followed after a brief interval by a shower of heavy shell some of which most happily pitched into the trenches of the turks on the right the detachment from the fourth and fifth australian brigades could make no headway against a battery of machine guns which confronted them in the centre the new zealanders made a most determined onslaught and carried one side of the topmost knoll hand-to-hand -hand fighting continued here till nine thirty p m when it was reported that nine-tenths of the summit had been gained on the left the two hundred and fifty men of the fifth connaught rangers excited the admiration of all beholders by the swiftness and cohesion of their charge in five minutes they had carried their objective the northern turkish communications when they at once set to and began a lively bomb fight among the trenches against strong parties which came hurrying up from the enemy supports and afterwards from their reserves at midnight fresh troops were to have strengthened our grip upon the hill but before that hour the irishmen had been out bombed and the ninth australian light horse who had made a most plucky attempt to recapture the lost communication trench had been repulsed luckily the new zealand mounted rifles refused to recognize that they were worsted nothing would shift them all that night and all next day through bombing bayonet charges musketry shrapnel and heavy shell they clung on to their a hundred and fifty yards of trench at one a m on august twenty ninth the tenth light horse made another attack on the lost communication trenches to the left carried them and finally held them this gave us complete command of the under feature an outlook over the anafarta sagir valley and safer lateral communications between anzac and souvla bay three turkish machine guns and forty six prisoners were taken as well as three trench mortars three hundred turkish rifles sixty thousand rounds of ammunition and five hundred bombs four hundred acres were added to the territories of anzac and now before affixing to this dispatch my final signature as commander-in-chief of the mediterranean expeditionary force let me first pay tribute to the everlasting memory of my dear comrades who will return no more next let me thank each and all generals staff regimental leaders and rank and file for their wonderful loyalty patience and self-sacrifice so i bid them all farewell with a special godspeed to the campaigners who have served with me right through from the terrible yet most glorious earlier days the incomparable twenty ninth division the young veterans of the naval division the ever victorious australians and new zealanders the stout east lanes and my own brave fellow countrymen of the lowland division of scotland ian hamilton general commander-in-chief mediterranean expeditionary force end of section forty section forty one anzacs by edgar wallace from the anzac book edited by c e w bean 
Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The children unborn shall acclaim the standard the Anzacs unfurled when they made Australasia's fame the wonder and pride of the world. Some of you got a VC, some the Gallipoli trot, some at a grave by the sea, but all of you got it damn hot. And I see you go limping through town in the faded old hospital blue and driving abroad, lying down, and Lord, but I wish I were you. I envy you beggars I meet, from the dirty old hats on your head to the rusty old boots on your feet. I envy you, living or dead. A knighthood is fine in its way. A peerage gives splendour and fame. But I'd rather have tacked any day that word to the end of my name. I'd count it the greatest reward that ever a man could attain. I'd sooner be Anzac than Lord. I'd rather be Anzac than Thane. Here's a bar to the medal you'll wear. There's a word that will glitter and glow, and an honour a king cannot share when you're back in the cities you know. The children unborn shall acclaim the standard the Anzacs unfurled when they made Australasia's fame the wonder and pride of the world. End of section 41 This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 To My Bath by H. H. U. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. This lyric may be bad, O oh Muse, but do not press on me too hard. In times of war, you must excuse somewhat your bard. A dugout where I have to bend my back and even lodge my knees against the roof would suit our friend Diogenes. But hardly seems a meet abode for any would-be laureate who'll sing ad lib an epic ode or hymn of hate. Consider my attempt to write iambic tetrametric lines as influenced by jellignite and bombs and mines no highfalutin stilted phrase no feeble tribute of a sub can ever adequately praise thee dearest tub perchance i'm sun-scorched then i sigh to hear the crystal waters lap and trickle o'er my toes when i turn on the tap if blizzards fresh from samothrace are mingling with december snows when icicles in clusters grace my youthful hose, a world too wide for my shrunk shanks, then I, nostalgia-stricken, dream, and see thy white enamelled banks through clouds of steam. Just as when corybantic drakes, or ducks, just as the case may be, with clamorous quack seek limpid lakes, so I seek thee. But baths are not our rations in Gallipoli, tis too far south. The bubble reputations in the cannon's mouth. H. H. U. Northamptonshire Regiment. End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43. Anzac Limericks from the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley There's a certain darn nuisance called Beachy Whose shells are exceedingly screechy But we're keeping the score and we're after your gore So look out Beachy Bill when we meet ye They've given us all respirators And we've bungles of ancient spectators but we'd give up the two for a good oyster stew or a Dixie of chipped potatoes. C.D. Mac.
End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44. How I Won the VC by Crosscut. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. How I Won the VC. The sort of thing we must expect to hear after the war is ended. Yes, that's the red ribbon I'm wearing. Just a small strip of scarlet, you see. But there's no one can tell how I prize it, nor the glow it occasions to me. For it speaks of the broad fields of honour, which we wrung from the red jaws of hell. And my eyes grow be dim for the cobbers, who battled and conquered and fell. Yes, that's the VC, how I won it. It isn't for me to relate. We heroes are always so modest and boasting's a thing that i hate well seeing you write for the papers i'll make an exception for you don't mention my name if you write it though every particular is true it was during a fight for an outpost it was called the green knoll i believe and the turks on the top dealt out slaughter they'd a week of defeat to retrieve it was five thousand feet to the summit and almost as steep as a wall and they met every charge as we rushed it with bayonet shrapnel and ball twas defended by nine tiers of trenches that's strong for an outpost you'll guess with twelve forty-two centimetres which kicked up the juice of a mess we'd been fighting five days without resting when the eighth line of trenches we took for every man there was a hero from me to the company cook and there was the knoll just before us some two hundred paces or more with barbed wire and bayonets bristling and the parapet sloppy with gore and the howitzers roared like perdition and vomited fire and death till we saw it was madness to charge them and halted a moment for breath ah stranger imagine the picture and then stand with horror aghast we had fought for a month without sleeping and we stood facing failure at last we had squandered the best of our army we had stuck to our ultimate gasp and there in the moment of triumph the prize was to slip from our grasp then suddenly out sprang the major his face lighted over with bliss pass the word there for lance private wilson he'll find us a way out of this if there's one thing i hate it is skitting when i hear it i always feel sore so you won't think i boast when i tell you he ought to have done it before and a great cheer arose as i faced him and nodded i never salute and said to him i'll see you through sir and win you some glory to boot the chaps of the sixteenth battalion are not easy snoozers to beat i've a notion i says that will lick them half a dollar i line them a treat i don't want no red tapey orders and i don't want no kudos nor pelf you get back to your own little dugouts and i'll tackle the knoll by myself i'll lay down my life for my country for old england the land of the free and you will find that the bloke called horatius was only a trifle to me then i shook hands with all the battalion there was only thirteen of us left and they cheered me again till the foemen must have thought us of senses bereft and i gathered my arms and my rations and i girded myself for the fray if i'd lived to be ninety or over i will always remember that day i had five hundred rounds for my rifle of hand bombs i took forty-one a machine-gun was slung on my shoulders and i carried a periscope gun as for rations well all i took with me was a tin of fray bentos or two and in my breast pocket i planted a nice army biscuit to chew then i waved farewell to my cobbers i was too much affected to speak there are times when the bravest of soldiers have feelings that render them weak one tear then i turned to the trenches and charged like a lion at bay as i caught the last words of our colonel crying bonzer gorstaffen hooray you talk of charmed lives i'd a thousand 
as i rushed up that hill like a goat i got thirty-two shots through my trousers and nine shrapnel balls through my coat and a japanese bomb burst beneath me for a moment i gave up all hope but it proved the best thing that could happen for it pushed me half way up the slope then a fifteen-inch shell came straight at me i hadn't a moment to shirk but it struck on that hard army biscuit and rebounded and blew up a turk you doubt it well if you want proof sir the truth of this tale to endorse here's the biscuit that dent in the middle is where the shell struck it of course ah yes twas a terrible moment i was then slightly wounded tis true just a bayonet stab in the gizzard and a crack from a bullet or two but i gathered new strength for the conflict and just as the darkness came down i was under their parapets resting and i knew i had beaten them brown for this was the scheme i had worked on twas a little bit mean you might say but i knew that the turks were half famished and fought on one biscuit a day and the tins of fray bentos i carried i chucked in the trench there and then and i heard the poor beggars pounce on it and i knew they were caught in the snare the morning broke smiling and peaceful ah shame that we soldiers must fight twas a piteous scene met my vision with the first rosy quivers of light when i peeped in the trench not a turk sir was left of that legion accursed for they whacked the fray bentos among them and each man had perished from thirst that's the yarn if you know the sixteenth sir you'll know how our colonel can smile he said to me corporal wilson you've dished up the beggars in style promotion some say i deserve it but that's really nothing to me i don't want no honour or glory but that's how i won the v c crosscut sixteenth battalion a i f end of section forty four Section number 45 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Icy by E. A. M. W. From the Anzac Book edited by c e w bean nobody seemed to know much about him except that he was generally considered by all those who knew him in the squadron to be a cold foot and his nickname was appropriately icy not that the others had any particular cause to call him that but whenever Beachy Bill came screeching overhead, he would involuntarily duck and then smile in that peculiar manner of his as much to say, I can't help it. Beachy wasn't his worst enemy, though, for if there was anything that he dreaded, it was those Turkish 75s. Footnote. The Turks had a battery of French 75s at Anzac seized as the guns were coming from france during the blockade of servia in the balkan war and footnote it used to make us feel as if we could shake him when we saw how he would double himself up and yet one never liked to attempt anything of the kind whenever he used that smile moreover as he was over six feet in height and correspondingly strong it would not have been poetic his was a baffling smile recalling the peculiar smile of the mona lisa and like it unfathomable he was a very quiet kind of chap and when it was his turn to do fatigues he would go and perform whatever was required of him without ever grumbling his mates used to take a mean advantage of his good nature and would shunt all the work such as sweeping out the posse or trenches on to him 
about the time of which i am writing we had noticed that abdul was samping somewhere down the gully sometimes we could distinguish dark shapes moving about and no amount of sniping on our part would stop them they worked only during the night and each morning we found that the pile of new earth down the gully had grown higher at last we understood his plan and it came to our turn to make a counter move one evening i was told off among others to go out and dig a new trench in front of a duel's new sap we had to block him from getting to a certain place on the little ridge which hitherto had been in no man's land i noticed that icy had also been told off but he was to be one of the covering party all that night we worked hard digging ourselves in and filling sandbags which we threw up in front of us at first we were undisturbed but suddenly the bullets began to ping ping over our heads and we knew that abdul had tumbled still he was himself intent on digging he did not come out at us but contented himself by sniping thinking to drive us off in that way however it was a bit late in the day for that since by the time he found us out we had already several good sandbags filled and these protected us as long as we kept well down several of our chaps were winged but as none of the wounds were very serious we didn't mind that when it had struck five in the morning we knocked off and retired to sleep away the day half a dozen bomb throwers who had volunteered for the job then took our places bringing with them a few bombs their rifles ammunition water bottles and a supply of bully beef and biscuits there they spent the whole day lying low under cover of the sandbags but abdul troubled them not next night we went out again to resume work and then it was that certain things happened which made us look upon icy in a different light we had no sooner started work than ra ta 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 went a machine gun somewhere out to the left and the bullets came pinging round hot and close winging three and killing two on the first discharge john turk had stolen a march on us by placing a machine gun away out on his extreme flank where he could to a certain extent enfilade us that sort of thing could not be allowed to last as we had to bury our noses in the ground each time the confounded gun opened up our covering party being out ahead of us escaped the hail of bullets better than we did the place was now become too hot to stay in so the order came along to retire independently to our trenches until something could be done to stop the machine gun when we mustered again in the trenches we found that one man of the covering party was missing the man was icy as we were talking about him wondering who should go back to look for him there came the noise of a commotion from the direction of the turkish machine gun bang bang went a couple of bombs followed by cries and shouts from abdul and above it all were certain we heard fragments of language of the category known in australia as bullococky footnote bullococky stands both for the bullock driver and for his chief gift End footnote. what could it mean by this time the alarm had spread along the whole of abdul's front trenches which belched forth liquid fire in our own trenches everyone had mechanically sprung to arms and we stood there wondering while 
For fifty minutes the Turks fired without ceasing. Gradually the noise subsided, and we noticed for some reason the machine gun away on the left was strangely quiet. An hour later we were stealing out again to have another attempt at completing our trenches when I stumbled over the form of a man lying prone. Bending over to see him, I found it was icy. His clothes were wet and sticky with blood, and half underneath his body there showed the muzzle of a machine gun. As we lifted him up, we saw that the gun was there complete, tripod and all. We took him into the lines and handed him over to the dressing station. And just before we came away, he opened his eyes and told enough for us to realize that Icy had sneaked over and stolen the Turkish gun. To this day, we don't quite know how he did it, as he never will talk about it. But before they took him on to the hospital ship the next day, with his 16 bullet wounds and scratches all told, there went down to see him a crowd in which I was amongst the foremost, which apologized to Icy very humbly. And, do you know, he only smiled back at us in that funny old way of his. E. A. M. W. End of section 45. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 46. The Trojan War, 1915, by J. Wareham. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Dan Gordon. The Trojan War, 1915. We care not what old Homer tells of Trojan War and Helen's fame. Upon the ancient Dardanelles, new peoples write in blood their name. Those Grecian heroes long have fled. No more the plain of Troy they haunt. Made sacred by our southern dead, historic is the Hellespont. Homeric wars are fought again by men who, like old Greeks, can die. Australian backblock heroes slain with Hector and Achilles lie. No legend lured these men to Rome. They journeyed forth to save from harm some mother Helen sat at home, some obscure Helen on a farm. And when one falls upon the hill, then by dark Styx's gloomy strand, in honor to plain private Bill, great Agamemnon lifts his hand. J. Wareham, First Australian Field Ambulance. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Lawley. The Price Dead figures writhe and beckon in my dream. Wild eyes look into mine, while I, bewildered, watch the bloody stream with misty eyes ashine. It rends my heart. And I am nothing loath to have the murder cease. Horror it is, and carnage, yet are both part of the price of peace. Corporal Comus, 2nd Battalion, Australian Imperial Force. End of section 47. This recording is in the public domain. Section 48 Killed in Action by Harry McCann From the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Where the ranges throw their shadows Long before the day's surrender Down a valley where a river Used to tumble to the sea On a rising patch of level Rest the men who dared to tender 
life and all its sweetness for their love or liberty in a thousand miles of ugly scrubby waste and desolation just this little space of level showing open to the sea nothing there to lend it grandeur sure it needs no decoration save those rows of wooden crosses keeping silent custody there's a band of quiet workers artless lads who joked and chatted just this morning now they're sullen and they keep their eyes away from the blanket hidden body coat and shirt all blood bespattered lying motionless and waiting by the new turned heap of clay there are records in the office date of death and facts pertaining showing name and rank and number and disposal of the kit more or less a business matter and we have no time for feigning more than a momentary pity for the men who have been hit there's a patient mother gazing on her hope so surely shattered hopes and prayers she cherished bravely seeking strength to hide her fear boyhood's dreams and idle memories things that never really mattered lying buried where he's buried neath the stars all shining clear there's a young wife sorrow-stricken in her bitter first conception of that brief conclusive message harsh fulfilment of her dread there are tiny lips repeating with their childish imperception simple words that bring her memories from the boundaries of the dead could the turk have seen this picture when his tringer figure rounded would his sights have blurred a little had he heard the mother's prayer could he know some things that she knew might his hate have been confounded but he only saw his duty and he did it fighting fair just a barren little surface where the grave mounds rise ungainly monuments and tributes to the men who've done their share pain and death the fruits of battle and the crosses tell it plainly short and quick and silent suffering would to god it ended there harry mccann headquarters fourth australian light horse end of section forty eight this recording is in the public domain Section 49 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A Gray Day in Gallipoli by N. Nash from the anzac book edited by c e w bean as i look westward towards the gray aegean sea generally peaceful deep blue and oft times appearing golden hued by the mystic hand of sunset but now flecked with ripples of white like a distant hillside strewn with new shorn lambs and hurried on by the murmurings of the gray sea's bride the gray cloud-bearing mother wind as she splashes the foreshore of this gray land with fleecy fringes of her mate and makes her way over the gray hills through rugged landslip or tangled stunted unfriendly evergreens gray phantoms flit to and fro passing with a careless nod as it were the little gray homes of those whose thoughts so seldom had time to feast on aught but the bright days before the peril came but who now with a foretaste of hell in their souls need only such a day as this to make them feel the presence of the gray world's messenger whose name is loneliness loneliness garbled in a mantle of merging gray sea and gray sky trimmed with the spires and turrets of gray and seemingly unsold ships whose presence in the blue and gold days was as that of old friends well met but which now seems to be ragged rents 
in the solemn dress of loneliness reminding one of a derelict's slovenly covering held together over a hopeless breast by an old gold brooch perhaps the gift of a mother or handed down from bygone ages loneliness comes not to all of us garbled in this fashion to others who look eastward she comes dressed in the somber clothes of the gray hillside and with yearning eyes beckons them on to the chances of the blue and gold life in constantinople or perchance if their luck is that of many another good soldier to that other gray life forever with the gray seas gray skies and gray forgetfulness on these ghostly forsaken shores of gallipoli n ash eleventh a a sc end of section 49 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section 50 my anzac home from the anzac book edited by c e w bean read for librivox.org by alan mapstone come and see my little dugout way up on the hill it stands where i can get a lovely view of anzac's golden sands when beachy bill is shelling i can see just where he lands from my cosy little dugout on the hill it isn't quite as roomy as the mansions of the czar from sitting-room to bedroom is not so very far for the dining and the smoking room you stay just where you are in my cosy little dugout on the hill the fleas they wander nightly as soon as i've undressed and after many weary hunts i've had to give them best as the ants have also found it there is very little rest in my cosy little dugout on the hill i've a natty little cupboard and it looks so very nice twas made to keep my bread and jam my bacon and my rice but now it's nothing other than a home for orphan mice in my cosy little dugout on the hill there's no electric lighting in this blighted land of war so i use some fat in syrup tins and stand it on the floor and when it's working overtime i sweat from every pore in my cosy little dugout on the hill when the nights are clear and starry then the scene is beautified by the silvery gleams and shadows that across the mountain glide but if it's wet and stormy well i go and sleep outside of my cosy little dugout on the hill when the time comes round for parting from my little eight by four and i can get a good night's rest without a back that's sore well perhaps some day i'll miss you and will long to live once more in my cosy little dugout on the hill corporal george l smith twenty fourth sanitary section r a m c t end of section fifty this recording is in the public domain Section 51 from the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Lawley. What Frank Thought A private sat under a tree. It was not the lone pine, but the other one. Winter had stripped it of its foliage, and all around was bleak and uninviting. In his bronze fist, which he had carried buckets and biscuits since April 25th, he held a letter, highly perfumed, from his young lady, she whom he had escorted on so many occasions to Sydney's social events in the piping days of peace. He had not heard from home since embarkation, and had often wondered, as he bathed in just enough water to temper a whisky, and shaved 
by means of a lethal instrument, better fitted for cutting a hedge than a beard, whether they really cared. A fit of hesitancy now seized him, and he hardly liked to read the letter. By means of the top of a tin of sardines which he had bought cheap, two bob he had paid for it on the beach. He saw his unshaven face, the neck of his sword shirt, and his crop of unkempt hair. He was interrupted in this by the attentions a little friend was paying him. This he located. He then lightened the end of a cigarette, which he had kept stowed away in the top of his putties, before risking another glance at himself in the top of the two bob tin of sardines. What a guy, he murmured. If Jessie could see me now, would she turn me down for some cold-footed, well-groomed fellow? I don't think. She's all right, and would understand it's no gypsy tea we're at. However, it was with some slight nervousness that he opened the letter. Following the customary greetings, Jessie wrote, Deary, be sure to keep your hat on at all times. Egypt, I hear, is awfully hot about Christmas time. The doctor was telling me the other day that he could hardly sit on the veranda of Shepherds in the middle of the day. Keep your hat on, even when at Shepherds. The climate is so treacherous. Doc says he recommends this hotel. Shall we send letters to you there? Iced drinks and heavy meals are dangerous, Doc says. This was more than flesh and blood could stand. Am I having my leg pulled? he asked. He looked at the envelope and found it had been posted in Sydney thirteen months ago. He swore roundly at the expense of the postal people, as all the rest of the letter was hopelessly out of date. He turned his attention to the next item of his very belated mail. It was another letter from Jessie. She again rambled on about Egypt, its climate horrors, and the dangers of Cairo's attractions. He bit his lip and smiled sourly when he came across a passage which related to the dancing deeds of a male acquaintance of his. Frank, as you know, has not enlisted yet, she wrote. He is not sure of a commission, because chaps are called upon to pass a beastly exam. He says it's rot to ask him to sit for an examination, and he would just hate to serve in the ranks. In his case, it would be super patriotic, he says, to do so. I don't understand what he means by this, but no doubt you will. Huey knew that the man referred to was big enough to push all the Turks off the peninsula, and Jessie provided a job's comforter when, later on, she told him that Frank only attended dances given for patriotic purposes. The next item was a parcel containing hair oil, 25 costly cigars, a cigar holder, a suit of pyjamas, and a booklet given away by a firm of tobacconists, explaining to would-be recruits that Henry Clay's would be forwarded to any part of the Australasian front free of carriage. The parcel was addressed to Gallipoli. Darling, wrote Jessie, in the letter that accompanied the parcel, Keep these things in your tent. Footnote. It may be necessary to explain that every man in the Gallipoli Peninsula was within easy range of the Turkish artillery, for anything except a hospital to use a tent would have been to give an open invitation to shrapnel. The nearest shops were about three miles behind the Turkish lines. End of footnote. It must be a fag getting the oil you like so much. I suppose you have to walk some distance from the firing line to the nearest shops. No doubt the cigars will be acceptable after dinner. And, later on, the pyjamas. Don't think me forward in sending the latter, but I know fellows do wear them. I've seen them advertised in the Herald. I am sending these things for use in Turkey. 
I have read all about the charge you chaps made on the 25th of April, and I hope you were allowed to get well up in the front. It would just suit you. I know it is dangerous, but Frank says if it is dangerous for the men, how much more dangerous must it be for the officers? He says he will insist upon leading his men in all charges. Between you and me though, Huey, I don't think he will enlist. He has several lovely pairs of socks to hand by today's delivery from David Jones, and if they are not for the yachting that is to start next week, then I'm slow. Frank and I are going to Randwick races on Saturday, and if we see anything in your battalion colours, we will back it and buy something for you with what we collect. Frank says he is sure you would like us to do this. Please don't get shot, dear. We intend to send you lots of nice things for Christmas. Huey, a gay dog in the good old antebellum days, who occupied a cosy job and circulated his sovereigns, tramped back to his dugout through the saps, revolving wicked thoughts about Frank. Always a philosopher, he cleaned his rifle with the hair oil, cut up the pyjamas to make pull-throughs, and to newly arrived reinforcements, distributed the cigars. He and the old hands had lost any appetite they ever had for such comforts. A.J. Boyd, Australian, New Zealand, Army Corps. End of section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Section 52, Arcadia, by H.E. Shell, from the Anzac Book, edited by C.E.W. Bean, read for LibriVox.org, by Alan Mapstone. I've stayed in many a boarding house, from good to fair to rotten, seeking the comfort of a home, with all its cares forgotten. In pubs I've dwelt, and drowned the cares which canker life by meeting, with open hand each casual friend, and moisten well each greeting. I've dwelt in many a town in Shire, from Cairns to Wangaratta. I've dropped in to the Brisbane show, and Bundaberg regatta. But now I've struck an ideal spot, where pleasure never cloys. Just list to the advantages, this choice retreat enjoys the rent is free no board to pay no land or income taxes and on my tail no middleman nor fat man fatter waxes if i should say i need some clothes someone will just take action no tailor's bills can worry me and drive me to distraction and should my health appear to fail and appetite grow fine my doctor hands me not a bill but just a number nine the scenery is glorious the sunsets are cyclonic the atmosphere is so full of iron it acts as quite a tonic and even parsons preach the word and take up a collection while politicians don't exist nor e'en a by-election no scandal ever hovers here to sear our simple lives and married men are always true to absent loving wives and the crowning gift of all is no one's happiness is marred finding answers to the questions on that damn war census card and should you doubt if there can be a spot which so excels let me whisper it is anzac anzac by the dardanelles Bombardier H. E. Shell, 7th Battery, Australian F.A. End of section 52. This recording is in the public domain. Section 53. The Caveman by J. M. Collins from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Fernando Borrego. 
I was dreaming in the trenches when thoughts and visions dim took shape. There squatted close to me, with mien and visage grim, a dark and hairy caveman, huge of form and bare of limb. And he eyed me very strangely, and I thought I said to him, O oh, prehistoric caveman, did you own some rock-bound lair? Where, secure from interruption, you consumed your scanty fare? Did you sally forth for hunting, or to seek some maiden fair? Did you club her on the cranium, and drag her by the hair? She'd be mostly good when captured. Cooked your grub and had her share. You were happy, Mr. Caveman, though your brawny limbs were bare. You were cold and hungry sometimes, but upon this point I'll swear. You were better off than we are. You'd no uniform to tear. Poor benighted Mr. Caveman, if you'd only, only known of our glorious progression, all your arrowheads of bone would have been replaced by rifles, and for little slings of stone you'd have had a 4.7 gun. What joys you might have known. Things have changed, poor Mr. Caveman, since you went your simple way. But we're living still in caves, sir, dug most carefully in clay. We call them trenches, dugouts, saps, but call them what we may. They are made to hide our skins in, just as in your heathen day. Two thousand years ago came one, taught peace on earth, good will. Unceasingly we've preached it since, and that thou shalt not kill. And all these toilsome, changeful years we've retrograded till we are with you, Mr. Caveman, for we are simple cavemen still. I thought I was quite eloquent. My brain began to burn. When a hand stretched out and shook me, t'was a hand I could not spurn. I yawned and tried to dodge that grasp, but I awoke to learn. T'was the NCO on duty saying, Come, my lad, your turn. J.M. Collins, 9th Battalion. End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Section 54. An Anzac Alphabet by J. W. S. Henderson. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org. By April 6090, California, United States of America. A is the aeroplane buzzing above, sending us tokens of friendship and love. B's beachy bill such a marvel of cunning a message from whom sends the best of us running c is the chilliness felt in the feet when bullets commence to invade our retreat d is the dugout we've spent so much time at working in hopes of defeating the climat e is for eyewash a wonderful lotion employed by the man who is keen on promotion f is the fool who got caught in a trap by pulling the tail of a mule in a sap. G is the general devising a straff and cursing his highly incompetent staff. H is the wretched, unfortunate hill, bombarded and mined, but impregnable still. I's the intelligence, officer who is said to exist at GHQ. Forgive a digression and spare me the time to think of a word that will make a good rhyme. And if the delay is a little provoking, remember it's J, and the word may be joking. K is the Kaiser at home, in Berlin, chanting his quaint, maledictory hymn. L is the liar, who loves to relate. Akibaba has fallen, and gives you the date. M is the major, observing from latitudes, tending to strained and discomforting attitudes. N is the Navy, bombarding a lair, ignoring the fact that there's nobody there. O is the optimist, struck by a splinter, happy to think he'll be home by the winter. 
P is the spotlessly uniformed paragon, living in splendor on HMS Aragon. Q is the questions we ask with a wail. Do skippers like whiskey? And where is our mail? R's the report of the latest success, strictly compiled for the use of the press. S is the sniper. It's also his sickness. On finding his cover is lacking in thickness. T's the telephonist cutting off stations in the midst of important conversations. U is the uniform made for the wenches, slightly deranged by a day in the trenches. V is the victory talked of by editors who wish to get rid of importunate creditors. W stands for the various wiles the Germans employ to keep Turkey in smiles. But X is the Xmas that some day will come when Turkey and sauce will be served with our rum. Why is the youth who was scornful of danger till caught in the rear by a violent stranger? Z is the zenith of power and glory, a fitting conclusion to this little story. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Section 55. The Kaiser to His Secretary. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Adam Bielka. Peace upon earth, and unto men good will. Such words rang true of yore, excuse my laughing. <laughs> Ironical they'll ring, while Huns are still a strafing. My fatherland, I know, has set its back against such old-world heresy and schism, and deem such tidings but a mere anachronism. Not till our eagles twain replace the Union Jack from Dover Harbor unto Calais, proving thereby the truth of Deutschland über alles. Not till all men shall hearken my decree, not till all worlds shall tremble at my nod, shall peace on earth be countenanced by me or god but since the time is fitting down you sit and write forgive the french un petit belay doux with the season's compliments to little willie tell him how once his courage i admired how recently to my surprise i've heard an i trust unfounded rumor that he's tired of verdun bid him select a new cathedral spire bombard it seize it never mind the losses tell him its peal of bells will make more iron crosses to hindenburg say he must do his best and if he can't advance then he must dig a new line according to our plans due west of riga to her who knows how bulgar's palms are greased send greetings suited to a royal queen o oh, and bid her give her brother's love at least to tino to enver right since some of you seem lost and some of you don't seem to know quite where you are i swear that well at never mind the cost bulgaria that is my part you must now stop the gab why anybody can do that much damn it of those who tried to shake the faith of abdul habid then when i'm satisfied that general birdwood and his ansecs at the dardanelles are busy studying the latest word in hells and my supplies are safe then right away a hide to egypt not by ocean liner but by a rather safer route through asia minor these plans of mine at which some seem surprised are not as fools think calculated solely on the out-of-date campaigns of undersized napoleon for when i've got the british blighters beat here comes my cunning what i mean to do is to exercise on water smooth my fleet near suez then finally for double eagle's head in order to perpetuate my culture by royal decree i'll substitute instead a vulture end of section fifty five this recording is in the public domain
Section 56 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fernando Borrego. The Anzac Thunderstorm from the Trenches by I.A. Saxon from the Anzac Book edited by C.E.W. Bean. Do not we know that fall of night over Anzac? Boom, 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 boom. All the afternoon, the warships on our right had been engaged in the playful work of tearing pieces from the hillsides of Achibaba. Eight miles to the south of us, ruining the trenches of our friend the enemy, blowing up a supply base, a mule train, dropping shells on the forts, or indulging in some of the many small acts of friendliness to which Jack Tar is prone. As the evening wore on, we could see the flash from both shell and gun. About the time we finished our frugal evening meal, lightning began to play in intermittent flashes, like a heavenly searchlight from far across the hidden narrows of Asia Minor and put to shame the puny bursts of light from the handiwork of man. The boats were still at it, but their dull booming was now intermixed with the rumble of distant thunder. The lightning becomes more vivid. There is a rattling, crashing roar from the artillery of the skies that can never be equaled by any earthly batteries. Surely, the Creator is in angry mood tonight as comes a deafening peal followed by vivid flashes of forked lightning in fantastic shapes. One seems a long arm with hooked fingers, as though the Most High would grasp one or more of the contending armies and hurl them into the seas. The lightning plays around the steel points of the bayonets of the motionless sentries, standing ever ready under the parapets and keeping a ceaseless watch the night through on the enemy trenches. Trench and traverse, hill and valley, are revealed by a brighter light than that of day, the rude wooden crosses marking the places where, alas, too many of Australasia's best have fallen, are brought out in bold relief against the dark background of holly scrub, and the narrow strips of winding roadway on the long hillsides from the beach, the work of months, up which perspiring fatigue parties toil with rations water, ammunition, and other necessary stores that they long are laid out as a relief map by heaven's electricity. A rattling, crashing roar, such as I have never heard in any Australian thunderstorm, is followed by a deafening clap, and a huge ball of fire falls earthward at terrific speed in the direction of Constantinople, followed by a sound as of a shattering explosion, which causes the very hillside to quake, traverse and parapet to tremble, and the roofs of dugouts to send down a shower of stones. The ships have long given up the unequal struggle to make their voices heard against those of the elements. And as the storm passed over, and the rumblings of the thunder become more and more distant, and the lightning less vivid, the veil is drawn from the face of the moon, and the white lady sails out into her own once more. The storm has had its effect on those manning the trenches. The bubbling rattle of the machine gun, the sharp crack of Turkish rifles, and the heavier report of our own arms, which usually punctuate the night, are noticeable by their absence. The turmoil of an hour ago has turned to unbelievable quiet. I. A. Saxon, 21st Australian Battalion. End of Session 56section 56 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fernando Borrego. The Anzac Thunderstorm from the Trenches by I. A. Saxon from the Anzac Book edited by C. E. W. Bean. 
Do not we know that fall of night over Anzac? Boom, 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 boom. All the afternoon, the warships on our right had been engaged in the playful work of tearing pieces from the hillsides of Achibaba, eight miles to the south of us, ruining the trenches of our friend the enemy, blowing up a supply base, a mule train, dropping shells on the forts, or indulging in some of the many small acts of friendliness to which Jack Tar is prone. As the evening wore on, we could see the flash from both shell and gun. About the time we finished our frugal evening meal, lightning began to play in intermittent flashes, like a heavenly searchlight from far across the hidden narrows of Asia Minor, and put to shame the puny bursts of light from the handiwork of man. The boats were still at it, but their dull booming was now intermixed with the rumble of distant thunder. The lightning becomes more vivid. There is a rattling, crashing roar from the artillery of the skies that can never be equaled by any earthly batteries. Surely, the Creator is in angry mood tonight, as comes a deafening peal followed by vivid flashes of forked lightning in fantastic shapes. One seems a long arm with hooked fingers, as though the Most High would grasp one or more of the contending armies and hurl them into the seas. The lightning plays around the steel points of the bayonets of the motionless sentries, standing ever ready under the parapets and keeping a ceaseless watch the night through on the enemy trenches. Trench and traverse, hill and valley, are revealed by a brighter light than that of day, the rude wooden crosses marking the places where, alas, too many of Australasia's best have fallen, are brought out in bold relief against the dark background of holly scrub and the narrow strips of winding roadway on the long hillsides from the beach, the work of months, up which perspiring fatigue parties toil with rations, water, ammunition, and other necessary stores that they long are laid out as a relief map by heaven's electricity. A rattling, crashing roar, such as I have never heard in any Australian thunderstorm, is followed by a deafening clap, and a huge ball of fire falls earthward at terrific speed in the direction of Constantinople, followed by a sound as of a shattering explosion, which causes the very hillside to quake, traverse and parapet to tremble, and the roofs of dugouts to send down a shower of stones. The ships have long given up the unequal struggle to make their voices heard against those of the elements. And as the storm passed over and the rumblings of the thunder become more and more distant and the lightning less vivid, the veil is drawn from the face of the moon and the white lady sails out into her own once more. The storm has had its effect on those manning the trenches. The bubbling rattle of the machine gun, the sharp crack of Turkish rifles, and the heavier report of our own arms, which usually punctuate the night, are noticeable by their absence. The turmoil of an hour ago has turned to unbelievable quiet. I.A. Saxon, 21st Australian Battalion End of section 56section 58 our sailors the amphibious man by lieutenant a l pemberton from the anzac book edited by c e w bean read for LibriVox.org by ellie rose on july 2nd 2020 our special correspondent having been permitted the exceptional privilege of obtaining some insight into the work of the navy we are enabled to publish the following invaluable article but was that really he that stylish pair of khaki-colored overall trousers surmounted by a serviceable-looking British warm patrol tunic of the same excellent material? At first glance, it was hard to distinguish him from the dapper-looking foot-gunner, with whom he was engaged in lively conversation. Their words were inaudible to us onlookers, but from what one could gather, the foot-gunner was making some interesting comments on the system of naval penances. 
And was this all of the representative of the greatest naval power that ever placed foot upon the land? But, as the observer drew nearer, the flash of illumination came. For there, poised elegantly on the bows of the natty blue trench sou'wester, was the emblem of Britain's naval supremacy, the silver anchor in a golden hoop. "'Shiver my corrugated iron,' he was saying, using a phrase I remembered having heard so often as a young sub-midshipman, or spotty, as they are affectionately known by their seniors, on the old Bellicasus. When noting the presence of company, he turned with a polite smile to the intruders and waved his apologies. It was then that one noted the true stamp of the man. He was a sailor, every inch of him, from the drop of salt spray that dangled lazily from the tip of his nose to the purple-tinted seaweed that clung affectionately to the soles of his boots, and his speech was laden with that peculiar crispness and alertness which we associate with sailors. They imbibe it from the salt atmosphere of the gun-room and the ward-room. But what struck one most about him was his youthful appearance. What's what would probably give his age as twenty-nine, though he did not look a day more than twenty-eight and a half, and yet from the three bands on his cuff it was obvious to one of the writer's experience in naval matters that he must be a subaltern commander. Is it much like you thought it would be, after all your training? I asked. Yes, pretty much, was the reply, with an oddly reminiscent smile. Iron is heavier than water, and a pendant afloat is worth six aground. Here, I realized, was a man of perception, one who was fitted to guide the destinies of a great nation. And the landing of all these vast quantities of stores, I urged, is not that a great task? We do not land them, he said impressively and decisively, with the air of one closing an argument. We unship them. I nodded understandingly. So that, then, was the key to the great mystery. Lieutenant A. L. Pemberton, H.Q. Staff, 24th Siege. B D E R G A. End of section fifty eight. This recording is in the public domain. Section fifty nine. Posses by Ben Telbo. From the Ansett Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B. C. Posse, exclaimed the inquiring general, what is a posse? That, sir, said the CO, is Australian for recess, either firing or sleeping. It's a contradiction of position. Now, that's where you're wrong, said the chief staff officer, in a tone which admitted no argument. Posse! Paw double C. Posse, a small force. Your firing recess is manned by a small force. What? And the CO was overcome by very great emotion. Ben Talbo. End of section 59. This recording is in the public domain. Section 60. Mr. Aeroplane by H. G. Garland from The Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone, with compliments to the RNAS in the Dardanelles. Hurrah for Mr. Aeroplane, a sailing in the blue! I'm glad to see you up again. Me compliments to you. I'm Tommy Brown, Australian, who's fighting here on land. And strike me, Mr. Flying Man, I'd like to shake your hand. Sometimes I feel I'd like to streak beside you in the sky. And then my nerves go all a-shake to think you're up so high. By Jingo, how your blooming grit must make old Jacko dance. And don't be fussed to make a hit when given half a chance. But on you go inquiring as if the job were fun, and Jacko was a firing, a nipper's toy pop gun. You give the battleships a wink, they get their guns to bear, and then, oh, strike me blue and pink, 
then don't the turkeys swear ah well beyond the hills you go we wish you best of luck remember all the boys below enjoy your blooming pluck h g garland sixteenth australian battalion end of section sixty this recording is in the public domain Section number 61 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Bielka. Anzac in Egypt, Mahamud, and Australia by C. Mohammed was Mohammed. He was also a guide. The combination meant that he knew everything, and what he didn't know he made up, and what he made up he told so often that at last he believed it. We were on the usual Nile excursion, made by nearly the whole Australasian force at one time or another to Memphis and Saqqara. A boat had been arranged, and Mohammed tried to entertain us on the boat. He did. Knowing our absence from home and wives, he gave us a full account of his three wives, also some obscure but not uninteresting details of their feelings towards each other. Each was a pearl, and he didn't know which was the pearliest. The idyllic piece of Mrs. Muhammad in triplicate was enough to make one a follower of the Prophet. His next dissertation was on the Koran, but theology doesn't appeal much to soldiers. Padres have reduced their services to a maximum of 20 minutes. Before long, our astute guide recognized a necessity of a change of subject. He gave us riddles, the riddle of the Sphinx, how one could divide equally between two men a 10-gallon flask of water with only three and seven-gallon flasks to do it with. The best of us took nine moves to do it in, Muhammad did it in five, and looked humble. Then he gave us another. Four men and their wives are on one side of the Nile, and have to pass over to the other. But their jealousy will not allow any man to be alone with a lady not his wife. Muhammad threw this problem at us with an air of triumph. There was the boat, there were the four men, there were the four wives, there was the Nile. The Nile was certainly there, and our puffing, stodgy steamer had gone two or three miles before we gave it up. We did give it up. Muhammad manipulated the ladies and their spouses with ease, landed each on the other side, all conventions being strictly observed. Then the pyramids came into view. We were rather tired of the pyramids. But the guide wasn't. What would a guide be without the pyramids, or the pyramids without guides? So we heard again all their history. Each new Muhammad throws in a thousand years, or two more or less. But what is a thousand years in Egypt? We were tiring of the pyramids. Muhammad started on the other bank. Napoleon, Napoleon's towers, Napoleon's granaries, Napoleon's fortifications. Now there is a limit to all things. We could stand Moses Island, we could listen to the accounts of pharaohs, pyramids, thinkses, and Mrs. Thinkses, but Napoleon? Napoleon hadn't even known Australia. However, Muhammad was wound up. He was inspired. He was even intrepid. What if the infidel dogs did cut down his bakshish? They should have the whole story. So the British and the Australasians in Egypt went to the wall. Napoleon reigned. He got it all. It was then that our youngest subaltern put in an easy underarm, and Mohammed hid it. Yes, we know all that about Napoleon, said the subaltern. But what about Sir George Reed? We waited breathless. Was it a boundary hit, or a catch at point? Oh, said Mohammed, I know all about St. George Reed. He was a great man. There is his mound over there. Ah, we exclaimed, and then, with happy inspiration, someone asked, Is he dead? Oh, yes, 
dead a hundred years, St. George Reed, a very good and great man, he has a fine tomb. If a sick man goes there, he gets cured quickly. We tipped Muhammad generously. End of section 61「Section 62 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anzac in Egypt. Anzac in Alex. By L. J. Ivory. From the Anzac Book. Edited by C. E. W. Bean. I hardly think old Benchy's little wine shop in Alexandria will be known to many of the Anzac, or to many Alexandrians for that matter. But in case any of you find yourselves ever in Alexandria again, this is how you will discover it. Standing at the head of the Rue Sheriff Pacha, everyone in Alexandria knows the Rue Sheriff Pacha who knows anything at all about the place, with the Kodak Company's fine shop on your right hand and His Britannic Majesty's fine caracol on your left. You could reach it in three bomb throws if the last of the three happened to be googly and swerved in from the off, just round the corner into the rue Atarine. So, you see, it is right opposite the Atarine Mosque, and as you sit of an evening at Benchy's doorway, smoking his cigarettes, with his wine at your elbow, and watch the motley polyglot crowd ceaselessly passing, you have your eyes always coming back to the carved and inlaid door of the old temple, and up the graceful minaret into the great lift of a night sky, glorious with such liquid gold of stars that memory of herself will take you back to many a mellow night when the stars of even more melting loveliness bent above you in your own homeland down south. But you never saw such a restless crowd in an Australian or New Zealand street as this double line of dapper Europeans and sallow Egyptians, Syrians, Armenians, and hungry-looking Greeks, threading the low swirl of khaki tunics and Arab rags. And ever and anon the stream ebbs before your Gary driver's long-drawn hasib, mind out, to let pass some official dignitary, or some riotous party of kangaroos, or some handsome red-tapped officer of the regular staff. Or maybe tis an even more handsome and stalwart private of the ranks, beside some dear, dainty, winsome thing, under one of those little flyaway hats, with that dark kiss curl clean close to her cheek. You know exactly the kind of maid and the kind of curl, I mean... And still, the tall, quiet minaret and the broad, quiet heaven seem to lean together, and one grows pensive, sitting at Benchy's narrow door of a summer evening. Old Benchy himself is a brisk little Italian, doubtless of middle age. I think it must have been as a mark of affection that we called him Old Benchy, for his hair still keeps something of its youthful brown. He has not a word of English, and about two of French, but you know at once from his open, sunny face that, like most of his compatriots, he has a heart of gold, and, at a price to fit a ranker's pocket, he keeps a Chianti that is first-rate. It was Tillett who found him for us. Tillett is a New Zealand medical corps man, grey-headed, full of years, and the experience they have brought him, equally at ease in French, Italian, and Spanish from his early life on the continent, and a dabbler in Greek and German by way of diversion, but so quiet and unassuming withal, and so rarely confidential about himself and his affairs, that we knew little of him beyond that he was at the time doing odd jobs of healing for the drivers of a New Zealand battery withdrawn from the peninsula. For us, he was a most likable chap, an excellent interpreter when our mediocre French failed, and, his chief merit, the discoverer of Benchy and his tavern. With a palate tormented 
by stewed tea and the heavy canteen beer beloved of the yokels of old england he had traversed well nigh every quarter of alexandria in vain quest of the cheap and honest draught wine that he knew must be there somewhere and he yet must be neither that so very ordinaire red wine of french nor that wretched health wines of greece that carry in their tang memories of the physician and the sick-bed of our pre-war days and between him and old benchy there had grown up a quite sincere affection apart altogether from chante at p t one per glass it was delightful the pantomime that went on whenever any of us arrived without tillet with the countenance full of anxious solicitude benchy would point vaguely out into the night carry his forefinger to his own grey head and then up would go his eyebrows in interrogation this we knew to mean where is our friend of the grey hair that you are here to-night without him and one of us would answer by laying his face to the table and snoring heavily or in mimic sentry go along the passage oh but it was good to see that smile that broke and beamed across his honest face with his pleasure at finding himself intelligible to his country's allies the rest of these allies so far as our coterie was concerned were a sergeant of the ceylon tea planters back from gallipoli in charge of his company's horses and a maori of that gallant reckless band whose comante comante rang along those hills in august well born and well educated in physique strong and solid but with movements as quick and sure as a cat's in this tanned army only the full lips and the slightly flattened nose betrayed his origin he and i had been friends at the same new zealand versity but like so many of the best of his race he was no sticker and in the third year of his medical course he had sidetracked himself on troubled studies of mind and consciousness and refused to carry on with his dull public health and medical jurisprudence. Since leaving Versity, he had been living on his means, he told me, spending most of his time in wandering. Napier, the tea planter of Ceylon, was your well-bred, clean-limbed, rather aggressively healthy-minded young Englishman. These three, at any rate, were the center of that bright little knot of friends that, in a three-month stay in Alexandria, had drifted and stuck together in a community of tastes and ideas and downright liking for one another. And though one or other of us might be held by night pickets or CB or on visits to our hospitable French and Italian friends, yet on any night of the week, from seven till midnight, you would find two or three of us foregathered at the back of the little shop in the shadow of the great black casks and behind the wooden grill that while allowing us from the dim interior a clear view of the street yet shut us off effectively from the eyes of the night patrol for it was before sir john maxwell's iron law of closing time that we held our revelry che ben chi and it was safe to wager that something was amiss if we went home by any but the one ten a m tram for ramla or by carriage even later but those were our palmy days in alexandria the days before the swarm of tommies came and our pockets began to empty and an officious picket in the fullness of its own importance went farther afield than sister street and patrolled the whole town in its lumbering motor wagons l j ivory fourth howitzer battery n z f a end of section sixty two section sixty three gray smoke by r g n from the anzac book edited by c e w bean Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Old pipe, old comrade, friend of mine, Have I then made you sad? Or is it just that you and I Been drinking wine, embittered by this dull grey day? Or must it be that you too know 
that smoke and hopes grey both may go grey smoke of yours grey thoughts of mine seem strangely both in one accord to-day perhaps it is that croon song of the pine recalling memories dear and far away or is it that this grey day's mystic spell foretells the end of hope and smoke in hell ah no old pipe methinks the grey day came to temper such as you and i to stand the small and weary problems of life's game and learn to cheer one another whose hand has groped in vain and vainly gropes for better things than grey like smoke and greyer hopes r g n eleventh australian a s c end of section sixty three this recording is in the public domain section sixty four a wail from ordnance by lieutenant kinninman from the anzac book edited by c e w bean read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone we're only in the ordinance not troopers of the line we don't attack no enemy nor in the papers shine we just wait here from morn till night expecting them ere shells that make our lives that were so bright so many earthly hells we hand out underpants and socks and boots and coats galore to them as gives and takes hard knocks and soon gets used to war we keep their clothing up to dick equip and arm em too we rig out the returning sick almost as good as new they blew us from our depot south a bit along the beach we umped our blueies nothing loath and settled out of reach our store grew large and prosperous we laughed at turk and hun until they trained on us one day a blasted four point one each morning they put in a few to bring us from our beds from time to time the old day through they make us duck our heads one eye is cocked for cover and one ear is for the whiz and until the fuss is over we postpone our daily biz now when the war is over and we return to peace though we may live in clover enjoying lives of ease a striking clock will wake us and a blowout make us run and cry again our old refrain god straff that four point one lieutenant kinimoth a o c end of section sixty four this recording is in the public domain section sixty five of the anzac book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of anzac chronicles the flood by genesis gallipoli and it came to pass that king hun called together his mighty men and said unto them two behold i have dreamed a dream and the god of boasts hath appeared unto me and said three bring together all your ships of the sea your wealth of the land and your mighty men of valor including your firstborn four for i say unto you now is the day five ye shall go forth to battle against the kingdoms of the earth to wage war against all who do not bow down to thee and call thee the one six for i have decreed that thou shalt rule the earth to the uttermost corners of it seven let thou and thy son take but six days rations in your haversacks for on the seventh day thou shalt dine at the palace of the buckinghamites 
with the king of the Alites as thy mess orderly. 8. Forget not thy pomade, nor thy toothbrush, neither shalt thou leave behind thy gases, nor thine iron rations, for thou mayest have need of them. 9. And go ye forth to kill and plunder, spare none, but put all to the sword, and put your trust in yourself alone, and err myself, if it so please thee. 10. For this is the day. 11. And all his mighty men bowed down to him and said, O king, live forever, verily thou hast truly said, and thy kingdom shall extend to the ends of the earth, and the heavens and to the depths of the sea. 12. So King Hun blew his bags out, smoke him on the chest, and called aloud, saying, I am it. 13. And the same day he brought together all his legions of men, and his ships of the sea, and all the wealth of the land. For they were all ready. 14. And they counted and found umpteen million men of valor, two ships, seventeen anchors, fourteen shillings, and five pence in gold, umpteen billion rolls of paper money, and any got squantity gas. 15. But they left the two ships at home, fastened to the seventeen anchors. 16. And the king of all the Huns said, It is enough, Imshi. Footnote. Imshi is the Arabic for go away. The Australian corpse, which had so far employed it only to street hawkers in Cairo, used this war cry on April 25th. End footnote. 17. So, they imshied. 18. Now it came to pass that the Huns ran amok both east and west, north and south, and their cry was strafe and burlud, and they got both in abundance. 19. For they threw themselves on the neighboring villages, breaking through the back gate without warning, and slaying the watchdog and the pig the husbandman and his wife, the baby and the nurse, the cat and the canary. 20. Nor even did the boy about the place have time to reach his air gun from off the shelf, for the mad mass tarried not to wipe his sword, but only to quench its blood lust and its thirst. 21. And when they had laid waste all that land, they boiled over into the next. 22. But it came to pass that by this time the cries of murder and children in torment had reached far and wide. And before another sun had set, two men met the horde of Huns. 23. And the Huns lifted up their bleary eyes and asked, got strafe but who vas did that do dry sob our little game twenty four and the man from the west with the strong arm and the iron jaw proclaimed to the multitude twenty five i am k of k and this is the end of the section twenty six and the butchers all lifted up their voices with one accord, saying, Got straff and hick burlued. 27. But the Huns stopped, yea, verily. 28. And so it came to pass that the king of the Huns dined not at the palace of the Buckinghamites with the king of the Aliites as his mess orderly. 
neither on the sixth day nor in the sixth year. 29. But the king of the Huns and little Willie ate their iron rations instead. 30. And the flood was over the face of the earth for many days and many nights, till the mighty winds arose and drove it back. 31. And behold, the king of the Huns said unto himself, Verily, it was a dream, and instead of the day is now nothing but the night. 32. So he fell asleep. 33. And great was the fall thereof. Genesis Gallipoli. End of section 65. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 66 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Anzac Chronicles. The Book of Job's by W.R. Wishart. And it came to pass that on the seventh day of the week of the fourth month of the year, being the twenty-fifth Sunday after the Melbourne Cup, there journeyed forth from the land of the Greeks, yelped Limos, a mighty host. 2. And Birdie commanded them, saying, Take from the Turks the land of Gallipoli, that we may occupy it. Possess yourself also the command of the Narrows, that all who are freed may enter. 3. Therefore the colonels, majors, and captains took heed, and after much lengthy powwowing issued to their men this edict. Hear ye, men of Australia and New Zealand, what the boss hath commanded. Ye shall girdle yourselves about with ammunition, and after landing, as seems meetest, make assault upon the hills and valleys of Gallipoli, which the sons of Abdul do hold to our detriment. 4. To the ninth, and the tenth, and the eleventh, and the twelfth battalions of foot soldiers, this follower of Medon addresses himself thus, Prepare ye the track, that the first, second, and other brigades, even your comrades, may make peaceful footing, and each man take with him a first field dressing and two days' rations, for we know not what difficulties we might encounter. 5. And to the Army Medical Corps likewise he addressed himself, commanding them to attend to the weak, the injured and the weary and lo his words were not in vain for the land was treacherous and harbored many pitfalls six and it came further to pass that the enemy proved themselves hard doers yea verily they were a stubborn folk for they had builded unto themselves dugouts and trenches on the land of their forefathers and were aware of the coming of the invader. 7. But Birdie's host were of the hills and dales, men of much cunning and resourcefulness. 8. Therefore, without the flourish of trumpets, they sallied forth to the right and to the left and the center. 9. And they did that which was right in the sight of the boss, for they used their blocks and held the ground which seemed impossible to those not possessed of faith in his judgment. 10. And on the day of the 26th and of the 27th, and on succeeding days, they did also build trenches and burrow holes into the earth like unto the rabbit. 
that they might abide safely, for it was further commanded that this should be done. 11. Now it came to the ears of the chief, and it was a true saying, that the valley of shrapnel was even as Gehanna, fraught with many dangers to the unwary. Therefore it was commanded that the pioneers should prepare a track crooked, making it thereby difficult, yea, insurmountable. 12. And when this and sundry tasks were completed, the first, the second, the third, and the other brigades of human pack horses, so that the good work might be continued, were reinforced by a multitude of those who are known as the Lost Horse Regiments. 13. And lo! The host of Birdwood flourished amazingly, even to the extent of rum and porridge. 14. By this time, being the twelfth month of the same year, it waxed plurry cold, even unto a fall of snow, and the erstwhile land of Jacko did breed much flu and penu, and it did seem as though the plagues of the ancient Jepos had descended upon them. 15. But the iodine infantry were magnanimous with their potions. Thus in our generation the sick were cured of their suffering, and the balm of Gilead descended upon them. 16. At the time of the eleventh month of the same year, as this is written, a chief of the rulers journeyed from afar to take counsel with his chiefs, and by his guiding smooth out and make plain the difficulties which had beset their paths. 17. This accomplished, it was given unto Bertie that he should command all, excepting only the good ship Argon, which contains such a heterogeneous mass as that good ship of Noah's did contain. 18. Now the rest of the acts of Kitchener, and all that he did and said, have they not been written in the Peninsula Press and other vaporous rags, erstwhile our filthy contemporaries? 19. Heed ye all of this, ye who dwell in the Antipodes, for the time is nigh when the clouds of war shall lift and we may abide in halicon peace, for this is the Dinkum book of Job's, as will be written in the book of Revelations. W. R. Wishart, Number 1, Australian Station Hospital, Anzac. End of Section 66. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 67 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Anzac Chronicles, the perfectly true parable of the seven egyptians by captain a alcorn from the anzac book edited by c e w bean now a multitude of egyptians journeyed unto anzac even nigh unto the seats of the mighty and when they had come unto the place whereon it was written they should rest they took counsel one with the other saying lo behold we have no light two then one more bold than the rest journeyed forth to gather fuel that peradventure had been washed to the beach and had escaped the claws of apollyon the camp commandant 
and after he had searched a while he raised his eyes and praised allah for near to the waters he found a tin can having a wick like unto the lamps of his forefathers even from the days of the prophet and straightway he returneth to his companions saying rejoice with me for allah has been bountiful and i have had good fortune thus saying he kindled the lamp but it would not burn and he kindled it a second time but still the lamp refused to give her light then they cast it into the fire and they all gathered round to enjoy the light and warmth thereof three and it came to pass that while they yet warmed their hands there was heard a mighty crash and the jippies that remained were picked up seven stretchers full for verily it is not meet at anzac to put to base uses such jam tin bombs and other trifles as apollyon abandoneth even when you find them kicking about on the seashore captain a alcorn number one a s hospital end of section sixty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section sixty eight the Silence by Private R. J. Godfrey From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean This is indeed a false, false night. There's not a soldier sleeps, But like a ghost stands to his post, While death through the long sap creeps. There's an eerie, filmy spell o'er all, A murmur from the sea, and not a sound on the hills around say what will the silence be private r j godfrey seventh australian field ambulance end of section sixty eight this recording is in the public domain section sixty nine the growl by e m smith from the anzac book edited by c e w bean read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone they told us when we listed we'd have a lot to bear there was hardships good and plenty and a chance to do and dare and since lobbing here at anzac we've had a scrap or three but what we're going crook for is there's only tea for tea we can take our iron rations though they hand em out like hell and we charge the blanky turkeys through a cataract of shell but what narks us more than any is to hear the sergeant say the sea's too rough to land our stores there ain't no jam to-day when we're stuck up in the trenches where the shells is falling thick and johnny turk's machine-guns does the interviewing trick we give em all they gave us and a bit of interest too but why don't someone tell em we're just perishing for stew we lays down in the open when our bivvies isn't dug the rain comes down in rivers and we're anything but snug we stand to half the blooming night but the whole of that is naught if they give us all we wanted of the state what comes to port when it rains they give us lime juice when it's hot they give us rum the backy don't arrive because the mule train didn't come the mail is half a day behind and when it comes to light we blanky well can't read it cause it's dark as egypt's night but anyway that's roustin and you don't want to eat our owl they say as how a soldier has a perfect right to growl if it's woolly beef till doomsday we ain't gonna make a fuss so long as we can lick the turks that's good enough for us e m smith twenty seventh battalion end of section sixty nine this recording is in the public domain
Section 70, My Lady Nicotine. Edited by C.E.W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org. My Lady Nicotine, with thanks to all givers of cigarettes. The hills of old Gallipoli are barren and austere, and fairy folk unhappily are few indeed out there. But one I know whose industry both night and day is seen, for all attest her ministry, my lady nicotine. I do not pen unfeelingly these random lines of thanks, for I, in old Gallipoli, am fighting in the ranks. However long the day may be, or cold the watch of night, my lady finds unerringly the road to the respite. Her gift is small and seemingly of little value yet. It teaches me so charmingly to think and to forget. So I and those along with me, in all this dreary scene, unite in giving thanks to thee, my lady nicotine. H. G. Garland End of section 70. This recording is in the public domain. Section 71, The Raid on London by Pat Riot from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Ellie Rose, July 2nd, 2020. A Modern Chronicle by Private Pat Ryan. England has been conquered by Julius Caesar, William of Normandy, nearly, but not quite, by William of Germany, and lastly, by Plain Bill of Australia. And of the three, it is clear that the conquest of Australian Bill was the most successful of all, when it is remembered that at the time of his triumphant entry into London, he was not the man he is. He was sick and wounded. He did not invade the city with his shield in front of him. He was carried on it. He came a conqueror on crutches. Private Bill Kangaroo was a lanky, sawny bushman who, when a certain foreign militarism went mad and the band began to play the Concert of Europe, read between the lines of his newspaper, thought a bit, saddled his brumby, and rode for the nearest town that ran a railway, staying there just long enough for a final shout. He passed the doctor easily, took a quite insanguary oath, for once, to do his job as a soldier, and went into camp. How Private Bill made his kangaroo-like leap up the ridges of Gallipoli has been told by a war correspondent to a public which had, up till then, been vaguely aware of his existence as a poor relation from a South Sea island. It is fairly certain that future historians will teach that Australia was discovered not by Captain Cook, explorer, but by Mr. Ashmead Bartlett, war correspondent. Anyhow, the finding and exploration of the territory is not in the same continent as the discovery and exploration of its people, and Bill has seen the correspondent in the trenches and regards him with much more curiosity than ever he regarded the quondam explorer. But he was unconcerned with these things and was acting correspondent in the case of Crescent V. Southern Cross when a sniper's bullet hit him in the neck and brought him out of court. A hospital ship brought him to the city of London. London first came to know him through the medium of its most useful person, the policeman. Bill had no love for a policeman as a reader of riot acts, but he developed quite an affection for him as a pointer of the way. I'm bushed became a familiar greeting between them, and the kangaroo was never disappointed when he strolled across the street to ask PC-49 the way he should go. A London motor bus might have done what a Turkish bullet failed to do if the man in blue had not stopped the traffic and played the part of pilot to him. The raised hand that held up the stream only for royal persons was lifted for the strolling soldier from the south, and the busman laughed at the bushman. To be bushed in the heart of London became a common experience with him, and one had a suspicion that nefarious taxicab drivers often took advantage of his innocence of locality to drive him in circles before dropping him at his destination, perhaps five minutes from the starting place. It was the shortness of city distances that puzzled him, and he was amazed to find names that were historical and household words twelve thousand miles away, borne by quite unpretentious streets and lanes. When English people learned that he had traveled a thousand miles to pass a doctor and join the army, they gasped and said he must be joking. What a class war failed to do, a race war had done. The poor and their patrons, noblemen 
gentle and simple, vied with each other in dealing hospitably by the private soldier who had climbed the heights that commanded a view of the past and the future. In the stately homes of England, Bill, in servant's phrase, met the big guns as one of themselves, and was astonished at the surprise thus caused. But he was amazed, in turn, when the servants told him they had been in the house ten years. With many embellishments, he assured them that a girl in service in Sydney would think she owned the house if she stopped so long in one place. To Bill, going into the Carlton or the Hotel Cecil wasn't sitting in the seats of the mighty, but just the same as entering the pub at Youngersborough, and he wandered in these places without any desire to cut a dash. He approved of the costly surroundings, but when he saw the smallness of the glasses put before him, Bill sat in the seats of the scornful. He really enjoyed himself better in that inn where he found a group of cockney cronies. The landlord had to respond repeatedly to his fill em up again, and Bill afterwards declared it to be the cheapest night's fun in the town. Parsimonious people would say that Bill Kangaroo didn't know the value of money, for it took him some time to appreciate the small coins of the realm at their face value. He thought it looked mean to keep on asking how much, and when seeing the sights of the city he always pulled out silver more than sufficient to cover expenses. The pennies he received in change soon filled his pocket, and at first he gave them away, but as he saw that he would soon be penniless, he would go into one of those places described as being strictly within the meaning of the act, and surreptitiously ask the barman if he could do with change. His dislike of the base metal and a habit of tipping in silver bade fair to earn for him the nickname of the Silver King. Tipping, he reckoned, a curse, but knowing that many men lived by tips alone, he passed the coin quite as cordially as he disliked the practice. Bill never bought in the cheapest market to sell in the dearest. He didn't think it on the square. His greatest adventure was the Zeppelins. Seated in a theatre one evening, he heard a woof, and just after that a second one, closer a third, a fourth, and then a fifth just outside. Woof! crash men and women began to rush for the doors until the man who rose to the occasion on that memorable twenty-fifth rose to this one and shouted above the tumult of falling glass and tramping feet that it was safer in than out and that if they kept their seats all would be well the actresses on stage though quaking with fright stuck pluckily to their parts until the final act bill himself wanted dearly to go out and see the infernal machines and their effect but, for example's sake, he stayed till order was restored when he slipped out of the building. What he saw outside filled him with thankfulness that he was a soldier, helping to smash the raiders and their kind. Wandering down the streets, past great gaping holes in the roadway, an overturned motor bus and some wrecked buildings, he found himself on the embankment, and then on the bridge, where he saw a damaged arch of masonry. He sat down to think— little dreaming that he was fulfilling Macaulay's prophecy concerning the man from down under, sitting on the ruins of London Bridge. Bill's furlough was finished shortly after this. His raid terminated with that of the Zeppelins. He was glad to return to the front, and he knows now that, in assisting in the pruning of Prussia, he is fighting for more things than ever he thought of when he took the oath of allegiance. But he swears that when the job is done, he will again visit the land of his father's fathers and toast it in a big, big toast. Ninth Battalion. End of section seventy one. This recording is in the public domain. Section number seventy two. Sing by unknown. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Trooper Singh of the Second Light Horse Brigade, on the right, was said to have sniped his two hundred Turk, but his name and fame have not spread all around the lines, for a staff officer in visiting the snipers of Quinn's post, came upon a light horseman who, very justifiably, was priding himself upon having definitely hit twelve of the enemy. Did you hear that fellow sing on the right of the line? 
began the staff officer. Well, sir, they don't sing in front of me, put in the Quinn's postman promptly. They're to be well frightened. End of section 72. This recording is in the public domain. Section 73. Another Attempt at an Anzac Alphabet. From the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. A was the anguish that spread on my face when I saw the remarkable look of the place. B's Beachy Bill, who fired at my ship, punctured the funnel and gave me the pip. C was the crump that went by with a screech as I jumped from a lighter and fell on the beach. D was the daring I failed to display when fragments of shrapnel came whizzing my way. E was earth which I found in my hair as I woke in the morning and crawled from my lair. F were the fleas and also the flies who feed on a fellow wherever he lies. G were the gripes that gripped me within the result of commodities packed in a tin. H was the hole that a howitzer made. It would take me an hour to fill in with a spade. I was the idiot who stuck up my head before I was taught to take cover instead. J was the jam with our rations and rum. We found it was almost invariably plum. K was the knowledge I quickly acquired of hiding whenever the enemy fired. L was the louse that lurked in my vest, reconnoitred my person and tickled my chest. M was the monitor firing at night, which kept me awake when the above didn't bite. N was the night stunt with trembling heart, expecting each moment the maxims would start. O's the O.O. Let's give him a cheer. It isn't his fault that nothing comes here. P are the peers. See them shiver and shake whenever a launch makes a wash with her wake q stands for quick to the tunnel we dash when a horrible missile explodes with a crash r are the rumours we hear every day that the turkish morale has quite faded away s is the gilded staff officer who censors my letters and tears them in two t is the taube that drones in the sky thank goodness i haven't been ordered to fly you is the underground sap we expand there's a tupney tub to the narrows in hand v is for victory how we shall sing rule o britannia and god save the king w the wire we put round our works we generally find that it's pinched by the turks x the experiments made with a bomb a neat little cross on a nice little tomb why in the world have i ever been placed in a trench of cold water right up to my waist z is the mule corps recruited from zion bearers of water and rations of iron hubik twenty first indian mountain battery end of section seventy three this recording is in the public domain Section 74 To Sorry Bear From the Anzac Book Edited by C. E. W. Bean Read for LibriVox.org By Alan Lawley Did Ari Banu, Sorry Bear, With lips of hot desire, And clutch your skirts in wild despair At your disdainful ire? O oh, Sorry Bear, with frowning brow, and flinty breasts of stone, fierce and sack breeze of fiery vow, thou art for him alone. To drive your Abdul from his lairs, he comes in proud array, and loud he swears, and when he swears, the Turkish hosts give way. Dear goddess wise in ancient lore, let Abdul curse the Hun, the waning crescent fades before. Australia's rising sun. But cheer up poor old sorry bear, and smile, Miss Battle Smoke.
for Anzac, wild of eye and hair, is quite a decent bloke. Ben Telbow, 10th Australian Battalion. End of section 74. This recording is in the public domain. Section 75 on Water Fatigue by Trooper George H. Smith from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean, read for LibriVox.org. I'd like to get the Hun who sends the little bits of shell which buzz around as wearily I top that blooming hill. He only does his duty, but my only shirt I'd sell for half a chance to give the cuss a non-return to hell. Trooper George H. Smith, 7th Light Horse End of Section 75 This recording is in the public domain. Section number 76 When It's All Over by Harry McCann We were finished with the fightin', we were finished with the war, and the dove of peace looked healthier than e'er she did before. For the Allies put the acid on the Hohenzollern crowd, and they piled the costs on William when they knew they had him cowed. But we didn't care a cuss word if his soul were saved or sold. We were bound for home and beauty and the wonderlust was cold. Yes, we dream of home and mother, and of dad and sister May, and the girls who used to know us, waiting half a world away, and were wanting but to find them just the same and nothing more, just the same old dear old home folks that we knew before the war. And I'm hoping they'll be looking for the boy that used to be, not a hero with a halo for the crowd to come and see. Oh, I've snarled to read the phrases that the writers coined for us. Deathless heroes, lasting glory, and the other foolish fuss. For we're simple, sinful soldiers, and we're often rude and rough, and our characters ain't altered since we donned the khaki stuff. Smithy terms this the outpourings of an overburdened soul, but I'd like to stuff a blanket in that long offending hole. As I gaze on Bill Micawber, sure I smile a little smile, for his happy, careless nature doesn't fit the poet's style. No, he don't resemble Caesar in his looks or in his speech, nor Napoleon, nor Cromwell. Why, they ain't within his reach. He's a decent sort of cobber, but he doesn't push a claim to be classed a gallant guardian of Britain's honored name. I've a grouch on jingo riders and the poets and them all, who have placed us common persons on a public pedestal. Will they dust our coats and speak to us and help us when we fall? Or paste a different label on us, something very small? It's their fault I'm entertaining just a tiny little dread, that me friends may want a hero with the halo round his head. Harry McCann, 4th, A-L-H Footnote Cobber, Australian for a well-tried and tested pal. End of footnote. End of section 76. This recording is in the public domain. Section 77 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Special A and N Z A C orders from the Anzac Book, edited by C E W Bean. The following are some of the special orders issued on notable occasions to the officers and men of the A and N Z Army Corps. Number one, the landing, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, April 1915. Officers and men, in conjunction with the Navy, we are about to undertake one of the most difficult tasks any soldier can be called on to perform, and a problem which has puzzled many soldiers for years past. That we will secede, I have no doubt, simply because I know your full determination to do so. Lord Kitchener has told us that he lays special stress 
on the role the army has to play in this particular operation the success of which will be a very severe blow to the enemy indeed as severe as any he could receive in france it will go down in history to the glory of the soldiers of australia and new zealand before we start there are one or two points which i must impress on all and i most earnestly beg every single man to listen attentively and take these to heart we are going to have a real hard and rough time of it until at all events we have turned the enemy out of our first objective hard rough times none of us mind but to get through them successfully we must always keep before us the following facts every possible endeavor will be made to bring up transport as often as possible but the country whither we are bound is very difficult and we may not be able to get our wagons anywhere near us for days so men must not think that their wants have been neglected if they do not get all they want on landing it will be necessary for every individual to carry with him all his requirements in food and clothing for three days as we may not see our transport till then remember then that it is essential for every one to take the very greatest care not only of his food but of his ammunition the replenishment of which will be very difficult men are liable to throw away their food the first day out and to finish their water bottles as soon as they start marching if you do this now you can hardly hope for success as unfed men cannot fight and you must make an effort to try and refrain from starting on your water bottles until quite late in the day once you begin drinking you cannot stop and a water bottle is very soon empty also as regards ammunition we must not waste it by firing away indiscriminately at no target the time will come when we shall find the enemy in well entrenched positions from which we shall have to turn them out when all our ammunition will be required and remember concealment whenever possible covering fire always control of fire and control of your men communications never to be neglected signed by w r birdwood two the battles of august special order by general sir ian hamilton g c b d s o a d c commander-in-chief mediterranean expeditionary force general headquarters mediterranean expeditionary force september seventh nineteen fifteen the commander-in-chief mediterranean expeditionary force desires formally to record the fine feat of arms achieved by the troops under the command of lieutenant-general sir w r birdwood during the battle of sari bear the fervent desire of all ranks to close with the enemy the impetuosity of their onset and the steadfast valor with which they maintain the long struggle these will surely make appeal to their fellow countrymen all over the world the gallant capture of the most impregnable lone pine trenches by the australian division and the equally gallant defense of the position against repeated counter-attacks are exploits which will live in history the determined assaults carried out from other parts of the australian division's line were also of inestimable service to the whole force preventing as they did the movement of large bodies of reinforcements to the northern flank the troops under the command of major general sir a j godley and particularly the new zealand and australian division were called upon to carry out one of the most difficult military operations that has ever been attempted a night march and assault by several columns in intricate mountainous terrain strongly entrenched and held by a numerous and determined enemy their brilliant conduct during this operation and the success they achieved have won for them a reputation as soldiers of whom any country must be proud to the australian and new zealand army corps therefore and to those who were associated with that famous corps in the battle of sari bear the maoris sikhs gurkhas and the new troops of the tenth and thirteenth divisions from the old country sir ian hamilton tenders his appreciation of their efforts his admiration of their gallantry and his thanks for their achievements it is an honor to command a force which numbers such men as these in its ranks and is the commander-in-chief's high privilege to acknowledge that honor w p braithwaite major-general chief of the general staff three arrival of the second australian division and sinking of the southland 
special army corps order army corps headquarters september seventh nineteen fifteen in welcoming the second australian division to join the australian and new zealand army corps the general officer commanding on behalf of all their comrades now serving on the peninsula wishes to convey to them our general feeling of admiration for the gallant behavior of all ranks on board the transport southland when that vessel was torpedo on the second instant all the troops of the empire now serving with the army corps have heard with pride of the courage and discipline shown at a moment when the nerves of the bravest were liable to be so highly tried not only was there not the slightest confusion on the part of the troops who quietly fell in prepared to meet whatever fate might be in store for them but later on when there is a prospect of the southland being able to make her way under her own steam and volunteer stokers were called for men at once came forward for this duty and successfully helped in getting the southland into mudros the second australian division knows well the high reputation it has to live up to to carry on the brave deeds done by those who have been here earlier in the campaign but with men like those on the southland we are fully assured that our new comrades are going to prove themselves equal in all ways to the old hands who have fought so well c m wagstaff major for brigadier general general staff australian and new zealand army corps four lord kitchener's message australian and new zealand army corps special army corps orders november twenty fifth nineteen fifteen lord kitchener has desired me to convey to the australian and new zealand army corps a message for which he was specially entrusted by the king to bring to our army corps his majesty commanded lord kitchener to express his high appreciation of the gallant and unflinching conduct of our men through fighting which has been as hard as any yet seen during the war and his majesty wishes to express his complete confidence in the determination and fighting qualities of our men to assist in carrying this war to an entirely successful termination lord kitchener has ordered me to express to all the very great pleasure it gave him to have the opportunity which he considers a privilege of visiting anzac to see for himself some of the wonderfully good work which has been done by the officers and men of our army corps as it was not until he had himself seen the positions we had captured and held that he was able fully to realize the magnitude of the work which has been accomplished lord kitchener much regretted that time did not permit of his seeing the whole corps but he was very pleased to see a considerable portion of officers and men and to find all in such good heart and so confidently imbued with that grand spirit which has carried them through all their trials and many dangerous feats of arms a spirit which he is quite confident they will maintain to the end till they have taken their full share in completely overthrowing our enemies boys we may all well be proud to receive such messages and it is up to all of us to live up to them and prove their truth w r birdwood five general birdwood relinquishes command of a and n z army corps special army corps orders australian and new zealand army corps december first nineteen fifteen boys i cannot tell you how really sorry i am to be leaving anzac as i have to do on shifting over to army headquarters i have not however any intention of saying good-bye to anyone for i trust it is by no means good-bye as i still hope and intend to see as much of all my old friends in the army corps as i possibly can do nor am i going to express my thanks to officers and men even if i could find words to do so i feel it would be only presumptuous on my part for it is for the british empire to do that and i well know it will do so my one wish is to be able to finish this war alongside of all my old comrades of anzac having begun it together close on a year ago now in egypt i sincerely trust that many of us may be spared to see it through together when the time comes to make an end of our german enemies though that day may be yet far distant w r birdwood lieutenant general commanding australian and new zealand army corps six the evacuation of anzac special order of the day general headquarters december twenty first nineteen fifteen 
the commander-in-chief desires to express to all ranks in the dardanelles army his unreserved appreciation of the way in which the recent operations ending in the evacuation of the anzac and suvla positions have been carried to an issue successful beyond his hopes the arrangements made for withdrawal and for keeping the enemy in ignorance of the operation which was taking place could not have been improved the general officer commanding dardanelles army and the general officers commanding the australian and new zealand and ninth army corps may pride themselves on an achievement without parallel in the annals of war the army and corps staffs divisional and subordinate commanders and their staffs and the naval and military beach staffs prove themselves more than equal to the most difficult task which could have been thrown upon them regimental officers non-commissioned officers and men carried out without a hitch the most trying operation which soldiers can be called upon to undertake a withdrawal in the face of the enemy in a manner reflecting the highest credit on the discipline and soldierly qualities of the troops it is no exaggeration to call this achievement one without parallel to disengage and to withdraw from a bold and active enemy is the most difficult of all military operations and in this case the withdrawal was effected by surprise with the opposing forces at close grips in many cases within a few yards of each other such an operation when succeeded by a re-embarkation from an open beach is one for which military history contains no precedent during the past months the troops of great britain in ireland australia and new zealand newfoundland and india fighting side by side have invariably proved their superiority over the enemy have contained the best fighting troops in the ottoman army in their front and have prevented the germans from employing their turkish allies against us elsewhere no soldier relishes undertaking a withdrawal from before the enemy it is hard to leave behind the graves of good comrades and to relinquish positions so hardly won and so gallantly maintained as those we have left but all ranks in the dardanelles army will realize that in this matter they were but carrying out the orders of his majesty's government so that they might in due course be more usefully employed in fighting elsewhere for their king their country and the empire there is only one consideration what is best for the furtherance of the common cause in that spirit the withdrawal was carried out and in that spirit the australian and new zealand and ninth army corps have proved and will continue to prove themselves second to none as soldiers of the empire a lyndon bell major general chief of the general staff mediterranean expeditionary force seven the following telegrams are published for information december twentieth nineteen fifteen one from his majesty the king it gives me the greatest satisfaction to hear of the successful evacuation of suvla and anzac without loss of troops or guns please convey to general birdwood and those under his command my congratulations upon the able manner in which they have carried out so difficult an operation george r i december twenty first nineteen fifteen two to his majesty the king i have communicated your majesty's gracious message to general birdwood and the dardanelles army in their behalf in my own i beg to give expression to the deep gratification felt by all ranks at your majesty's encouraging words of congratulation the troops are only inspired by a desire to be employed again as soon as possible wherever their services may be used to best advantage against your majesty's enemies sir charles Monroe commander-in-chief mediterranean expeditionary force december twenty first nineteen fifteen three from the secretary of state for war his majesty's government received your news with the greatest pleasure and wish immediately to express to you and all under your command their high appreciation of the excellence of the arrangements for the withdrawal from anzac and suvla and their warm admiration for the conduct of the troops in carrying out the most difficult operation of war they appreciate as fully the effective help which admiral wames and the navy as well as general birdwood and the corps and other commanders afforded you the thanks of the government for this fine achievement are due to you and to all concerned and i wish also to congratulate you personally End of section seventy seven
Section number 78 of the Anzac Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Correspondence from the Anzac Book, edited by C. E. W. Bean. Dear Mr. Editor, thinking that perhaps a little news about a hitherto unheard department of the army, i.e. a field ambulance, might interest you, I have sat down, having previously obtained the kind permission of the great grandchildren of the justly celebrated Mr. Euclid, late of these parts deceased such axioms as will be of use and guidance to those requiring to know the habits of a field ambulance axiom one a field ambulance shall be an irregular conglomeration of humanity and other animals which shall never under any circumstances conform to any fixed order or condition axiom two whenever possible the number of n c o s in a field ambulance shall exceed the number of men by fifty per cent in order that the said n c o s may have a twenty-four hours rest when on duty supervising fatigues etc this axiom is taken from the detailed account of corpse orders made by william the conqueror in the year 1066 axiom three a field ambulance shall never under any circumstance move off on the first instance but all necessary fatigue for the moving shall be fully indulged only under extreme circumstances may it move on the second instance v d a a z q p paragraph one four four nine zero zero five three axiom four all batmen in a field ambulance shall be equal to anything axiom five if at any time a field ambulance should be lost the finder will provided he doesn't require it for a war curio immediately place it in the most isolated place available and forget it because several others are trying to do the same yours truly nobby acting d a l c and p o to abdul mustafa mohammed bird trenches or neighboring green from holly spur suicide valley anzac december 1915 dear abdul i'm scribbling this letter in the trench with my back to the wall and i've heaps of good news that i'd better get down well i think of it all you've been so abnormally quiet say abdul has something gone wrong not a charge or a sign of a riot not for ever and ever so long they tell me you're sick of campaigning that you'd aim in your kit if you could that your courage and patience are waning and that prospects ain't looking too good are you counting your hopes of returning to that little home there in the wood where there's peace and a good fire burning and the rations are plenty and good it's near christmas you know that's the reason we're buried in our growls for a while for you couldn't be sad in the season when everyone's wearing a smile but of course i forgot you're not sharing the joy that we christians know and i guess you're not giving or caring a damn for the whole valley show i'll chance that it gives you the willies if you've heard it won't 
hurt to repeat that the cards and the boy's Christmas billies footnote the billy is a tin can something like what is known in England as a milk can to which the Australian of the bush boils his water and makes his tea a billy packed with various good things was being sent to each Australian soldier for Christmas and note are here and no kid they're a treat plum duff for the boys who've been fighting on the biscuit and beef army store i tell you we don't need inviting to back in our carts for some more gee the chocolate and cake are delicious and there's sweets and smokes in my pail and a card with the sender's best wishes i'm sending my thanks per this mail folks who reckon that loving is living whose hearts are as big as their land whose happiness centers in giving that's our folks and their old-fashioned stand well abdul i'll finish this trifle for my thoughts are beginning to drift and the sergeant has passed me my rifle and it's time i took over my shift i'm concluding this note with a moral take a tip from a bloke in the know pick your men when you're picking a quarrel yours truly australia joe p s by the way they've been stating that you're scared to come out any more don't forget there's a welcome here waiting a warm one you bet au revoir corporal a v mcgann c squadron fourth a l h regiment end of section seventy eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section seventy nine of the anzac book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Answers to Correspondence by Private Coles from the Anzac Book, edited by C.E.W. Bean by our inquiry officer orderly private t coles third l h f a snyder we quite agree with you that this is a soldier's journal rather than a sunday school prize book nevertheless the chaplain editor feels we must decline the limerick series you submitted us our head printer is a married man with a growing family and sternly refuses to handle your matter so that settles it anxious your cold feet complaint must not necessarily be a chronic affliction many chaps have been permanently cured by a little vigorous pedestrian exercise such as vaulting the parapet and bogging into a dinkum bayonet charge so cheer up it will go away of its own accord once you get warmed up to it comic cuts sorry all the generals you have so far seen do not come up to your humorous expectations when you do meet the general of whom you approve we should advise you just to drop him a line and let him know it will warm the poor old fellow up hungry always yes soft or light diet is absolutely necessary in treatment for dysentery or gastritis if you think you know better than the doctor experiment with green quinces and lemonade let us know how you get on chaplain of the fifth dear kind-hearted old chap 
haven't you quite enough to do here without worrying your head over the progress of war relief funds in australia anyhow it may please you to know that it is proposed to impose a special fine for every time the word blanky is used by men or officers the proceeds to go to the various funds so you need not have fear of the said funds not reaching the million pound mark in quite a short time now cd bought you can't expect us to diagnose your complaint if you don't make your symptoms clear but if you feel that a torchlight procession is going on in your interior you have probably exposed yourself too suddenly to an attack of cambridge sausages and tin peaches try a change of diet say whiskey and sweeps with steak and kidney pudding undignified we sympathize with you deeply in your suffering from the effects of a shrapnel pellet naturally every man on returning to his country would be proud to display to his admiring relatives and friends those honorable scars received on active service you had bad luck but at the same time you should not have tried the ostrich act when the shell burst parcel post you say you wouldn't mind an occasional case of eat and drinkables in the parcel as well as the socks and shirts and box of licorice powders they will all be useful but anyway think of your poor flurried aunts and sisters at home fighting their way with knitting needles wide-eyed and tousle-haired through a deadly maze of skein wool entanglements it's horrible we're better off where we are adjutant yes it's a pity that one of your men such as a seasoned veteran and a capable and obedient soldier too should have such kleptomaniacal tendencies but we wouldn't advise you to have him sent back make him your batman instead why the man was born for the position fuzzy your suggestions will be handed on to the proper quarters the only objection to the suggested cinema show at reserve gully might be that the boys in the firing trenches would make it too hot sneaking off to the pictures every night afraid you've no hope in seeing a pub built over the road opposite williams pier yes it's possible that our motor wagons might run penny section moonlight trips to salt lake and back to anzac but we fear that there is no hope of a palais de danse there end of section 79 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section 80 of the anzac book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c advertisements from the anzac book edited by c e w bean public notices notice the turkish artillery is requested to refrain from wasting ammunition whilst our meals are being served public notice the electric elevator will not be working up the gullies for a while some cook stole the current to make a pudding kappa tepi museum come and see a piece of long extinct australian butter now being exhibited admission one slice of bread 
benevolent home. The editor has established a home for lost newspapers and books. Any books or papers may be left there and no questions asked. Medical. Men suffering from a feeling of fullness after eating are requested to state where they got the extra rations from. Warning. Men are advised to keep their eyes open for an individual wearing pink pajamas, green glasses, straw hat, and khaki mackintosh. It is thought that this is a spy in disguise. Personal, missing friends, etc. Last seen two months ago in Scotland at the Duke of Buckington's grouse shoot, Private Burke Black Box left Gallopy with serious wound in fingernail early in May. Any information as to present whereabouts of above will be gratefully received by Adjunct 101st Battalion. Charlie, come back, dearest. A warm welcome is prepared for you. Loving arms will enfold you. Sergeant Major Bowler. Oh, how we missed you, dearest Bill, on that famed August 9. We think about you, Billy, still, in Cairo, drinking wine. Missing, a little tot. It's rum where it's got to. Missing friends, etc. Will the girl who smiled at William Tonkin's last Boxing Day please write to him at once? Lost by a poor person, a strong pipe, last smelt in someone's pocket up Monash Gully. Lost, pair of field glasses, finder please return same to our champion optimist. Wanted, the address of a good barber, one able to cut hair and shave preferred, apply any platoon. Wanted. Section commander requires pair of good field glasses to find his men when there is shrapnel about. QMS requires a man who can even partly satisfy mess orderlies. Exchange. Corporal would exchange a wristlet watch, not going, for a spring mattress or a tin of McConaughey's rations. Wanted some nice girls to stroll with on the engineer's North Pier. Wanted 50,000 Turkish prisoners for wharf lumping, road making, and building officers' dugouts. Plenty of permanent work for men of right stamp. Apply any beach fatigue party. Australian New Zealand Army Corps. Full. Private wishes to buy guide book to London. Places safe from Zeppelin to be marked with a cross. To let. Nice dugout on the skyline. Owner leaving for field hospital. Miscellaneous. Men with good memory would like the job of taking messages from the troops to friends in Cairo. Wanted to buy. The second brigade will buy large or small quantities of old beer. Fresh beer not objected to. Read. Professor Fire Trench's book on the killing of insect pests with shovel. Business for sale. Mess Orderly will sell goodwill of a flourishing business for a box of fags. Complete spy outfit for sale, including pair of blucher boots, sombrero hat, two cutlasses, and a yashmak. Owner having failed to be discovered for two days is going out of business. Sergeant Noonan, 6th Battalion. End of section 80. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. End of Anzac Book, 1939-1945.
edited by C.E.W. Bean.